Good. So again, very welcome and to this conference on East Galway and the impact on East Galway of Black 47. It's a conference organized through the East Galway Genealogy and DNA group that many of you are members of. And we have members right throughout the world, as you can see here. Um, many in Ireland, United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Spain, France, Sweden, and South Africa. So we're truly an international group. And it's great to have so many people from our diaspora there. With regards to the conference today, we're gonna to have a number of speakers. Um, my screen is slightly giving me problems at the moment. So I'm hoping that this will work itself out. And to just kind of like see what we're doing. So introduce there and introduce myself to you. My name is Martin Curley, and I'm a local here. I live in Mount Bellew in County Galway, but I've lived overseas for a number of years. And recently I lived in Liverpool. Liverpool has a, a special place in the hearts of many Irish people because of the strong tradition of immigration through Liverpool and from Liverpool. And it's kind of like important um, coming back to try and reconnect to the diaspora. And that's what I've been doing over the last number of years, doing research for individual families, doing DNA analysis, as well as working with schools and community groups in terms of family history and local heritage. And of course, putting on events and conferences like the one today. My co-admin is a wonderful person all the way from Tume, Mighty Corcoran. And Mighty is an artist, a director, a creative associate. He's involved with Earwig, which is the Tum Community Arts Group. And today Mighty is doing rehearsals for a group collaborative project with the community in Mayo. So unfortunately, he's going to be watching this later when it's, it's put up on video. So thanks to Mighty, uh, we have been very, very good and creative. Uh, we also run the East Galway Ancestry Project on jedmatch.com. Those of you who have done your DNA, hopefully have uploaded to jedmatch.com. And through that, then we're able to go and to see how you're connected to people throughout the diaspora. And in November of 2021, we started the East Galway Black 47 DNA project as part of the initiative to remember those victims of Angertha Moore 175 years ago. And part of that is to raise money to buy DNA kits. So then we can offer DNA kits to local people and to really kind of like build a large pool of people here in Ireland whose family are known back at least to the Great Hunger. And because of that, then anybody who is a match to those folks, they will be able to know where for certain their families are. And that's the great thing about, you know, recent uh, breakthroughs with regard to several families. We've been able to say, especially the girls who went to Australia and the families like the Kilmartin, Martin family through DNA, we've been able to say who's connected and how they're related back home here in County Galway and throughout the diaspora. So this conference today is going to be emphasizing the stories, um, the stories of resilience, story success, and sometimes just basic survival, um, trying to make sense of what happened in those times, trying to find a little commonality with the events of today, and to see as well what we can learn in our own stories in our own lives to be as resilient as some of our ancestors were. So it's 11.15 in a few moments. Um, Natalie and Robin will be giving us a fantastic story of the Kilmartins and their quest to reunite the children who were in a way fragmented, the whole family fragmented as many families were through eviction, through immigration and through poverty and hunger 
in the 1840s and the, the infamous Ballon Lass eviction, which happened just down the road. So really looking forward to that. And greetings to many of the people here online this morning, or should I say this evening in Australia, and especially to Gloria, whose grandfather was a young man, Patrick Gilmartin, when he was evicted and his family was evicted. So this, what happened to Luke Quest, is about Patrick's brother and finding him. And really honored to have Turtle Bunbury. Turtle is well-renowned in Ireland. He has written amazing amount of books. Uh, one of them is right here in my hand on the Irish diaspora. And he's also been behind the Vanishing Ireland series of books, um, just talking to people about a way of life that has gone forever. And he was also on the RTE Genealogy Roadshow. So he's going to give a wonderful presentation on the children of the hunger of the Irish diaspora and looking at some of the success stories there. At 1.15 approximately, uh, we'll look at reporting Black 47 in newspapers and in journals. Unfortunately, Andrew Martin was supposed to be with us today, but because of a funeral, um, he is unable to attend. So I'm going to just take over that short um, space there to just talk about some of the, the ways that Black 47 was reported and how to access those reports. We'll be joined later then by Charlotte McNamara, who has done amazing work on Patrick Gilmore, who's America's really first superstar when it comes to music. Huge celebrity, born in Ballygar. And this is a man who rightfully now is, is being brought back into the limelight mainly thanks to the great work of Charles McNamara. John is going to present work at 245 then from Ockercleave down in Craig's. Uh, families that left to go to England and the USA. And John has been working with Pam um, Neary since last year when they both gave um, papers at the conference last year. John has amazing work done on the Staffordshire, Galway and Roscommon immigrants and looking forward to that as well. And finally, um, at 3.45, we're going to have um, just looking at how maps and statistics can help us to see what was happening with our families in 1847. So I'm going to just show some of the, the ways that people can use the maps from that time to go and to see how their own families were affected by Ungertha Moore. And finally, if you're still up in Australia, you definitely will be in Canada and the United States and hopefully in Ireland and England. And for, at 4.30, we'll just wrap it up with some final thoughts with that. So in a few moments, I'll just ask Natalie and Robin to get theirs ready uh, for one family's quest to reunite the children, the Kilmartin family of the 1846 Ballon Lass eviction. And I'm just stop sharing my own screen now. So that way we'll be ready for those folks in a few moments. I just asked Robin and Natalie to unmute themselves and to have their presentation ready. I'm gonna just look at the chat there. Um, Kira Ora from Mount Bellevue to Philippa, who's in Christchurch in New Zealand. Johnny Mitchell says hello as well. And I think we've got a few more messages there. Yes. And I've just, Buenos Dias from San Antonio, Texas. And that's from Tom Crane, Baltimore, Maryland, and Marie Cadori. Good to have you all on. And um, I'm just seeing Toronto with Karen there. So Robin and Natalie have themselves ready and they're going to be sharing the screen. And if they just go down to the share screen function, and they'll be ready to go in a moment or two. And if you have any questions, if you go down to the bottom and you see where chat is, so click on chat, and then um, I'll try and answer those as we go along the way. Okay, Robin and Natalie, over to you guys. Thank you very much. No, we're in editing now. Hang on. Oh God. <laughs> Okay, we're not quite sure where we are. Wait a minute. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, hang on. Martin, just excuse us. Sorry, Martin. We're Can you just go down to the share screen connect. again? We're very technological. So you can close it and reopen it. Hang on, we're just going to close it and reopen it. Which one are we closing? Yeah, I'm going to open it. Right in the shared screen. No, you're in everything. Yeah, I know. That's why I want to get out of it. That's why I'm editing. Sorry, Martin. Oh. I don't know what's going on. God. Why can't we? Where? Why are we in editing? I want to get out of editing. Oh, oh crap. So if I could just talk <laughs> you through me. it there, Robin and Natalie. If yes, you please, have... yes, please. If you have Zoom open in front of you and you should be able yes, to see yourselves, okay, and just go down yes, to the bottom yes. of Zoom and click share screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And then once you click the share screen, you got the PowerPoint <laughs> there. And then just click on the PowerPoint. Yeah, our, our PowerPoints. Sorry, our PowerPoint's disappeared. Sorry, off this. Sorry. You just reopen the PowerPoint again. Hang on. Just reopening it. Just done it. And we'll go across to full screen. But we're not seeing you. Okay, so just click share screen. And then just click when you hit shared screen, just click on the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. We're there. We're there. Well, I think we're there. Yes, I think we're actually there now. You need to make the. Uh, yes, I, over here, but I'll just admit this person. Then we'll go. Okay. We're there. <laughs> we, we can see you. Okay, we need we need to get your screen shared though. So you need to go down to the shared screen you do. underneath. You, do. <sighs> you need to go back up. We're not actually we need to go to there. We're not in Zoom. Click on that. So open up so that way Zoom is open in front of you. you Just like we did the other night. Yeah, I know. We've got three yeah. people doing this. It's really good. <laughs> there, there's she's screen. There it is now. Got it now. Share. Now we're there. And we just need to put you on, put it on full screen. Okay. Right. Finally, we're there. <laughs> uh, can everyone hear us? And see us. No one can hear us. We're on. Yes, everyone can see and hear because we're all muted. That's why you can't hear us, but everyone can hear us. Okay. All You're right. Good. Okay. We're ready to start. Oh my goodness gracious. I'm so sorry about all of that, but we're we're now ready to start. Um I'm Robin Collins and Natalie will be on screen fairly soon and what we're sharing this presentation. Um, I'm just going to start. Um, on the morning of Friday the 13th of March 1846, Lawrence Kilmartin, his wife Kate and their family were evicted from the Gerard estate at Ballinlass in East Galway. Almost 150 years later, in a small farming town in Australia, on the other side of the world, his descendants came together for a family reunion, knowing nothing about the events at Ballinlass. They were all descended from Patrick and Bridget Kilmartin, who came to Australia with their young family in 1866. Everyone who was there knew that Patrick's parents were Lawrence and Kate Kilmartin. They knew that Patrick and Bridget were Irish from Galway, but they came to Australia from a small coal mining town in, in County Durham in England. They knew that Patrick's surname was Kilmartin, 
But in a relatively short time after arrival in Queensland, the family's name was shortened to Martin. They also knew that Patrick and Bridget's young son, Lawrence, had died on the voyage to Australia, and, but that Patrick and Bridget had 11 surviving children, and that over time, the various branches of the family had lost contact. Many of the attendees at the reunion arrived as strangers, but they left as family. It was a joyous occasion. Now, I have to admit I wasn't actually there because I was living in Tasmania at the time. But all of the family stories about the reunion were just that it was wonderful and that it was a joyous occasion for everyone. When the decision was made to hold a reunion, that prompted a desire in quite a few people to discover Patrick and Bridget's story. Virtually nothing was known about their lives in, in Galway and a little bit more in Durham. Patrick and Bridget were illiterate. They left no stories or letters, but they left an oral history. And that was created through the stories that were told and shared through the generations. We know that these stories can shift and change and be lost over time, but we also know that they often point to major events in a family's history. The older members of the Australian family were the keepers of the oral tradition. They spoke of an eviction, but not where it happened and when. They spoke about the Great Famine. They spoke of a pub and drinks bought for a young man who over-imbibed and signed up to come to Australia. They also remembered being told of a brother named Luke who went to America. At the time of the reunion, the veracity of most of these stories had not been confirmed. No one knew where and when the eviction had occurred or why Patrick was in County Durham or anything about the elusive Luke, but they were firmly held stories which had been told for almost 150 years and they were tantalizing. It was clear that they needed to be investigated and because they just might complete, point to how to complete the Kilmartin story, not only in Australia, but also in Ireland, England and America. So our journey, that's Natalie and I, our journey has been one of putting these oral traditions to the test and trying to see how they stack up against the historical research. Was there an eviction? Where was it and what happened? Why on earth were Patrick and Bridget in Durham in the first place? Was Luke a myth? Why did he go to America? Did he go to America? And was there an unknown American family? On our journey, the first piece of the oral tradition to be researched focused on Ireland and the, an eviction during a great famine. And I'm handing over to Natalie. <laughs> Hello there. Okay, so let's travel back in time to 1846 and the early morning of Friday the 13th of March. And what a date. Um, so we're at Ballinlass, just north of Mount Bellew. It's not long before dawn and since the weather has turned nasty about a week or so ago, it's very cold. In the ditches along the road, we can see orange glows from small outdoor fires with people huddled around them. They've got their possessions done up in bundles, their few bits of furniture, their crockery, their work tools. Some have scraped their manure heaps out onto the road because even though we can smell the rot that's coming from the heaps of blackened potatoes at the back of the houses, they're still hoping against hope that they can pause. Some families are still in their houses. Some have bowed to the inevitable and cleared out altogether. And it's a fact that the Bananas eviction affected people who are not in the official records. There are also people who can't leave their houses because there's typhus in the village and they're suffering from fever. It's pretty safe to say that whether they're inside or camped out, very few people are sleeping because they've been given plenty of notice and they know what's probably going to come in the morning. So I'm just going to... Ah, you do it, Robin, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I forgot the slide. <laughs> okay. So what is about to happen at Ballinlass is partly a sign of the times. It's also the final outcome of years of wrangling between the Ballinlass tenants and their landlords, John and Marcella Gerard, who are aged about 80 and 70 years, respectively. Between them, these two elderly people own more land than anyone else in Connacht. 
The Balanlice town notionally belongs to Marcella, who is the heiress to the Netterville family. She inherited huge amounts of land in her mid 40s by virtue of having lived, outlived everybody else. And she entered into one of these 19th century property merger marriages whereby she married um, a man called John Gerard, who is another big landowner, in his case from County Meath, and um, they joined their estates. Now, John is a hands-on, experienced agriculturalist with a particular interest in cattle breeding. The land that the Ballon Lass tenants are living and working on has the potential to become about 400 acres of prime pasture. A lot of it reclaimed out of the bog by the people who are living there. And I think you can see where this is heading. For nearly 20 years, there has been a succession of legal wranglings, standoffs. The Gerards have attempted to convert their land from an inefficient rundale where the land is divided up into a complicated system of allotments and subtenantries. Um, for the last four years, the tenants have tried to pay their rent and they've even gone to court over it, but the Gerards agent has refused to take their money and they have been issued with a notice to quit. Now, nobody can argue the fact that John Gerard, and I think it really is John, even though Marcella does cop most of the blame, because you need to remember in this time that a woman's property rights are vested in her husband. Um, John has, in his own words, the right is to do, to do as he pleased with his own land. What we're talking about here are not the legalities, we're talking about a moral imperative because Time has run out for those tenants at Ballon Lass and it's run out right as the famine has started to bite. So back to the 13th of March. Soon after dawn, the people who are camped out in the ditches hear the noise that they've been dreading. It's the creak and jingle of wheels and harness. 12 carts come trundling up the road. Each one has four men with spades, pickaxes and crowbars. They're all local men. They've been recruited from the Gerard's other estates to provide the muscle. Not surprisingly, they don't want to be there. Um, so to make sure that they do the job, they've been backed up by professional enforcers in the shape of multiple bailiffs um, employed by the Gerard's, 45 police from Mount Bellew, led by Sub-Inspector Bernard Cummings, and a troop of soldiers of the 49th Foot who've marched down from Ballygar. Um, under the command of Captain William Painter Kinaway Brown. In charge of the show is the Gerard Steward, who has with him a writ from their agent in chief, the solicitor John Holmes. And they start knocking the houses down. Now, we've seen all seen the movies. We think we know what this looks like, but this is not a film set with well nourished actors dressed up in ye olde clothes and wringing their hands while props go flying. These are established, solidly built cottages that have been occupied in some cases for generations. And the levellers go at them one by one, 30 or 40 men per house, making sure each cottage is flattened before moving on to the next one. At this point, the people who didn't move out the night before have to try and get their belongings out. And this does not prove easy. What with the residents, the police, the levellers, the soldiers, and frankly, gawpers, there are easily 500 people in the fields at Balanlas that day. We have women hanging onto the doorposts and screaming blue murder while their things are tossed out onto the road, men trying to rescue their manure and seed potatoes, children running around underfoot and getting injured as the houses come down. Some tenants are still trying to get the steward, the bailiffs, the soldiers, anybody to take their rent money. Eventually, the inhabitants gather together in the fields behind what's left of the village. And at this point, something extraordinary happens. The bailiffs try to make the soldiers charge the tenants to drive them off the land. And the officers are so disgusted, they point blank refuse. Um, overseeing this eviction was practically, well, it was the last job that Captain Kennaway Brown did before he handed in his commission. And since anything I found out about him, he does seem to have been a decent sort of man. I'm inclined to think that he did not want to end his army career leading a charge against a couple of hundred unarmed civilians in a potato paddock. So how and why do we know all this about Alan Lass? There's a man who's standing on the side of the road. 
taking notes. And his name is Matthew Donovan. He is a wine and spirit merchant from Ballygar, and he's also a prominent local member of Daniel O'Connell's Loyal National Repeal Association. But the most important thing to know about Matthew Donovan is that he is an ex-police inspector from Dublin, and he knows how to be a good witness. Matthew Donovan hightails back to Ballygar, and by the evening of the next day, the first article about the Ballin Lass incident has appeared in the Ros Roscommon Journal. And here it is. An awful extermination of tenantry. Now, this article from the Roscommon Journal is picked up by the Freeman's Journal in Dublin, and they send down the 19th century equivalent of a hotshot investigative reporter, a man called Sylvester Redmond, who is able to dig down deeply into the truth of what happened. When he gets there, Redmond finds evictees camping in barns, in ditches, under hedges. Some are sick, some are already dead of typhus or exposure. The weather is vile. It is cold, it is sleeting. And on the Tuesday after the eviction, there was a huge snowstorm. So it's hardly surprising that they're finding the old people dead in ditches. When Redmond talks to evictees, who are mostly Irish speakers, so he has to use Donovan as an interpreter, he discovered that to force the evicted families out of the district, the Gerards have threatened their other tenants with eviction themselves if they take them in. So for uh, an Irish nationalist paper like the Freeman's Journey, this story is an absolute godsend. They publish multiple articles, which are in turn reprinted in papers all over Ireland and in the big London papers too. Both Daniel O'Connell and William Smith O'Brien give speeches about Ballin Lass in the House of Commons. And while there are other reasons why the incident became so notorious, which we don't have time to go into tonight, unfortunately, it is really because of Sylvester Redmond's articles that we know so much about this particular eviction today. And here she is. I'm sorry, it's such a poor, poor photo. As for the Gerards, Marcella and John, I don't think they could possibly have been prepared for the storm of execration that was called down upon their heads. They were lambasted in practically every paper. They were the subject of speeches in Parliament. They were made jokes of in Punch. People wrote bad poems condemning them. And Sylvester Redmond turned their surname into a verb for the unjust eviction of ten ten tenantry, Gerardizing. Yet they had acted quite legally. They had given the, pleasant, the tenants plenty of warning, gone through all the proper processes, and they had done it often enough before without any complaints. After everything exploded, the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Heightsby, sent a, myth, a magistrate to make a report which confirmed that Redmond's accounts were accurate. He wrote to the Home Secretary, Sir James Graham, in London. And this is what he said. 13 similar clearances have before taken place upon this property and others are still in contemplation. Proceedings, the cruelty and danger of which it might have been supposed, would have awakened caution, if not some more generous feeling. This is the nub of the matter. The timing was absolutely atrocious. The 1845 potato crop had failed and the stored potatoes were already black. So it was obvious that things were only going to get worse. Now, because of Matthew Donovan and Sylvester Redmond, these anonymous victims become people with names and voices. They are Gavins, they are Mannions. They are Connollys, they are Connors, Rocks, Tansies, Koreans, and among the 61 names on that list is Lawrence Kilmartin. This is the point where the historical record intersects with those stories that Robin talked about, told by the oldest members of our family. Stories about a lad called Patrick Kilmartin who came home from working in the fields to find his mother crying in the ditch outside the ruins of the family home with the baby in her lap and all her possessions broken up and strewn around her. Now I'm going to hand over to Robin for the next section. Okay. After the eviction, 
tracking the balance of victims through those famine years becomes very difficult. There's a newspaper report in 1847 of some of them dying of starvation, and we know others immigrated. To be honest, we really don't know what happened to Lawrence and, and Kate Kilmartin. We, we haven't found death records or a burial place, but we do know that all their children survived the famine. And that implies that they must have less, left the district. There are a few clues to where they went. First of all, families who were evicted were in the usual and fortunate position of having money. Unusual. Unusual, sorry. <laughs> sorry, unusual. <laughs> and fortunate position of having money. All of the evidence states that they had rent money and that the Gerards um, had refused to accept it. This money could have been used to get them on a boat, if not to America, at least to England, as many hundreds of thousands of Irish people did. We know from our research that families from the Mount Bellew area were settling in Chesterfield in Derbyshire in, um, from the late 1840s. The reason Irish people were going to Chesterfield was that it was an employment hotspot. Right as the famine started, coal was found. So there was plenty of work, both in the mines and building railways. During the 1850s, a huge Irish community took shape there. And a key figure was Catherine Nyland, whose daughter Bridget later became Patrick's wife. She ran a boarding house in the Clay Cross area that was full of lodges with East Galway surnames. So if you're looking for missing East Galway ancestors post-famine, it's a good idea to check the Chesterfield district, particularly around Clay Cross, Clay Lane. In 1861, something terrible happened in the area. It was called the Clay Cross Inrush. On 11 June, a miner in one of the pits noticed water seeping through um, from the coal from another abandoned pit and that was full of water. The tunnel wall gave way and a huge torrent of water came rushing into the pit. It killed 23 miners. Most of them were trapped underground for the best part of a month and suffocated. Unfortunately, one of them was a young Irishman called John Carr, who was definitely part of the East Galway network. After the disaster, the clay cross mines went into a prolonged shutdown and the work dried up. Our Nyland family abruptly up sticks and moved north to stay with relations in the Bishop, Bishop Auckland area of County Durham. We think that some of the Kilmartins were part of this movement too. We have a Patrick Kilmartin in Chesterfield in 1855 and a Thomas Kilmartin, possibly a cousin or a brother, was boarding with the Bishop Auckland Nyland relatives. And on to young Patrick. Hand on to young Patrick. Put young Patrick's picture up. Yep, we'll put Patrick's picture up. Let's move this. There we go. All right, so it was in Bishop Auckland that Patrick Kilmartin married Bridget Nyland in 1862. They settled down in a colliery village called Tottenham, another good place to look for East Galway relatives, um, just outside of Bishop Auckland. And they had two children um, who were named after their grandparents, Kate and Lawrence. Now, the family in Australia always knew that Patrick and Bridget had come here via England. That Patrick was working as a miner in County Durham and that there was a mix up that led to them emigrating to Australia instead of to America. Now. The story, as my grandmother told it, went like this. Her grandfather, Patrick, had moved to England because of the famine, and he and his brother, Luke, were planning to go to America together. Unfortunately, one night at the pub, Patrick got drunk. He was approached by a man who was recruiting workers to build the first railway in Queensland, and he thought Queensland was in America, so he signed up for a free ticket. <laughs> Now, you just couldn't make this story up. There is something so gloriously random about the thought that, but for the accident of someone getting drunk in a pub and making what certainly as a kid seemed to me an incomprehensible mistake. I mean, how drunk was he that he thought Queensland was in America? Um, none of my family would 
ever have been born. And of course, in my grandmother's hands, the story went on. Um, Patrick went home and he told Bridget and she threw her apron over her head and wept because she thought she was going to America with Luke and, and now she was going to have to take her babies to some place she'd never heard of on the other side of the world. And the next thing she knew, she was on a boat heading to Australia and the journey was terrible and all her belongings were washed overboard in a storm. And um, then the baby died and she arrived in Brisbane with no box full of possessions and no baby. And the next 10 years of her life, at least, she spent living in tents along a half-built railway line and all because her stupid husband had got drunk and put his X on a piece of paper he could not read. Now, I just need to say here that my grandmother was a very serious teetotaler, so we had to have this little moral at the end of the stage of the story. And I'm happy to report that Patrick himself took the pledge in later life. Anyway, that's the story. Well, let's have a look at the actual elements that can be checked. Um, boiled down, these are as followed. Follows. Post-famine, Patrick was living in England with his wife and two children. Fact. Two, he had been planning to go to America with a brother called Luke. Three, he was recruited by somebody in a pub to work as a railway navvy. Four, he thought he was going to America, but instead he ended up working on the first railway in Queensland. And five, the baby died on the voyage. There's actually quite a lot in this story that can be verified. Um, at the time of Patrick and Bridget's marriage, going to America would not have been a very sensible thing to do because the Civil War was on. Um, but by 1865, that conflict was ending and it is reasonable that they might have started thinking about emigrating. Um, it is also a fact that at this time, the Queensland government was recruiting large numbers of railway navvies to build the first railway in Queensland from Ipswich to Toowoomba. So I'm going to put the Kilmarts to one side and give the non-Australians listening a little bit of background about Queensland. Um, the really important thing to understand in relation to this story is that at this period, Queensland had only just separated from New South Wales. Prior to 1859, it hadn't even existed. It was isolated, it was broke, it was undeveloped, and as far as people in Great Britain were concerned, it was just a great big pink blank on the map. So getting the railways, getting all that colonial infrastructure into place was absolutely essential in attracting the right sort of migrant and building up the population of the new colony. After separation, one of the first things that the Queensland government did was appoint an agent general for emigration in London, whose job was to recruit these migrants. And he's a very important person in Queensland history. His name was Henry Jordan. What a beard. <laughs> um, Henry Jordan spent a large proportion of his working life on lecture tours telling people why they should go to Queensland. And interestingly, the very first thing he would had to do whenever he spoke on this subject, and we know what the content of his lectures um, was from newspaper reports, was to explain where Queensland was. Because most people had never heard of it. Um, so when Patrick walked into that pub in County Durham on pay night and met a mysterious man with an offer of a free ticket and guaranteed work at the other end it's not surprising he thought Queensland was in America because for all he knew it might as well have been um, so as well as lecturing Henry Jordan worked with a network of local agents who were paid by the head for every migrant they recruited the Durham the Dark County Durham agent was a man called John Ord he was a hatter by trade um, but he ran a sideline in agencies for shipping companies and all sorts of things. Um, in 1865, the work in the railway, um, on the railway in Queensland had started. Um, the first station had just been opened, which I think is another slide. No, it's not, sorry. No, it's not. Um, and a ship carrying construction materials as well as the next 
recruitment of navvies was about to sail. We also know from Henry Jordan's itinerary that he was due to arrive in County Durham and that with the boss on the way and the boat due to leave, John Ord had recruited nobody. So what does he do? He goes to a miners pub and he looks at someone who is fed up or intending to emigrate or just has nothing to lose. Oh, you're going to America. Oh, I can give you a free ticket to Queensland. Just put your mark there on the paper. You, our theory is that Patrick was quite probably deliberately tricked. Um, and But whatever chicanery did or didn't happen, he did put his name down to go to Queensland. And 160 years later, here we are. Um, we sincerely hope that John Ord enjoyed spending his commission. Um, Everything happened really quickly after this. Patrick and Bridget packed up their family. They said their goodbyes. And within three weeks, they were sailing out of Plymouth on the Black Ball Line Auxiliary Screw Steamer, the Great Victoria. Now, compared to some of the ships that the other navvies who were recruited sailed in, the Great Victoria was not too bad, but it was desperately overlaid. Now, you can see the size of it in the picture. Um, there were about, with the crew and the passengers, there were about 800 people on that ship on that journey. Um, and around the time they hit the Roaring Forties, which are the winds that carried the sailing ships um, around the south of Australia, there were a lot of storms, which may well account for the story that Bridget's box was washed overboard. The ship was so full, they couldn't put everything in the hold. And a lot of cargo was on deck in the lifeboats. Um, there was also inevitably disease. Um, this is a, a pretty grim sort of thing. In less than a fortnight, more than a dozen children have been consigned to the deep. A heavy despondency has stolen over us as each one asks his neighbour whose turn next. It was one of the other passengers. And a couple of weeks after the, that was written, our little Lawrence um, Kilmartin was one of the children who was buried at sea. Um, and again, my grandmother was right. Um, probably what is about the most ironic thing about this whole story is that about the same time that Lawrence died, the other person who died was Marcella Gerard in County Meath. And I don't think too many people were mourning her. Um, so the Great Victoria anchored in Moreton Bay on New Year's Day, 1866. Um, a couple of days later, the immigrants were transferred onto a small steamer, government steamer called the Platypus, for the last leg of their journey. And there's a wonderful story told by one of the other passengers. Um, they were apparently travelling up the Brisbane River, admiring the scenery, goggling at banana groves and bullet drays, slapping the mosquitoes. And they saw this cluster of buildings and they assumed it was a village. And the next thing they knew, they were pulling into a wharf and, yep, that was Brisbane. There it is. That's what they saw. Um, so it must have been a pretty sharp adjustment um, for Patrick and Bridget. Um, in fact, one of their fellow passengers was so horrified that the first thing he did was um, write a letter back home to the local newspaper in Wales, um, exhorting people not to come because it was awful. Um, but anyone who's experienced a Brisbane summer will know that January is hot and very humid and it can be extremely unpleasant, even for people who are not doing heavy manual labour in moleskin trousers. Um, there are instances of newly arrived navvies who were not used to the weather dropping dead from sunstroke. Um, but they were lucky in one respect. Um, while there was widespread unemployment, um, Patrick had worked. And despite the fact that the railway company collapsed only a few months later and there was a massive riot, um, he somehow managed to hold on to his job. Um, they went straight up to one of the railway camps on the way up to the Toowoomba Range, and from then, that, then on, that was their life. Um, when the railway reached Toowoomba, um, its construction branched off to the west and to the south, and the Martins, and by then they were calling themselves Martin, went with the Southern Line down onto the Darling Downs, which is the agricultural heartland of Southeast Queensland. And that's what it was looking like in the, at the time that they, they went there. 
Um, all up, they spent the next 15 years of their lives living in these camps. Um, and when their 10th child, Lil, was born in 1881, that's 15 years later, they are still listed as living in a railway camp at Spring Creek on the Darling Downs. And they didn't settle into their final house in the um, small town of Clifton until a few years after that, that's Clifton. It hasn't changed very much. And here they are in their old age. And I'm going to pass back to Robin for the next stage. Screen again. Well, <clears throat> that's all about the Australian Martins. Um, now we turn to the Martins who. Oh, sorry, went, I've gone too far. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. Right. Now we turn to the Martins who went to the United States. Were they a myth? Did they, did they really exist? Well, yes, they did. And in the search for them, for Luke and the American family, the game changes as far as research are concerned were the online, the, the online resources like Ancestry.com, the digitization of a lot of public records and DNA. These tools create a community of researchers, all borrowing away and sharing what they find. And all of this research pointed to a family connection in Iowa. Well, we've talked about that we don't know really what happened to Lawrence Kilmartin and his family in the immediate aftermath of eviction. We know that they were forcibly removed from Ballinglass. We know that the disruption and trauma of the Great Famine led to death or immigration for millions of dispossessed people. We've talked about how for decades, Galway men traveled to farms in the north of England for the annual harvest, earning cash for the rent. Immigration to the new world was well established. And by the beginning of the 1850s, many people were on the move because of the famine. Travel, travel was via familiar paths. While the rural tenants of Galway may have lacked reading and writing skills and probably their English might, might not have been great. They weren't without knowledge about travel and about the world outside Galway. They heard stories, they, uh, newspapers were read to them, news was announced from the pulpit and on street corners and in markets and pubs. And if they had the money for a fare, they bravely packed a bag and followed a path often already taken by family or friends seeking a better, safer life. Bridget and Patrick were the only members of their families to emigrate to Australia. In the maelstrom that was the Great Famine, families disappeared. They died, they immigrated. So what happened to the rest of the Kilmartins? Had they taken the well-worn path to Liverpool and then on to Boston and New York City? On this next slide, we see a passenger list. And if you can look closely in the middle of the list, you will see a Luke Kilmartin, age 20, and a Mary Kilmartin, aged 18. He's a laborer and she's a servant. And they're on a ship going from Liverpool to New York in 1854. It must have been a bewildering and possibly terrifying place for the Irish who were mostly country people with agricultural skills. New York at the time was the biggest city in the US with half a million people, with half a million people. And in the years after the famine, thousands of destitute or near destitute Irish people poured into New York City. For them, it would have been bewildering and possibly terrifying. But they were used to travel paths. They were used to moving where they knew friends, where they had family. And a typical travel route for new arrivals was to move fairly quickly through New York City to the farms of Monmouth County in New Jersey, which was just outside the city of New York. These farms produced food for New York. And there, the agricultural workers from Galway, found family, friends, accommodation and work. Pam Neary, who's also presenting on this seminar today, has done wonderful work tracking the travel paths of East Galway immigrants to the farms of Monmouth County. 
A year after Luke and Mary Kilmartin arrived in New York City, a census was held in Monmouth County. A Luke Martin is listed as head of an unnamed six person household. There's no specific mention of a Mary Kilmartin, but she's probably there. Later that year, the birth of a son called Michael is recorded to a Luke and an Anne Martin. How do we know that this is our Luke? I mean, there's more than one Luke or Luke Kilmartin. Clearly these isolated references are not enough to confirm identity. However, the next stage of the journey finds them in Iowa and family relationships become much clearer. In the 18, 1850s in the United States, particularly in the Eastern States, um, travel was, was never easy, but there was a lot more of it than perhaps we might have thought. Now, for um, our American friends here today, you'll be very aware of where Iowa is. I apologise I don't have a little um, arrow there to show you, but if you look to the left of your screen, you'll see that there's a state that's bounded in red. That's Iowa. And over to the right of the screen, there is an area um, over right onto the, the, the sea is, is New York. So you can see that for um, anyone traveling across from New York to Iowa, they had to go through a number of states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera, Illinois, until they reached the Mississippi River. And on the other side of the Mississippi River, we find Iowa. The Martins probably went to Iowa because they heard it offered opportunity. There was a well-trodden path from New Jersey to the Western States. Trains, riverboats and coaches took settlers west. As a matter of fact, that map you see on the screen is a traveller's map from 1852. By 1850, almost 5,000 Irish-born people lived in Iowa. The Indian wars were over, agriculture, mining and railway building attracted workers and settlers. The lure of land was significant. The Mississippi River forms the western boundary of Iowa. Illinois is on the other side of the river. Eastern. Eastern side of the river. Yeah, it's on the other side. You said it was the western boundary. Did I say western? I meant to say eastern boundary. Sorry. Sorry. I'm just <laughs> correcting you. <laughs> Sorry. Not... Yeah, it's the eastern boundary of Iowa. Um, in 1856, the first railway bridge is built across the Mississippi between Rock Island in Illinois and Davenport in Scott County, Iowa. A year later, Luke Martin is resident in Scott County with his wife, Anne, and son, Michael. A second son who is named Lawrence is born. A few years later, Mary Martin marries Patrick Mannion in Iowa. Then not long after that, a few years after that, a sister, Margaret, is in Iowa and she marries James Maguire. Multiple Iowa records cross-reference Luke, Mary and Martin and Margaret Martin, confirming that they were siblings and their parents' names were Lawrence and Kate Kilmartin. The big surprise in our research was the discovery of another sister residing in Iowa. Her name was Catherine and she was married to a man whose surname was also Mannion. He was Martin Mannion. At this stage, we don't know if the two Mannion husbands were related. Both were born in Ireland, but the records state they weren't born, they didn't come from Galway, they came from other states. But interestingly, there is a family named Mantron who, uh, that was also evicted at Ballon Lass. Surnames quite often get misspelled. Mantron is sometimes Mannion. Mangan is sometimes Mannion. And Mannion is typically a Galway name. Clearly, we think there's more research to be done on this this year. Mm. By the 1860s, the Kilmartin siblings had survived a cataclysmic disaster in Ireland, and they were, but they were about to face another time of great turmoil. They arrived in Iowa just in time for the American Civil War. Iowa was a Union state. It delivered a high number of soldiers and regiments to the Union Army relative to the size of its population. 
Conscription, payment for substitutes or bonuses for signing up were used by all the states to fill the ranks of the Union Army. Not all foreign nationals had to serve, but all men of an eligible age had to register. A registration record has been found for Luke, but it would appear that he didn't serve. We, we know that a regiment was raised at Muscatine County, which is very near Davenport. We've searched those records. We can't find his name listed. Um, it may be, sorry, it's now um, nine o'clock at night <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> So that's the sound you can hear. Um, um, we, we know that he registered, but we don't think that he served. We know that we need to do more research on that issue. But what we do know is that Luke and his brothers-in-law sur survived the war. In 1870, the Martin, Maguire and Mannion families appear in a census living on small farms close to the railway line in Fulton, Muscatine County, which is not far from Davenport. Now, what you may not be able to see <laughs> is at the top of the map, map we see that Lauren, an L. Kim, um, L. Martin, um, Maguire and two Mannions have got farms very close together um, either side of a railway line that you can probably see at the top of the picture. To encourage the building of railways um, west, in 1856, the federal government had established a land grant program whereby they gave companies um, willing to build railways land 10 miles wide on either side of a proposed railway track. And of course, they could then sell that land to settlers and um, this program funded construction. The land was also offered to railway workers. One reference to land sales in this area indicates that some of the land was sold for as little as a dollar an acre, which make, made it very affordable, affordable. It's highly likely that the prospect of buying cheap land working for a railway and the work that that, um, that provided is one of, the re one of the things that brought the Kilmartin, Lord Kilmartin and his sisters to this area. It's a strange thing how railways run like a thread through the Kilmartin story. Railway building brought their brother Patrick and his family to Queensland. Patrick worked all his life for Queensland Rail. My father, Bill Collins, was a Queensland Rail train driver. He regularly drove trains, both originally steam and then later diesel, from Toowoomba to Brisbane on the line that was built by his grandfather. My husband works for the railway as well, and um, he's um, a, um, an engineer on the railway. So we've got the connection is still there. The connection is still there. And here's a great picture of a train wreck. <laughs> Um, Mary Mannion, Margaret Maguire and their families settled in Adair, Iowa, another railway town. Adair's great claim to fame is that a train robbery was committed by Jesse James and his gang there in 1873. It was his first train robbery. <laughs> I'm not sure if Mary or Margaret's families were resident in Adair at the time, but, but who knows? Maybe they're in the photo having a look at the at the at the train wreck. Oh my goodness, I'd have been there. I would have been there too. <laughs> Mary Mannion and Margaret Maguire appeared to have settled have had settled happy lives, despite the fact that they were both widowed by 1880. Luke and Catherine's lives in Iowa were filled with sadness. The existence of Catherine Martin came to light in, 1880, in an 1883 deed, giving Luke guardianship of a Catherine Mannion and her children, Lawrence, yes, another Lawrence, and um, Mary and Sarah. At the time, Catherine had been institutionalised with mental illness. 
The children's father, Martin Mannion, was deemed to be incompetent. Luke was granted the guardianship but discharged his responsibilities very poorly. Within a few years, Martin has engaged a lawyer. There is long and tortured legal correspondence involving, um, involving the lawyer and the estate. When Larry, um, Lawrence was called Larry, was old enough, he sued to end the guardianship, but by then family assets seemed to have disappeared. Newspaper articles give clear indication that Luke was either suffering from alcoholism or had mental health issues. Disturbances, arrests, and finally being cleared insane were features of his later life. Martin Mannion also had poor press. They both lost their farms. They were litigious and argumentative. Perhaps the trauma of the Great Famine, the eviction and exile, plus the horrors of the Civil War in their new country followed them. Luke spent the last four years, four months of his life in the Mount Pleasant Asylum, and he died in 1885. Martin Mannion died 13 years later. And that's where Catherine in. Mm. Catherine spent 30 years in an institution for mentally ill women that was established by the Mercy Nuns in Davenport. The Mercy Nuns have a strong parent presence in the life of Australian American Kilmartins. One of the Martin daughters also worked for the Mercy Nuns in Iowa. But while they were caring for Catherine in Iowa, her niece Mabel Martin entered the Mercy Convent in Britain, Brisbane, in Brisbane where she became, I'm sorry, I'm so tongue tied, where she became our much loved Sister Mary, Sister Mary Raphael, or Auntie Rafe, as we called her. She was a nursing sister and a stalwart of the Martyr Hospital in Brisbane. When I was a child, at Christmas, she would holiday at the Mercy Convent in Toowoomba. A highlight of the year was a visit, always with another nun, to our house for afternoon tea. The neighbourhood children would put on a concert for her, followed by afternoon tea. The nuns would have their afternoon tea alone in the lounge, and we children would scoff the same food and lots of fizzy drinks around the kitchen table. Catherine died in 1916, about the same time as her niece entered the convent in Brisbane. The next generation of American Kilmartins, like families everywhere, moved away and some stayed. Some moved to Nebraska and others can be found in California and in the Eastern States. The search is still underway to cover all their fates. You have to wonder, but you have to wonder if they shared stories about a brother who went to Australia. My mistake. My mistake. <laughs> Bridget, another Kilmartin sister, was at the Ballinlass eviction. Bridget stayed in Ireland, married a local man, Mitchell. Her son, Joseph Mitchell, was found in a dare in Iowa in the 1890s. In 1908, 60 years after the eviction, the very elderly Bridget Mitchell sent a letter to her niece in Adair. The letter is referred to in Tom Crean's book about the Gerard estate and the evictions. The pain and yearning caused by the eviction is still evident in Bridget's words. She says that as Mrs. Gerard died without heirs, there was a hope that the surviving Gerard tenants might be given, and I quote, 25 acres of land and every tenant who still lives will get the very land from which they were evicted. I expect to have our home on the very spot where your mother, Aunt Maggie and myself were born. This was a very unlikely hope and did not come to fruition. But the letter, which is one of the few documents that we have, confirms the connection between Iowa and Ballinlass. In the search for Luke, many family connections have been made. Other Kilmartin researchers, including Jane Craffey, Jeanette Dahl, Morel Ormond, Margaret Martin, and many others have contributed to the story. For me, sorry, a very special connection has been made between Bridget Mitchell's descendants um, and the family in, in Australia. On the, in the picture, you can see Irish family members of Ballinlass in Galway who prepared a wonderful video 
for Gloria's 100th birthday celebration. Many of the Irish men and women who immigrated after the Great Famine were totally traumatised by all that they suffered. The fact that we're still talking about the Ballinlass eviction in our Irish, Australian, American and English families 176 years after the event only shows how cataclysmic it was for the survivors. Okay. Just to wrap up. Um, so we are the Ballinlass diaspora. And as a result of what happened on the 13th of March, 1846, there are now three main branches of the Kilmartin family. One in Ireland, one in Australia, and one in the United States. And my grandmother was right or wrong, there was a loop. Um, and we did find him in America. Not only that, we have done something we never expected to. And that is, and I think this is quite unique, identified an entire evicted household of seven people. Now, you'll notice that the newspaper, or if you, may, you may have noticed when I put the newspaper list up earlier, there was seven, it says, his household. It actually appears that this meant seven dependents of Lawrence. So if this is how Matthew Donovan and Sylvester Redmond did the counting, it makes sense of early claims that there were more than 400 people evicted that day. It is also worth remembering that the printed list did not include the families who had already cleared out in expectation of what was going to come. So we will never really know the true number of the people affected. To finish on a positive note, the descendants of Lawrence and Kate, two illiterate Irish agricultural labourers who were tossed out into the ditch like garbage, now include an international expert on Native American languages, several professional writers and illustrators, lawyers, policemen, doctors, nurses, librarians, teachers, all kinds of business people, and it's hard to think of anything more established than, than this, a New South Wales Supreme Court judge. We would like to think that they were proud of us, but I think that there is one thing that would please them more than anything else, and that is that their 100-year-old granddaughter, Gloria Collins, in Australia, speaks to her cousin, Johnny Mitchell, in Galway every day. Okay. You. One last little thing. <clears throat> At the family reunion um, that was held in 1993, my father, Bill Collins, recited a little poem. My dad used every family occasion, you would find him sitting in a corner with a little bit of paper, writing down what he called a little poem. Um, and every family occasion, there was a little poem by, by my dad. And here he is, hopefully. We need, we need the Zoom thing to put the volume on. Uh, where is it? There. Yeah. Is that it? There he is. Can you hear? And we got it on. Unfortunately, Robin and Natalie, we, we can't hear that. So maybe we can use that clip oh, in the Galway group later on. on. Sorry about that. Okay. 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 <laughs> well, anyway, we finished. We finished. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. That is a wonderful, wonderful talk. So interesting, absorbing and informative presentation. And you've got the diaspora there in Clifton in Queensland. And if any of the diaspora, there's quite a few of them that um, are online here. So thank you very much for sharing that out. Eamon has said, Eamon Healy um, is from Baja. Um, fantastic talk and great research. I really enjoyed it. One observation that may or may not be helpful. I'm wondering if the Chief Secretary outraged reports for 1846 and the NAI Dublin it's not digitized, may have more detail about the balance evictions, not reported in the newspapers. And the 
would be referenced as probably in Tom Crane's book, but maybe worth an investigation the next time you or somebody else from the, the wider clan would do that. And again, um, wonderful, very well done research from Anne Marie, excellently told by Denise. Tom Crane, nice job, great research. Karen, very interesting. Tara, wonderful talk and great to hear the story of struggle and survival told so engagingly. So Robin and Natalie, many, many thanks for sharing that story. If you just go down to the bottom of your screen and just um, stop sharing, just hit stop sharing. And that way the yep. full screen will pop up. There you go, thank, thank you. And you will say Gloria, and I'm going to just um, go with Gloria and I'm gonna just click on ask to unmute and maybe Gloria, can just say a few words there. I don't know if Johnny Mitchell, if I can get him. So Gloria, if somebody um, could just unmute Gloria there on her iPad, we might be able to get a few words from Gloria that was mentioned. Okay. Um, unfortunately, Gloria, it seems to have been stuck there. So maybe we'll get back to Gloria again. And if Johnny Mitchell, who is on as well, if I can find Johnny there, um, if he wants to just say a word, I'm going to just click on ask to unmute for Johnny and that, because I know that it's late in the evening for many of you guys. Hello, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Hello, ladies. Hi there. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Thank you very much. It's brilliant, Johnny, yeah. that you got on. Thank you. And thank you, Martin. And that. Yeah. Gloria, unfortunately, you're on mute, Gloria. So if, if you could just go down to the bottom left and just click unmute. Thanks, Johnny. Okay. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think Gloria, the, the iPad is, is not being helpful there. So, guys, thank you so, so much. What a wonderful start to our conference today. And certainly a story of resilience having to leave this beautiful part of the world, go to a mine, the disasters are there, and then go further on around the world. What incredible people they were after having gone through the trauma, as you described, of the evictions. And last year, at the start of our conference, we had a wonderful talk by Kieran Riley on, on evictions and, and the trauma that it had affected, but also, as you mentioned there, the local people who are levelers. There is Gloria. Gloria, go ahead. I'm, he I'm here now. Uh, that was wonderful, girls. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> yes. It, it, was, it was a little long. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've had 175 years to cram into one hour, Gloria. <laughs> oh, I know. It is now uh, nearly half past nine. Time for bed. <laughs> Time for bed, Gloria. Oh, Thank you for it. staying up so late. Thanks very much, oh, Gloria. And, uh, and, and speaking... Well Where's Johnny Mitchell? He's there. Where, where's Johnny? <laughs> Johnny <laughs> Mitchell. I think he's left, but there he is. Johnny, Johnny is still there. We we found Where's Luke. Johnny? Now we're trying to find Johnny. Where's Johnny? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, Gloria, I'm going to just put you back on mute there, and we're going to move on to our next speaker. You've lost your voice, Martin. Martin, you're Martin. on mute. I'm on mute. Sorry, I was trying to put... Glory on mute, and I did the wrong thing. Thank you so much, Robin and Natalie. Wonderful, wonderful so start. So and we're gonna go with Turtle in a few moments. And if Turtle could just unmute himself and- Good I'm morning, going, Martin. Good morning, Turtle. That is fantastic. And that I had a little okay. clip there to just go on and I'm gonna just put everyone else on mute there. So. Without further ado, Turtle is going to give us some fascinating stories about some of the survivors of Angertha Moor, not necessarily in Galway. And I'm sure, Turtle, there you were absorbed as I was. 
by the story there of the Martin family. Churchill has done amazing work, as I said before, in the Vanishing Ireland series, also worked in the RTE Genealogy Roadshow, has several books out to deal with this time in Irish history, including the Irish diaspora, which is right beside me here, and other books. So, Turtle, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you very much for joining us today and look forward to your presentation. Brilliant. Okay, well, listen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and possibly good night, Gloria. How are you all? Um, greetings from County Carlo. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Martin, for organizing this. A round of applause from around the world for uh, your fabulous efforts in, in, in doing that uh, and talking about emigrants and exile. Um, yeah, so I'm a historian. I'm based in County Carlow. It's a little bit rainy this morning. So, uh, well, it's just gone past midday. Um, so you might suddenly hear a lot of rain during the middle of my talk. Um, as Martin says, I'm going to be homing in on the children of the hunger, the, the great hunger and Gorta Moore, uh, some call it the famine, um, but really about the, the people or some of the people who were born during and just after that uh, horrible episode in Irish history, um, which is now, as uh, we were saying, um, and Robin and Natalie, hats off to you guys. That was a great presentation, really very, very interesting. Um, but it is now 175 years since Black 47. Um, and in a way, that's not so long ago, as Gloria will, uh, I'm sure, testify um, during the, the Vanishing Ireland project, uh, which is a project where I went around Ireland um, interviewing people in their 80s, 90s. 106 was the, was the oldest lady. Um, but a lot of the, for a lot of them, their grandparents were children, if not teenagers, during the Great Hunger. So it's amazing that we have you know, people alive today who are that closely connected to uh, this time. Now, look, it is a Saturday and topics do not become uh, much bleaker than stories of famine and hunger and workhouses and evictions and so on. So I will try not to leave you feeling too depressed by the end of this talk. Um, but OK, let us proceed on. Uh, hopefully you can all see the screen at this point. As you have heard, the Great Hunger kicked off 1845. This fungal blight, it probably came from Mexico, that's where they think now, came in to kill the potato crop. It got worse and worse every year after that for five or six years, triggering the most cataclysmic event in recent Irish history. The population of the country, well, you know, it's, it's slightly up for grabs. It might have been 8, 10, maybe 12 million people. Nobody's quite sure. Um, what we do know is that most of them were hugely, of course, dependent on the potato. And you end up with those crazy figures to try and get your head around of 1 million people are said to have died of disease and, and malnutrition. And then you get that mass exodus of almost as many people. So Suddenly, if the population was 8 million, you've lost 2 million, nearly a quarter of a population. It might have been more than 8 million, as I say, but it's an enormous you know, displacement of people. Most fled to uh, the UK, to Great Britain. Um, the census there recorded approximately 400,000 Irish-born residents by 1851, um, <clears throat> primarily living around you know, the port cities like uh, Liverpool and Glasgow and London. Uh, Martin, I think you mentioned Liverpool. 18, the 1851 census recorded that 20% of Liverpool's population uh, was Irish born. Um, but of course, huge numbers also braved the Atlantic and would set their sights on North America or indeed Australia, as we've been uh, learning so eloquently this morning or this evening, where, depending on where you are. Uh, for so many millions of the Irish diaspora, um, you know, Irish Americans, Irish Australians, the, the great hunger, the famine is their genesis. You know, that's where it begins. That's the origin. That is the start. They don't know where they were, where their family was before the famine. All they know is that their ancestors, maybe their great great grandparents or their great great grandparents, um, you know, caught a ship out of Ireland and escaped. A huge number of those uh, two million souls, the one million who died and the one million who emigrated, a huge number of them were children. 
Uh, how many? I do not know. I, I, I imagine we are talking at least 20 to 30 percent. So perhaps that's as many as half a million children, you know, that we're, we're talking with. Um, if any of you have looked at the workhouse records from this uh, period, it is pretty harrowing stuff um, to see, to read the litany of the, the children who died and the causes of their death. It slows it right down. You find it every workhouse, whether in Balmaslow or Port Umner or, or Mount Bellew, anywhere all across Ireland. Um, and it really, it, it, it just, it slows it down. When I was reading those workhouse uh, statistics when I was a much younger man, um, it was the first time I realised how every single statistic is a, a story, as, as Robin and Natalie were saying earlier. It just, it just brings it to life when you see the name of each individual. Um, but many of the children who emigrated out of Ireland went on um, to do remarkable things. Um, and that's the people I'm going to just home on in this talk. Uh, on stories, as Martin says, of resilience and people who championed uh, adversity uh, and become survivors. And maybe those stories, because we obviously we have millions and millions of refugees in the world today, 81 million, according to what I was reading yesterday. It's just mind numbing. Um, but you know, again, each one of those 81 million stories, you know, that, sorry, that's 81 million people is a story. Um, and some of those people are going to do incredible things too. I have no doubt about it. Okay, so the cheapest tickets uh, from Ireland were to the Canadian port of Quebec. Um, although, of course, you could uh, maybe go on one of those assisted passage schemes. Um, about 90,000 people sailed out of Ireland on assisted passage schemes. That's where your landlord basically pays to get you away from the country. Um, and, well, your chances of survival on one of those ships, of course, depend on the hygiene standards. Um, the Percy family of Roxburgh in County Galway, uh, they commissioned a bark called the Barbara to bring 260 of their tenants from their estate to Quebec. Uh, and the ship's doctor understood the importance of hygiene standards um, and he maintained absolute cleanliness on board the ship. His, he, he's got a log book and you can see how he, he'd bring all the passengers had to come up on deck four times a day to exercise, splash salt water on their bodies. Um, and he would keep notes of anybody who was like scratching themselves or displaying any suspicious symptoms. That voyage took uh, 15 days and he arrived at Quebec with all 260 passengers in perfect health. Uh, however, some of those assisted uh, passage schemes were deeply flawed, um, most memorably that of Major Mahan of Oman of Strokestown in County Roscommon. He arranged for uh, nearly 1,500 of his tenants to sail from Liverpool to America. Uh, the vessels on which they travelled became known as coffin ships. They, they were the first of the coffin ships, uh, so-called because they were riddled with typhus or famine fever. Almost uh, a quarter, uh, sorry, almost a half of the passengers died on board the ship or in the quarantine sheds at Gros Isle, which is this island um, about 20 miles east of Quebec. Major Mahan was held accountable for those deaths and subsequently shot dead uh, near his home. Um, the fate of the Strokestown emigrants, that was, of course, by no means unique. One in five of nearly 100,000 emigrants who sailed for Quebec in 1847 died. Uh, one in five, either on the voyage or at Gros Isle. Among those buried at Gros Isle is a lady called Thomasine Ford. Uh, she was from Clonakilty in County Cork, and she'd sailed from Cove with her husband, uh, John, and six children, but she succumbed to famine fever during the voyage across the Atlantic. So his wife's dead, John Ford, takes his six children to Michigan, uh, he acquires a farm amid the pine forests of uh, Dearborn, it's near Detroit, um, and he's, his oldest son Billy helps him run the farm, and then Billy marries this orphaned Belgian girl uh, who'd been raised by a neighbouring couple, farmers from Cork, and Billy's first son was this guy, Henry Ford. Um, obviously one of the most influential figures in US history. He not only established the Ford Motor Company, but he also pioneered the use of assembly lines, um, you know, which led to the mass production of cars. Uh, in fact, uh, he had the concept down to such an art that they could create a new Model T automobile from scratch 
in 98 minutes. Amazing stuff. He's no angel, of course, Henry Ford. Um, he also, but he, you know, he, he raised workers' wages. He, he lowered the costs across the US and he's actually credited with creating the American middle class. Um, but that whole notion of his, his grandmother having died while sailing across um, the seas with her children, um, it, it was evidently very impactful for him. And Henry Ford would in turn uh, establish uh, the first major Fordson tractor factory outside of America in Cork, in his home county of Cork. Um, we talked about sunny Toronto earlier. I think some people are, are watching from sunny Toronto. In January 1847, the population of Toronto was 20,000 people. By the close of that year, it had trebled to 60,000. Uh, and the vast majority of those newcomers were refugees, really, from Ireland. Um, thousands and thousands of them were uh, corralled into an area of Newmarket. It was known as Paddy Town because there were so many Irish in the, the church, was St. Patrick's Church. Um, and uh, I've, I've been writing about this area recently, and it's, it's just, it's intriguing and, and awful. Um, the, the, by and large, the Irish refugees who'd come into Paddytown, into Canada, uh, were shunned by earlier settlers. They didn't want them really, you know, they, they viewed them as penniless paupers, was one. And, and uh, lots of people thought, well, they're going to be carrying disease, keep them, you know, kept corralled, as I say. Uh, and the typhus epidemic had been so rampant in Ireland, and it did, it, it cut swathes through the newly arrived emigrant population. Um, you have thousands uh, dying within weeks or months of their arrival in Canada, along with all the nurses and physicians and orderlies and caregivers, as we call them these days, uh, who are trying to heal the suffering in the fever sheds erected along Toronto's waterfront cheesecloth uh, was tacked onto the buildings to keep out the flies and offer some sort of level of um, privacy to those within. Um, uh, it was called the summer, 1847 is known in Canada as the summer of sorrow. Um, and among those who died was uh, Michael Power, who was the um, born in Waterford and he was the first Roman Catholic um, uh, Bishop of Toronto. So yeah, I, I just mentioned, I've just been writing about Paddy Town uh, recently and I was homing in on a family called O'Leary from Abbey Field, well, the, the sort of Kerry side of Abbey Field. Uh, in Limerick. Um, and I just think it's amazing because the, these guys arrived absolutely destitute into Paddy Town. Again, it was a, a, a couple with four children. Um, and somehow one of those children, a boy, I've got no photographs to show you because there aren't one, but he managed to sort of get out of there. And a bit like um, what we were hearing about the Kill Martins earlier, he went to work on the railroads and uh, laying pipes and made enough money to give his children an education. And within three generations, they were the captains of industry in Houston, Texas. They're a hugely influential family there and they run the St. Patrick's uh, Parade in Houston. So it's amazing that somebody can come from that in two generations and that sort of, uh, I don't know, that ability to rise up is extremely impressive. Um, others who arrived in Toronto at this time, there was a young girl called Mary Harris uh, she was traveling with her father, Richard, who was a railway laborer from possibly from Cork. Um, Mary Harris was to experience considerable hardship during her 30s when she lost her husband and all four of her children. Everybody died. Um, and then uh, that was a, 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 she was in Memphis at the time. There was a yellow fever epidemic. Then she starts again, sets up a, a seamstress enterprise in Chicago, which is destroyed by the Great Chicago Fire. Um, and you'd think, well, maybe she might just call it quits, but I don't know, maybe it's that whole memory of where she'd come from and having got away from Ireland as a young child that gave her the spirit to pull through and reinvent herself. Uh, because by the 1890s, Mary Harris was better known as Mother Jones. Um, I don't know if you know Mother Jones, but she was one of the most celebrated champions of socialism in North America, she's uh, especially popular in West Virginia, Colorado, Pennsylvania, those sort of places, because she would organize these mass rallies of women and children uh, to support striking coal miners. Uh, and when those coal miners were on strike, she also arranged this mass deliver delivery of farm produce uh, to supply and feed all the strikers' camps. Uh, she had a battle cry, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. 
Um, and she was just, you know, she was pretty remarkable. She also, in 1903, uh, child, uh, child labor was uh, an ongoing thing right up until the early 20th uh, century. And in 1903, she led a children's crusade uh, from Philadelphia to DC, Washington, DC. I oh, know it was actually to Long Island, sorry. It was uh, uh, to where uh, President Roosevelt had his summer home and she led this children's crusade in protest against uh, child labor. She was described as the most dangerous woman in America, which she loved, uh, I should say, and the grandmother of all agitators. She was arrested and imprisoned on numerous occasions, but remained active in the labor movement right up until her death in her 90s in uh, 1930. Um, and there is a magazine called Mother Jones today, but her name is, it's a, you know, she is enshrined um, as, a, as a symbol for feminists and for uh, the left, for the radical left, um, but really a remarkable woman born uh, in Ireland at the height of the uh, Great Hunger. <clears throat> right. Mother Jones was clearly made of uh, tough material, but arriving into Toronto seems to have offered, um, it was actually marginally easier than uh, those who, who um, came into New York during the famine years. Uh, the tens of thousands who piled into New York, again, Robin and Natalie uh, touched on this earlier. Uh, there was a census of Manhattan, 1855. It revealed that over 25% um, of its population was Irish born. Uh, that was an equal ratio of, of men and women. Um, many of those guys were living in the ramshackle tenements of Five Points. And if you've seen Martin Scorsese's Gangs of New York, that's you know where that is uh, so violently depicted. Um, among the people living in Five Points was 17-year-old Catherine Devine, or Devine. Um, she had emigrated uh, at the age of 17. Um, on board the Devonshire in 1846. So she was clearly you know, getting out of Ireland at that time. Uh, she would later be recalled as a jolly Irish lady full of fun and mischief. The jury's out as to where she came from. A lot of people saying Boyle and County Roscommon. Anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll get to, uh, to where I'm coming from with this story in a moment. She lives uh, in five points. She's got a son called Henry, father unknown, possibly uh, dead. In the 1860s, Catherine uh, heads west via Indiana and Kansas to New Mexico with young Henry. Uh, she marries a silver miner. Uh, he's called William Antrim, probably an Irishman. Uh, and then she dies of tuberculosis in 1874. Henry's only 15 at the time. This is a picture of her son, Henry, here. Uh, he masters the arts of cattle rustling and gambling. He learns how to speak uh, fluent Spanish. Uh, he plays croquet, he's a very skilled croquet player, but he also most famously learns how to shoot a pistol. He shoots his first man dead at the age of 17, a, a, a Galway man uh, called Frank Windy Cattle. Uh, who is this guy? Well, if you haven't guessed at uh, this stage, it is Billy the Kid. Um, and yes, Henry McCarthy was his uh, original name, but he changed his name to William H. Bonney. And so the legend of Billy the Kid was born. By the time uh, he was gunned down by Sheriff Pat Garrett in 1881, he's thought to have killed eight men, although posterity uh, tends to say that he killed 21 people, one for every year of his short life. Um, it's just the Galway connection is, uh, is, is relevant here because most of his victims worked for um, uh, the Galway-born um, James Dolan, uh, who was a, a very unscrupulous beef baron who had uh, arranged the murder of... Um, Billy's boss, uh, John Henry Tunstall, if you've ever seen any of the Billy the Kid movies. Okay, if you had emigrated to the US during the time of the Great Hunger, you know, the late 1840s, uh, early 1850s, you are of course perfectly set uh, to serve in the US Civil War. And uh, I know Jarlath Mac McNamara is gonna be giving a, a terrific talk later about Patrick S. Gilmore. Um, <clears throat> the whole story of the Irish and the American Civil War, it has been covered in tremendous detail by Damien Shields. He's an absolute expert on this. Um, but the bottom line is that about 200,000 Irishmen fought in the American Civil War, huge number. Uh, most of them were for the Union Army, uh, but at least 20,000 served for the Confederacy. Um, some of you might have read or come across Sebastian Barry's book, Days Without End. Uh, it, it kind of beautifully captures the 
awfulness of, of those soldiers who were born in Ireland during those the, the time of the potato blight and managed to get to America and survive it all only to you know, die on the battlefields of Gettysburg and such like. Among those <clears throat> who served in the US Civil War was this man, Richard Dowling or Dick Dowling, uh, who grew up on a 93 acre farm near Milltown in County Galway when the farm was uh, unable to provide a, a living for the uh, Dowling family. His, fam his parents found themselves in the Chum workhouse, um, but somehow they managed to uh, raise the funds to send Dick, uh, who was only 11 years old at the time, uh, Dick and one of his sisters, they sent him on a ship to New Orleans. And he arrived there, as I say, aged 11 in 1846. Um, he then uh, got himself to Houston, Texas, where he slowly but surely got himself into the property game. Uh, he also bought a half share in a steamboat. Uh, and then he, he uh, ran something called the Bank of Bacchus. Uh, and it was a, a very popular hub uh, for uh, where he served drink and food to Irish dockers and uh, railroad workers in, in Houston. Um, and he then, uh, well, he made enough money to get himself some shares in what is believed to have been uh, the first oil company in Texas. So he was clearly uh, very on the bull. When the Civil War came out, he became a hero across the South. Um, for his brilliant leadership when he utterly destroyed an attempt by the Union Army to invade Texas. It's via the Sabine Pass, for anybody who knows that area. Um, and uh, as I'm saying, Dick Dowling was a Confederate. He was one of the 20,000 or so Irishmen who, who fought for the Confederacy. Uh, that would come to be a blot on his copybook uh, in more recent times. I'll come on to that. Um, like so many of the Irish in North America, uh, especially those who'd, who'd been driven out of Ireland during the horrors of the famine and seen all that eviction and, and misery beforehand. Um, he was, uh, Dick Dowling was a, a sympathizer and probably a member of the Fenian Brotherhood. Uh, as I say, it's not remotely surprising, the Fenian Brotherhood, uh, it was a Republican organization uh, established by Irish exiles in uh, New York in 1858. It's named for a uh, the Fina, a band of uh, warriors from, uh, from Irish mythology, and their primary objective was to establish Ireland as an independent democratic republic uh, by armed revolution, if need be. And they're very closely entwined with um, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is another secret oath-bound uh, society. So Dick Dowling, 1866, when the Fenians uh, launched a series of raids against uh, various uh, army depots and custom ports in British Canada, uh, and he's, in, he's involved in that, but those raids had kind of petered out um, when uh, a guy called Patrick Condon, he's the Inspector General of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, he comes to stay with Dick Dowling in Houston. And the thinking is that Dick Dowling was lined up to play a, a much greater role in the Fenian story and then bump he contracted yellow fever and died in early 1867 just before the uh, great Fenian risings. Um, he was so popular in Houston that the citizens uh, named uh, a street in the third ward in his memory uh, and, and Tume Street actually Tume Street in Houston is named after the Galway town from which he came. Uh, he was commemorated with this the first publicly financed monument in Houston uh, it's a white Carrara uh, marble statue of him and it originally stood in the uh, in front of the city's market house. It was later moved to Herman Park where you can see it there now. But as I say, uh, Dick Dowling's support for the Confederacy ultimately served against him. And uh, when the uh, Dowling Street was renamed Emancipation Avenue in 2017 and after the Black Lives Matter, uh, the George Floyd uh, protests in June 2020, his statue was removed uh, from the Herman Park. Uh, across in New Orleans, uh, there is another uh, statue and commemorates a lady by the name of Margaret of New Orleans. That's what she's known as. Um, and of course, New Orleans is where Dick Dowling had once lived. Um, Dick, uh, sorry, uh, Margaret was uh, an astoundingly benevolent woman and a really remarkable. She's not a child of the, <clears throat> excuse me, she's not a child of the great hunger as such, but bear with me because her story 
begins in um, Tully, which is near Carrigallon in uh, on the Leitrim Longford border. Uh, and she was one of, excuse me one second. <coughs> My apologies for that. Um, she was one of six children uh, born to uh, a farmer who also made an income as a tailor. He was a farmer tailor. I've interviewed a man who's a farmer tailor. It's a, a wonderful double uh, act to do. This man was also an uncompromising foe of Saxon rule. Um, anyway, she spent her first uh, few years sharing a, a mattress with her siblings in the cottage in Leitrim where they grew up. Um, and then eventually her dad took the plunge and bought five tickets to get the family to America for himself, his wife and Margaret and, and the two other children. Um, and they get to Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and then ah, they die. Literally all of them are taken out by various diseases, leaving Margaret. Um, she's nine years old. She's an orphan. She's alone. <clears throat> she's utterly destitute. She goes to work as a domestic servant. Um, and kind of disappears from the archives for a while, uh, but she re-emerges in the 1830s when she gets married to uh, an, uh, another Irishman who's a very uh, poorly, uh, an Irishman in poor health from, from Cork, uh, and they go to New Orleans, and about 25,000 Irish people settled in New Orleans during the 1830s, so Margaret's part of that lot. Um, a little bit like Mother Jones, she's just destined for endless... Um, adversity at this stage in her life and both her husband and her only daughter die um, and so she is feeling pretty rejected um, by life when a friend of hers who's in the Sisters of Charity takes her to an orphanage and she walks around the orphanage and she just kind of has a sort of uh, I don't know road to Damascus moment she instantly offers um her she, she's working as a washerwoman at the time she instantly offers her wages she goes and with her wages goes out and buys a lavish breakfast for all the children in the orphanage she then devotes her life to raising money for the orphanage and not just that orphanage lots of other orphanages because new orleans has an awful lot of orphans at this time uh and many of those would have been children of irish immigrants who had arrived who flooded into the city following you know the great hunger um, by the early 1850s, the Irish constituted almost a quarter of New Orleans population. And from a demographic perspective, an enormous number of them were children. Um, there was another spike in 1853 when yellow fever tore into New Orleans and killed about 8,000 people. So again, you're going to have a lot more orphans on the back of that. Margaret, so she gets into the orphanage game. She deduced that the orphanage, the first one she'd gone to visit, was spending uh, too much money buying milk for the girls. And so she'd grown up on a farm. She went and bought two cows uh, and began milking them herself to provide milk for the orphanage. By 1852, she's got a 40 cow dairy in downtown New Orleans. Um, and she's not only, it's not only supplying the orphanage, she's selling milk to numerous households around New Orleans, as well as to the Catholic church. Um, she uses the money, the, the profits she makes from the dairy to pay off a loan that the Sisters of Charity have uh, taken to build a new and much larger orphanage, yeah, a purpose-built orphanage as well. The first one was just a, a you know, ramshackle building. By 1868, she's got that building you're looking at on, on screen there. Um, that is, uh, well, it was the first steam bakery in the American South. Um, so she's, uh, yeah, creating extra fancy crackers of all varieties and brands and, and breads and, and so on. Um, and she has an exceptional knack for business. Uh, her ovens are always uh, the most up-to-date and efficient models available. Uh, she figures out how to keep um, biscuits fresh for weeks on end. And that's very uh, important. It has great appeal to people who, to passengers who are heading off on the long voyage from New Orleans to Europe. Um, and also, in a very sort of 21st century mind, she, she seals the deal by making sure all the uh, cakes and crackers and cookies, they're all tied up in beautifully presented packages. So she knows how to do all that. She becomes known as the bread lady. Um, and uh, when Margaret died, she died in 1882, enormously popular. There's a whole front page of the New, New Orleans papers were about her. They're all rimmed in black uh, when she died. Uh, she became the only, only the second woman in uh, American history, US history, to be honored with a public monument. 
It is located in a small park near the uh, orphanage. Um, it is um, uh, like Dialing Statue, it's, a, it's Carrara marble, and it is inscribed, as you can hopefully see at the bottom of your screen, with just one word, Margaret. Um, because for the citizens of New Orleans in 1884, no further explanation was necessary. Okay, <clears throat> we shall now go to County Clare. Hello, how are we doing on time? We've got a couple more of these characters if you're if you can bear with me. Um, County Clare for the story of John Philip Holland, um, the bespectacled, mustachioed submarine inventor, um, whose life was also very much shaped by Angora Moore. Uh, John Philip Holland was raised in a humble cottage near the Cliffs of Moher, near Liscanner, um, and it's still standing to this day. Um, he was born in 1841, so you know he's five, six uh, years old when the, when the famine started tearing into the, into the area. Um, and the potato blight absolutely desecrated the countryside uh, around where he was um, to such an extent that his father, his younger brother and two of his uncles uh, died during that, that period. And he himself, uh, you can see from the picture just about that he's wearing glasses, but um, he suffered terrible eyesight all his, all his life. Um, and I, it's thought that that is because of the lack of vitamin A. And, and this was something that affected a lot of children at this time. Um, and, and it gave him ophthalmia, uh, you know, a, an eye disease. And as I said, a huge number of, of children at this time were affected. There was another guy, Dinny Delaney, who was a piper from Balna Slow, who also went blind around about this time, although I th that might have been uh, smallpox. But anyway, it's what happens with John Philip Holland is his bad eyesight. He wanted to become a navigator, um, but you know that's out, as he put it. No one would trust me even to row a two-oared boat, much less navigate a ship. Um, oh yeah, sorry, here's a statistic about ophthalmia. Uh, so common in workhouses and among children that there were 13,000 cases recorded in 1849 and 27,000 cases recorded in 1850. 27,000 children with uh, eye disease. You know, you can imagine how that's gonna play out. Anyway, um, John Philip Holland um, manages to, um, to take, well, he's educated by the Christian brothers and he then takes his vows with the Christian brothers uh, in 1858. And he spends the next 15 years as a sort of roving school teacher, uh, teaching maths and music. And he's going to uh, Christian Brothers schools all around Ireland. He's in Armagh, Cork, Port Leash, um, Enniscorthy, Drogheda, Dundalk, you know, all of these different places. And as a music teacher, he pioneers or, or champions the solfege technique. I don't know if you are familiar with this, but Julie Andrews, it's what she teaches the Von Trapp children when they sing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, Ta, Di, Ma, but not do too much of that, um, in the sound of music. Um, so uh, that's one of his things. 1873, his brother's already emigrated to um, uh, Boston, and in 1873, John Philip Holland gives up his teaching job in Ireland and emigrates to Boston to join Michael, his brother. Michael is in the Fenian Brotherhood, I mentioned them earlier, committed to the overthrow of British rule in Ireland. Um, John Philip Holland wants to invent uh, a submarine. In 1880, he um, brings his, no, his um, designs for a submarine. He's been designing them in Cork from when he was a young fellow. I won't go into the backstory of all that, but basically, he had created this one-man submarine, which was powered by foot pedals. And um, that's, uh, anyway, this is a later version of it. You're going to see it here. Um, and it was, it was a submarine powered by foot pedals. He presented it to the US Navy Department. They described it as a fantastic scheme of a civilian landsman and rejected it. So he's snubbed. He goes to talk to Michael, his brother, and says, well, the US Navy have rejected it. And Michael, a member of the Fenian Brotherhood, says, tell me, what does it do again? And he says, well, you know, it can go underwater and do things underwater. So the Fenians think this is rather good. So they commission him to build the world's first submarine. It's nicknamed the Fenian Ram. And what they wanted to do is to go underwater and ram British battleships and to do damage underwater. That's what it's designed for. 
So um, he then um, performs the first successful underwater trip for a submarine in a very small one-man sub. Um, he spends about one hour on the riverbed in Patterson, Paterson, New Jersey. I'm not sure how you say it. Um, and it's for the Fenians originally, but at this crucial moment in um, the history of Irish nationalism, the Fenians split. Uh, there's a huge division in the ranks, mostly over money matters to do with um, Phillips, uh, John Philip Holland's uh, submarine. And it just all sort of disintegrates and Holland gives up on them all and exits. Anyway, eventually the US Navy Department finally realized the genius of um, John Philip Holland. Um, and on St. Patrick's Day, 1898, he launches his first submarine. Uh, it's, it, it travels, uh, I don't know, it remained underwater for an hour and 40 minutes, which is game-changing stuff. Um, the, US Navy, the US Navy is about to go into a war against Spain, so they like the idea of this new game-changing machine. Uh, unfortunately, Holland was um, broke at this point, so he had to sell his company, his uh, submarine building firm, to this German-born businessman who renamed it the Electric Boat Company. Um, and basically, all the submarines that were being designed, uh, that were used in the First World War, were all based on John Philip Holland's design, and it had a massive impact. Um, he didn't live to enjoy the fruits of it all, sadly. Uh, he died in 1914. I think he was a bit horrified by what the submarine might do in the event of a, of a war which broke out after his death. Um, but the company he kind of founded would later evolve into General Dynamics Corporation, now one of the world's largest aerospace and um, defense contractors. Okay, I am going to um, finish up with um, one of my absolute favorites, Nellie Cashman, um, who is a, oh, she's a brilliant woman. She was, she was born in 1845 in um, Middleton in County Cork. Uh, obviously, in 1845, being right just as the potato blight was about to do its uh, damage. Um, and um, so for the first five years of her life, um, she is, uh, you know, surrounded by that misery. She's in, she's in Ireland all the way through 1845, early 1850s. We know we don't know a whole lot about, um, you know, her childhood, but you can speculate and you can imagine how, you know, as we were saying earlier, how intensely shocked and traumatized everybody would have been during those years. And Middleton, where she um, grew up, was the center of relief for East Cork uh, during those awful years. Uh, it had the only um, workhouse in the area. Um, the workhouse was built to house 800 inmates. Uh, by 1846, it had over double that. And that's the case with workhouses all across Ireland that have at least double, if not more. Anyway, one way or another, she makes her way to Boston uh, and she's working as a bellhop in a hotel. That's a sort of concierge, a junior concierge. And the legend has it that uh, General Ulysses Grant, um, who had become the uh, president of the United States, that he gets into the lift with her and he looks her up and down and he says, you know what, you should go west, young lady. This is the, the legend of how Nellie Cashman then decided to do just that. And she and her sister headed west on the new railroad had just been uh, constructed and they get to San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> by 1873, she's running a boarding house in a, in a silver mining boom town called Pioche, Nevada. Uh, and life was so rough in Pioche, Nevada, that, and the town still proudly claims this uh, to this day, the first 72 people buried in its cemetery were all shot dead in gunfights. So pretty hairy spot. Anyway, <clears throat> Nellie is never perturbed by these sort of things. Um, and uh, so she stays there for a while. When the gun, there's a gold rush going on then. When the gold rush, um, died, she goes north to the Cassiar Mountains, that's up in British Columbia, a very remote place uh, where there's another sort of mining boom going on. Um, and she's, she's there, she, feed, she sets up another boarding house, she's nursing people, she's feeding the miners. Um, there's a, a, an epic moment when a group of maybe 50, 60 miners get stranded up in the mountains during a snowstorm. And Nellie personally leads a group of five people who go up, lead a rescue party. They travel for something like 70 days up into the mountains uh, and go and get the miners and bring them all back down again. Um, and she's known thereafter as the angel of the Cassiars. 
Okay, so her story could end there and you'd think, wow, what an amazing woman. But when that gold mine ends, she makes her way all the way down to Arizona. Um, and she sets up a chain of restaurants across Arizona that leads her to Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, and she has a series of restaurants in Tombstone, right, where she becomes friends with Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday and all those guys. And she's there throughout the gunfight at the OK Corral and all that malarkey. Um, and uh, then that gold rush sort of peters out and she goes, oh no, actually her sister died and, and uh, she was left with five uh, nephews and nieces. She never married, but she had five nephews uh, and nieces to look after and she decided she better head back to San Francisco to look after them. She doesn't stay too long in San Francisco She because the Klondike gold rush kicks off in the 1890s. Nelly hightails it up there, goes back, setting up boarding houses, hanging out with the miners. She, just, she's a legend with them all. By 1908, and bear, you know, bearing in mind that this lady was born, as I say, before, or just on the, the first year of the, of the Great Hunger, by 1908, she'd settled in a cabin at a place called Coldfoot. It's 100 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and this, believe it or not, is where she remained living on her own very defiantly for the next 16 years. Um, I've been in touch with some of her descendants and uh, she had a nephew called Mike Cunningham who went up to her, you know, found her and invited her to come back south and live with his family. And she said, it'll be a long time before I reach the cushioned rocker stage. You know, she was having none of it. Anyway, uh, she is amazing because she's, in her life she was always sort of doing the right thing and feeding the hungry and sheltering the homeless and bringing a little joy to uh, the unforgiving reality of a miner's life and I love the fact that this woman as I say born you know amid the heartache of the great hunger she lived long enough to experience an airplane ride over those mountains I mentioned er earlier the Cassiars her beloved mountains she went in an airplane ride uh, over them uh, and she was finally felled by a combined dose of pneumonia and rheumatism um, and died uh, aged 80 in 1925. There are so many other zillions and zillions of people, as I say, you know, every one of those people who emigrated is, uh, is a story, every person who died is a story. Um, and that is just a, a, little, a little sample of them. And uh, Martin, I hope that's, uh, that's sort of what you're looking at. We, we know that uh, there are as I say, so many others. It includes the ancestors of numerous presidents, of course, as well. Um, but I shall now hand back to you, Martin. Excellent. Excellent, Turtle. That was wonderful, insightful there. And um, I guess one of, one of the things there that I found was there are, as you said, so many stories there, wonderful from, you went there from Henry the Ford to Billy the Kid to Margaret Hottery to John Holland to Nellie Cashman. And all those stories are ones, maybe not with Billy the Kids going to end up, or Richard Dowling, not going to end up with the best of possibilities, but they were resilient and in many cases so successful. Turtle, just a question there. Do you think that that effect on them as, as refugees of surviving made people like Nellie Cashman say, we can go the extra mile? Or was it just that, you know, freed from kind of like that colonialism and that small farmers that when they went across to the great wide open plains of Australia or America, they suddenly found a creative freedom that they mightn't have got at home? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, th think both, both of those points are absolutely true, Martin. I mean, obviously, the, the, uh, you know, not everybody's going to be blessed with that uh, ability to, to, you know, to arrive and, and, and get over that grim drudgery of, of the workhouses and the, and the travel and all that. But having, you know, got through that, surely for a lot of people, it's going to be, damn, I'm not going back there again. I'm, you know, I'm, they're going to be very driven. And you do get that enormous sense, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, with that family, the O'Learys, who in two generations, um, that sense of just, I'm just not going to be defeated by this. Um, and as you to your second point, the ability to be able to do that to an extent in North America. Now, you know, it, it, you know we like to think that they were welcomed with op open arms in North America, but as I mentioned, they weren't in Canada. And, and again, the whole in, in, in uh, 
the USA, it was also true that Irish Catholics, you know, obviously it would be a long time before they would be accepted into society. Uh, you, you know, it wasn't until the 1880s, I think, that you'd start to get the first mayors uh, that were, were Catholic. And of course, it wouldn't be until you know, 1960s that you get the first uh, Catholic president. Um, so, you know, there, there was still plenty of adversity to, to overcome in, in, in America and indeed in Australia too, of course. Fantastic. Just reading out some of the comments there, and maybe if you just stop sharing the screen, so you you have full oh, there, turtle. Oh, okay. That'd be good. Um, and how do I do that again? Let me just uh, just go down the share. bottom. Yeah, yeah. Share. There we go. So people there can see, see your wonderful self there. Um, Karen, okay. my great cousin um, in Australia, said great stories. Thank you, Tom Crane. Great stories. Karen, who's in Toronto, by the way. And Karen has sent uh, yeah. some links for the, for the park. Um, thank you so much. So many interesting stories. Henri Coderi, who's in Baltimore. Wow, so interesting. Thank you. Denise, so interesting. Tom Crane said that location on Levy Street was right on the wharfs. Very busy part of New Orleans. Mm. And Tom is, is into researching on the Irish and the Confederates as well. So he has sent a link for the Battle of Sabine Pass there. I think that's Charlotte, who's down at Gilmo. Um, he's talking about Cabbage Down, top class real estate in Toronto. So hopefully some of those Irish immigrants kept a little bit of sliver of land and are multimillionaires today. And Karen has sent that link there for the Irish famine uh, commemoration in, in Toronto's waterfront. Um, if anyone has Denise, any other questions. Denise from... there has come in with the farmer Taylor combo mention means I need to revisit records. Um, I love the farmer Taylor combo, but uh, I've also loved um, the, uh, the, the the pub Taylor combo as well, which I have um, seen in. Uh, oh no, where is it? It was down in Kerry. It was absolutely brilliant. It was a pub that was also a tailor. Um, so you went in, you got you know measured up and everything like that. And then he said, "Would you like to stay and have a couple of pints while we do some of the <laughs> edit bits?" Absolutely fabulous. I'm just wondering, did after the few pints, did they have to buy extra large trousers then and stuff like that? So there was a little bit of a, an extra incentive for them to, to, to sell those clothes in that way. So that, <laughs> that is terrific. There are so many stories, Turtle. Turtle, what prompted you first to get into the stories of the, the diaspora, especially of the, the, the children of the farmer? Well, actually, I wrote a book called 1847 about five or six years ago when I, it was a history of the world in the year 1847. I wanted to see what was going on, not just in Ireland, um, obviously Ireland and, and the impact of the famine was you know, enormous in, in North America and Australia and Europe. Uh, but I just wanted to see what the other things were. It's a bit like now. There are so many other things that distract and, and, and you know, we have you know, the biggies, you, you know, we have COVID and we have Ukraine and so on. Um, but there are other things that distract everybody. And I wanted to see what was kind of distracting everybody uh, during that time. So that's, that was, you know, my, my basic interest in, in, the, in the time period. Um, but then I, I do family histories. I, I write a lot of family histories and the amount of them that always come back to, you know, the 1840s uh, with these people who I'm, who I'm writing their stories for. Uh, I just thought it was absolutely fascinating how many of them, as I say, it's the genesis for so many people. Excellent, excellent. Has anyone got any other questions there for Turtle? Or to just a, a comment and stuff? Yeah, the, the farmer tailor I often come across, but I found that my grandmother's father was a tailor. He was one of the younger sons, never knew that. My um, needle ability is quite limited myself. So that part of my DNA didn't get passed on. So do right. that. Churchill, thank you very much for that absolutely wonderful talk. Really, really appreciate that. And um, hopefully you're, you're in the, the Facebook group. You see a lot of people sharing stories and hopefully some of those folks will, will prompt you as well to maybe write a story about theirs in, in time to come. OK, well, um, thank you very much. I've, I've, I've very much enjoyed it and uh, I'm, I'm going to be tuning back in. I've got to step out for a little moment now, but I'm going to be back in a moment. Um, so thank you, Martin, and uh, no worries, everybody Churchill. else, enjoy your day. Thank you very much. And just like Churchill there, I think some people might want to, we're going to just take maybe a five minute break to just get a cup of tea, toilet break or whatever, because, and I'm going to just put on my shared screen here, going to just put on the 
screen for the day and just to come back then at quarter past and I will be talking at quarter past on the papers and the reporting of on Gertha Moore in 1847 and how we can do that. So we just take a short few minutes break so people can put on the cup of tea. And if anyone wants to have a quick question or a chat about anything else, please feel free to do that in the chat as well. So not everybody is going to be going away, but um, some people are. So we'll just take a few minutes break and put the kettle on or a bathroom break or whatever you would like to do. And again, thanks to Turtle for that wonderful talk and looking forward in just over half an hour or so to Charlotte, who will be giving a talk as well on the first American superstar, which is Patrick S. Gilmer. So looking forward to that very much. So don't go away. Well, just go down to get the kettle on for a few minutes. Thanks, folks.
and welcome back everyone. I just want to just make sure that everybody is okay and we're going to just get back to sharing the screen in a few moments. So it's one or two that have joined us um, since we started so just very welcome to you all. So I'm going to just give a little bit about the reporting. And I'm gonna just give me a thumbs up there, John or Natalie, that you can see the screen okay. I can see they're fantastic. So there's one or two still coming into the waiting room. So I'm gonna just do that. So unfortunately, Andrew Martin um, couldn't make it today. Andrew is, is fantastic. He has, um, he and uh, set up a company to bring the Irish newspapers, Irish news archives um, to online. So it's a, a tremendous resort. And, and last year, Andrew um, gave us a, an insightful talk on how to use that. So I'm gonna just go with using some of the newspaper reporting and how to access them over the next few minutes. So hopefully everybody is back at this stage. And the title that I took was from a newspaper article, um, Bread Our Work, where people had protested Mayo to try and to get some relief during 1847. So I'm gonna just hopefully will this work and my screen just kind of froze on me. So I'm gonna just go back to the screen share in a few seconds and hopefully bread and work will come up properly this time. So there we go. So Irish News Archives, the, the newspaper archives is, is Andrew's uh, website and it's a, a wonderful one. It's a subscription website. And um, so sometimes there are good deals to be had and sometimes you can get um, many options in, in terms of like a, a, a length of time that might be able to do that. So what I did with this is to just look at in terms of what is found in the year of 1847 and using some key words. So for instance, I narrowed it down to two newspapers, the Connacht Telegraph and the Tumor Herald, because they would have quite a, an amount of information about the area. Um, some other newspapers at the time, like the Nation, the Freeman's Journal, obviously would have that, the rest common um, Herald also would have it. So, but I wanted just to narrow it down and you can do that by filtering by title on the bottom left there of the screen. Hopefully you can see that. And I just used the word starvation and I restricted it to the year 1847. So there were 157 results for that word starvation. You can see the top one there, the kind of telegraph from Wednesday, March 3rd, 1847, deaths from starvation. And a poor man was found lying dead on a heap of stones in an inhabited cabin. Now, this was from New Antrim near this town. So you have to go in to see exactly where that was happening. So it was somewhere possibly local to um, somewhere in County Mayo where the kind of telegraph would have been located. And the Tomb Herald talks about inquests into debt by starvation. And that was going to be a common theme right throughout the year. Inquests were going to be held on people and the newspapers are going to be reporting on those inquests. The Tomb Herald there, the death by starvation, a correspondent informs us that a man named Thomas Mohan died of starvation within a quarter of a mile of the town of Woodford on Tuesday last, leaving four young children without food or a person to take care of them. They lost their mother last summer from the same cause. The interesting thing for me is this is November of 1847, so it's, it's quite desperate at this stage. And especially now, these four young children left without any parents. But it was really way down in the newspaper at this stage. In a way, it was famine fatigue in just the same way as the first days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine was 
front and center in all of the new casts. Now it's going further and further away. And that is going to be the, the cause of a loss of newspapers because unfortunately the people paying for the newspapers, they didn't want to have this day after day, week after week, even though it touched their lives and the lives of their neighbors quite deeply. So you will see that the newspapers, sometimes the articles are going to be much less than if this had happened um, in 1846, just before the great hunger really erupted in, in Black 47. Again, the Tomb Herald inquests that were, that were in, and this is uh, from the Mayo Constitution that the Mayo, or that the Tomb Herald um, copied. And this was going to be a lot of newspapers at the time would have got some information from other newspapers. So Mr. Atkinson, the coroner on Tuesday last, held an inquest on the body of Miss O'Donnell at Mullahoy, and the verdict died from starvation. And that word, as I said, is repeated and repeated, unfortunately, in many of the newspapers. Again, just the location. So this is January of 1847, several inquests. Um, it's in the Tomb Heralds, but it's, it's copied over from the Mayo Constitution. So just by going in and, and putting in those key words, starvation or um, immigration or eviction, that you will get an awful lot of information about what is going on. In January of 1847, another death from starvation. So this is from the Tomb Herald and it says on Thursday last, a poor man named Michael Gormley on his way from Cylon to this town fell dead on the Weir Road within about a mile of the town. So anyone that's joining us or has relations in the Tomb area, Cylon, the Weir Road, you're very familiar with that. It's, it's the road coming into Tomb. And to realize that there in, in January of 1847, January the 14th, the Thursday, um, he is going to be coming into town. And it tells us then in the inquest what has happened. And this is where reading the newspaper articles really bring into force what has been happening in the community, how people are going to interact with the great hunger and in a way how it's going to affect not just the, the families involved but their neighbors around. It talks about an inquest was held by Andrew Hostey and the evidence of Mary Gormley, wife of the deceased. It appeared that they lived in Cylon and had eight children, held two acres and a root of ground from Mr. Donlan. Now Mr. Donlan was O'Connor Donlan that had um, the, the landed estate around Cylon itself. And all produce was consumed more than three months past. Since then, an occasional week's employment, deceased got on the public works was all the means of support they had, except a little relief afforded to them by the Mrs. Donlan of Cylon. So the Mr. Donlan and Mrs. Donlan, obviously the same family. And the Mrs. Donlan gave them money and provision whenever they applied for them, until at last they became ashamed of being so troublesome they were obliged to live upon porridge for the past month. Really insightful and in-depth. And Natalie and Robin were talking before about how it, the, the Balanlas eviction was covered, that people had written down in detail what was going on and then passed that on to Sylvester Redmond and he then coming down findings. So this was one of the first that was truly covered from the people's perspective and, and the people who were involved in it, the people who are dying, the people who are suffering from the great hunger, their voices are now being heard for the first time in a way and through these newspaper accounts and through the newspaper accounts of the local newspapers. And Michael Qualter, another neighbor, deposed to having found the body of Michael Gormley lying across a low wall by the side of the road. So the coroner is interested in knowing who found him. And this can lead to additional information, especially if we in, in the group are doing genealogy. Is this some of our family connections there? And talks about the public works that are being undertaken. But unfortunately, if, if you're really suffering from malnutrition, public works in order to get money to buy more food is, is a little bit of a contradiction in terms. 
What was interesting for me as well is just right across there is notice about the two hounds going to be meeting and where they're going to be going to. The hill of Carraray in Kulu, Gardenfield, Kilcluny, Castleman Garish, and they're going to be going out hunting. So this is the landlord class that are going out hunting. Meanwhile, Michael Gormley is coming in hunting for some food to try and get something for him and his wife and eight children to live on. So there's a huge discrepancy there. And interestingly as well, in that same newspaper, um, there's an account of the Board of Guardians meeting. And the big issue that came up in the Board of Guardians meeting on that day was whether or not a, a woman was going to be, who was dying at the time, whether or not the nuns had come in and tried to get her to change her religion. And the Reverend Mr. Galebright felt necessary. It was a very unpleasant duty, um, but he had to find out if that the Mercy nuns were actually talking to this Mrs. Mitchell, one of the paupers, who was greatly debilitated in mind and body, and that the nuns were trying to get her to change her religion. So quite an amount of time was taken up by the Board of Guardians on that particular issue. And it turned out that actually the nuns themselves, another lady testified that she had come in and she had said she was Catholic, but that then she asked for her religion to be changed for Protestant. And the reason was that she had promised her husband that she would raise the children as Protestant. And she I told the nuns this and the nuns said, well, you know, you've kept, you're going to keep your promise. And that examination of witness, which was brought about by the Board of Guardians, made sure that the nuns were not convicted, quote unquote, convicted of that crime of trying to change the person's religion. But it shows a huge contrast in the time and what was some of the obsessions of some people while all around them, unfortunately, people were dying. The British newspaper archives, so we're going from the Irish news archives that Andrew has to the British news archives. And again, one of the, the neat things about this is that when you're putting in certain words, just going by the date to see what is coming up year by year. So if you look on the left-hand column, you'll see that the word starvation is reported 4,181 times in 1840. 1845, 5,000 times. So not much has changed, 1840 to 1845, and then suddenly 1846, 13,000 times. 1847, Black 47, 18,000 times is gonna be reported on. 1848, 9,000 times, 1849, 11,000 times. And thinking again about that idea of fatigue when it, it's covering you know, the one topic, it's interesting that in 1847, so much coverage was about starvation throughout the country. And that was the year that Trevelyan had said that the famine is over, which unfortunately for the hundreds of thousands who were going to die that year and the next year was certainly not the case. Breaking it down to 1847, the word starvation is reported in the newspapers most commonly in the first three months of the year. And then later on, less so. And by December, it's down to just about one third of what it had been in January. So by looking at newspaper archives and just looking at certain key words, it might be interesting to focus on what was going on. Was it because there was less reporting using that word? Was it because that there was more food coming in or was it because so many people had died of starvation at this stage that the word was kind of like gone from the vocabulary? So we can see here that death from starvation taking place in December of 1847 reported in the Cork Examiner and also in death by starvation again in the May Constitution of February of that year. Just going on to the next slide here, which now has, has stopped, unfortunately, for me. So I'll have to just stop and 
just with the screen share, sometimes it's it's kind of a bit awkward. So I'm gonna just get out of this for a second. So apologies about that. And just to share the screen another time. So my IT is kind of like letting me down a small bit. So apologies about that. So we were looking at the British newspaper archives there and the particular dates and the results for, for starvation. And I also looked at the word eviction. And again, looking at 1847. So while starvation, January, February, March was quite high, eviction was relatively low when you compare it towards the end of the year. So by September, October, November, December, especially in October, the 1st of October is the Gale Day and when rents were due and suddenly you have a huge explosion in the number of evictions that's going to be reported and evictions all over so i want to just narrow that down and again by just going and focusing in the different newspapers so going to galway newspapers is carried by the british archives you'll see the galway vindicator of 1847 has given a report about and, and these are, are more as well, some of them is going to be editorials rather than actual evictions themselves. They're going to be generalized about the number of evictions that happen in a place. So the word itself might cover five or six in the previous week rather than just a singular event. The Tomb Herald um, from the British Library um, reports on the number of parishioners that have died. So. In, in November of 1847, the Archbishop of Tume asked for his parish priest to write in a report on what was going on in their parish. And quite a number of them then were printed in the Tume Herald. And this resonates with me personally because my grandmother's family, the Reynoldses, would have been living just in the shadow of the church. The church had been built just a few years beforehand by the Kelly family who had bought the Newtown estate. And these Kellys had got a lot of money from their plantations in Jamaica. Um, they had been exiled after 1691. They had gone to the court of Austria and had made their money. But because they were Catholic, they couldn't make their money in Ireland. And so they, they found money to invest in Jamaica and sadly in the slave trade. So in terms of Richard Dowling, who had fought to, to keep slaves, unfortunately, there's a sinister aspect of, of that story as well. And they built this church then in the late 1830s. And the parish priest there, he talked about 400 of his parishioners had died, mostly a tire of them from fever and insufficiency of food. He talks that no more than 50 families will have a sufficiency of provisions up to paying rents and every other liable rate to last them until the ensuing harvest. And if you get a chance to visit Abbey Knock Moy today, just here in the foyer, the community put up the list that the priest had recorded in 1848 and 1849 of several hundred of the parishioners who had died, including a James Reynolds, who most likely was going to be my grandmother's granduncle, who had died during that time. So looking at the newspaper archives is a great way to blend in and to find some of the stories that will help us to understand some of the suffering that our own ancestors had gone through. The Chronicling America um, website that um, it, it's, it's basically free American newspapers. And when I put in the word famine in 1847 to 48, I got 1,691 results. And it's, it's highlighted in red, as you can see there, whenever the word famine is mentioned. And so going into those newspapers, which are free, the other ones, the Irish News Archives and the British newspapers, um, they're, they're paid sites, but this one is free. I found an interesting uh, story from Washington, D.C. in February of 1847. Churchill alluded there to the fact that, you know, the welcome wasn't there at, at times. And in fact, like the, the Know Nothing Party, which had emerged um, back when Irish immigrants and Catholics were coming in first, um, the, the Know Nothing Party was set up and eventually it coalesced 
into the, the Southern Democrats, which then in the 1960s became Republican in, in the South. Um, they had tried to keep as many immigrants out as possible. But in this case here, the Daily Union in February of 1847 um, talked about sympathy of the nations of the whole Christian world to the calamity that was happening in Ireland. And it says that in a way, America should come to the rescue. We owe her much, that is Ireland. Her strong arms, now paralyzed and broken, has helped to build up our strength and advance our national growth, culture and comfort. She is a part of our fatherland and they are our brethren that cry to us for help. So it's, it's a huge clarion call. And we do know that many, many people in America right across. And one of the, the stories that resonates so well is the story of the Choctaw people who had been dispossessed of their own lands and made to walk hundreds of miles to very poor land by sadly uh, President Jackson who had Irish ancestry himself um, up in, in Ulster, Scots ancestry. So here is a, an address from a meeting in the city of Washington for the relief of Ireland. So it's February of 1847. People know that things are going very bad. So reporting Black 47, the newspapers, whether it's in Ireland itself, whether it's in Britain, whether it's in America, we can find all over the world. And of course, they're in Hobart in Tasmania through the Trove, the fantastic Australian newspaper site. Um, it talks about the famine. In this case, I found this one very interesting. It was in February 1847. So while in Washington, they're talking about, we, we need to come to the rescue of these people. In Hobart, it was talking about that a new area will be opened in the moral and political history of that rich but distracted country. And the day of our destitution and deepest distress become the day of our social regeneration. And it kind of like, in a way, is, is kind of a bit modern, um, talking about these kind of like woke people that are saying, oh, we should be sending money to Ireland and, and doing that. And it says that it's the remittance of money was premature and the measure itself is too late. And it, it's kind of being a very optimistic, kind of like saying, well, you know, it's living in with, um, you know, the greatest empire the world has made and, and therefore it will be fine and sound. So that is one Australian newspaper in 1847, but others carry a far different story. And that story is coming from different newspapers in England, for instance, the tablet, and also in Ireland where they're copying over some information. And this is where I got my title for, for this short talk, the bread our work. So the Mayo constitution that was um, copied in the colonial times in Hobart. And it says, this is in June now of 1847, a short time away. And it says a large meeting of the laboring classes took place. And the interesting thing is that Mr. Finn addressed the meeting in Irish and was loudly cheered throughout his speech. The person who was reporting on it obviously didn't speak any Irish, so therefore didn't know what they were saying. And then Mr. Lynch got on so he is John Finn and John Lynch, Esquires, Justice of the Peace. So they're local landlords. And he got on and he talked about the relief that was going to be coming. And basically, they talked about dispersing them. And, you know, there was cries from parts of the, there were loud and piteous cries, it says, from parts of the meeting, I am starving. I have a wife and six children and declared before the Lord, I have not a meal of victuals, nor the price of one. We'll only get sixpence a day on the public works and how will that support us? An oatmeal, one pound, a hundred weight. And it says the meeting then separated quietly, but in a short time again assembled. So there's several thousand walked through the town bearing a banner on which was inscribed, bread or work. After which the multitude dispersed peacefully. So this is one of the, the aspects of the great hunger. How did people respond to it when they saw so much starvation around? We know that the British garrisons were heavily armed at that time. We know that food stores um, sometimes were raided. People were caught and arrested for doing that. People were sent to prison for doing that. And sometimes it was deliberately. But the newspapers themselves don't carry too many stories like this in talking about huge protests. So it'd be interesting to delve into it more and see 
what was going on there. One of the, the great collections and the iconic collections is, is from the Illustrated London News and Clare Library has a wonderful selection about the Clare, the um, Clare News from the Illustrated London News. And one of the striking things about that is this newspaper in December of 1849. So quite an amount of horror had happened already and it's getting towards the end of it. But what the newspaper reported then was quite insightful. And it talked about Stern in terms of the progress against slavery, it took a single victim to make mankind sensible of the, the horrors of slavery. That's that infamous, am I not your brother um, cartoon and, and statue and took a single case of flogging women, did more to rouse the people again against the inquisitive state councils of the West Indies. And they're saying that we're trying to do the same by the sketches of what's going on. And this sketch here of a skull peen of just, you know, thrown together where people are trying to live. And this, this is what the people in County Clare in 1849 are experiencing. And the newspaper is trying to help them to understand that. So in terms of reporting Black 47, the newspaper archives are a tremendous resource. There are other resources there as well. I'll just finish up on a few of them. Um, the Illustrated London News I spoke about before also has other interesting things, including the, the census details of 1841 and 1851. And it also talks about elections that were going on. It doesn't have too much, but this caught my eye because it talked about the Solicitor General, Mr. Monaghan. So this is in February of 1847. So he is the government candidate and he has got into parliament against the repealers. Mr. O'Flaherty had been there and he got into power into being an MP by four votes. So how did a government party get into power in February of 1847? Obviously the electorate was limited. Um, those who are freeholders of 40 shillings and more and a person wrote about that, John Mitchell, the famous John Mitchell in his, in his book, The Last Conquest of Ireland, perhaps. He spoke about that election and how important it was to try and get an anti-government candidate in and how that the huge money that was there for bribery uh, was meant that the government got them in. But he went down to Galway at this time and he traveled and he says in the depth of winter to the very center of that fertile island, so Scythe will never visit, wholly leave our eyes, cowering wretches, almost naked in the savage weather, prowling in turnip fields and endeavoring to grub up roots which have been left, but running to hide as the mail coach rolled by. So this is available in Library Ireland and it's a fascinating account. And more of those are available, including um, Natalie and Robbins um, mentioned um, Sylvester Redmond's um, accounts. Those are now available in archive.org. And we have in the East Galway group linked those and, and the PDF to those. So if anybody is interested in that, it's, it's a wonderful insight and it gives a blow by blow account of individual stories as Robin and Natalie said um, earlier this morning. So that is a, a good insight there. Also in Library Ireland, Anisette Nicholson has got two books, Ireland's Welcome to the Stranger, which are free to view. And these are just before the Great Hunger and just after and during the Great Hunger. And it's a wonderful insight. It's not a report in a way, but it's a person who is an insightful person, a suffragette, a campaigner, a person who is, is looking after the impoverished, and she comes to Ireland just to see what the condition of the country is like. So her reporting on it is well worth a look. And again, it's available on Library Ireland for free, but it's also a great book to go and buy for yourself. And finally, uh, Sidney Godolphin Osborne came to Ireland in 1849, and his gleanings in the west of Ireland give great insight, and especially into areas in Galway. Again, it's on the Internet Archive, and it's, again, it's a wonderful example of an insightful person who is observing and a keen observer of what's going on. 
So it's something to do in terms of reporting Black 47. Bread our work. Those were the two things that sustained so many people. But sadly, during Black 47, it was both one of them in terms of work, not good for the people who were starving, and bread was in short supply. So have a look at the newspaper archives. And again, Andrew Martin's Irish News Archives, it's very good, quite a lot of, of newspaper, local newspapers there, the British Archives, and also the free ones in Trove. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope that was of some help to people. And I'm hoping that Jarlett is there as we are. And if Turtle, Turtle has left his screen on sharing, if he is able to hear me at this stage, I know he popped out. So Jarlett, if you could just um, reveal yourself there, so that would be good. And where are you at the moment? So thank you, Anne-Marie, I see there to, um, to return to the archives and, and that is so, so good to have that. So I'm just waiting here for Charlotte McNamara. So Charlotte, can you just unmute yourself? And if you say something, I can hear you then. So Charlotte, if you unmute yourself, I think you're there, I can see you now. So Charles, if you go down to the bottom left of your screen, bottom left of your screen and just hit unmute. You're still on mute, unfortunately, Charles. So just to give you a prompt there to ask to unmute. Mute. Okay, there lovely. There you go, Charles. Fantastic. Good Can luck. you hear me, Martin? I can hear you now. Okay. And I'm going to put you in because I didn't have you before. I'm going to put you in as co-host. And then you okay. should now be able to <laughs> see the share screen. And you've started share screen. Charlotte, thank you very yeah, much for you... joining us today. And a, just a quick introduction. Charlotte has done phenomenal work on bringing the story of Patrick S. Gilmer back to life. So I'm really looking forward to this presentation, Charlotte. And I'm looking behind you in your library, in your place of work, and seeing so many fantastic things. So. Look forward to that. So over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Martin. And hello to everyone from all parts of the world. And the funny thing about this, listening to all the lectures, um, starting with the, uh, the, the, the people who talked about Bell and Lass, um, it, it's very, it's amazing. The first piece of Irish music that was published both in America and in, um, Australia and still sits in the uh, University of uh, Melbourne was published by P.S. Gilmore. It was called Sad News from Home. And then I saw, uh, of course, Turtle Bunbury. And in 2013 and 14, I spoke at the uh, at the um, History Festival of Ireland and, and Turtle actually chaired my talk. Um, and he's been a wonderful mentor as well and friend for the project and um, so on. So this story basically, first of all, very quickly starts with me as a nine-year-old, gives you my age now, in 1969, a plaque was unveiled in Ballygar, which is in North Galway. And uh, none of us in Ballygar knew what the plaque was about. The local teachers had never even told us about this man, Gilmore, but it had some lovely thoughts about Gilmore on it. And, uh, um, a, a gentleman from Ballygar, now living in Boston, Michael Cummins, had done a lot of work on it, and he had decided to get a plaque unveiled to this guy. Fast forward on uh, to um, 2007. I'm teaching music in Leakslip in County Kildare, and a student come, came to me and asked me, would I mind teaching a piece of music? called When Johnny Comes Marching Home. I said, of course, I'd love to. But I said, you know that fellow who composed that. He was born in Ballygar, but I really know very little about him. And I thought in my own wisdom or stupidity that I'd go on the internet at that stage and get uh, some information and lo and behold, uh, be able to do the job. I didn't realize 
nothing as such had been written about Gilmore at that stage at all. And just to give you an idea, there's here's a wonderful source of information on Irish America published by NYU and it's 700 and something pages and there is no mention of Gilmore. So it gives you an idea of how much work was done on this. And in fact, by the time I started doing it, Gilmore was almost dead and buried. Well, he was dead, but almost buried completely. So I've entitled this Patrick S. Gilmore, 1829-1892, the Amer America's first superstar. And so let me see now, uh, yes. Uh, Patrick Gilmore, it, was born in Ballygar, and uh, lo and behold, he um, uh, grew up in a tough Ballygar. He was educated in Trihill School out just outside Ballygar. We had a landlord who, by the way, was a great friend of Mrs. Gerard. Uh, his name was Dennis H. Kelly, and uh, he didn't exactly uh, give any favours to the five and a half thousand tenants on his um, uh, estate either. In 1843, um, there was a protest march, one of the great monster meetings of Daniel O'Connell held in Summerhill College in Athlone. And Gilmore later on writes about uh, the protest march where he participated as a member of the Fife and Drum Band. And um, they march 19 miles to Summerhill College. They hear Daniel O'Connell speaking and so on. Later that year, um, uh, Gilmore and his brother and his father, along with 1,000 men in, on the Kelly estate were uh, imprisoned outside Ballygar in Castle Kelly when O'Connell decided to hold a non-scheduled meeting in Roscommon Town, uh, which passed off without any difficulties to over 100,000 people. That was reported in the Freeman's Journal. And by the way, in regards, Martin, your previous talk, you are so right. The details that are in our local newspapers are invaluable. And that was where I actually found the reports of that event in 1843. Later, a month or so later, Patrick Gilmore, the father of Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore, or as he was known then, Patrick Stephen Gilmore, decided to get uh, his little son out of Ballygar and he sent him to Adlone to learn a trade away from the influence of either Kelly or uh, Ballygar because there was a lot of upset. And to at loan he went, and again, 19 miles away. And for the next six years, he would learn his trade in a, uh, in a pub uh, there called Fallon's Double X. But his first love was always music. And uh, if you go to at loan today, um, you will see the site of Fallon's pub. And you can imagine bands, uh, at Lone was a major training center for not only bands that, sorry, not only regiments that came to Ireland from, the, uh, from, from England to train on how to control the, um, the locals, but also as a result of that training to send them to the colonies, whether it was in India or the Caribbean or wherever. Uh, it was a great training ground was Ireland at that stage. However, Gilmore anyway started learning how to play the cornet. Uh, the cornet, just for those of you that may not know, if you if you we we'll go backwards from the trumpet, the tr before the trumpet there was the cornet, and before the uh, the cornet there was the famous bugle that one sees in regimental uh, 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 bands. Uh, calling out signals, uh, you know, to 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 uh, attack or whatever it is. So Gilmore was at the um, cutting edge of musical technology, learning the cornet. And here I have a picture up on this slide of the bridge in Athlone, and himself and his very good friend Patsy Glavy used to stand on the walls of both uh, sides of the bridge, and. Bear in mind, no cars in 1840s 
Uh, and we're talking about the famine. And in, in, what have we got in that loan? We've got four regimental bands and regiments at that time, but we've also got granaries full of food for those regiments. And people would come to Adlone hoping that they would find anything that would quell their hunger. And the two lads would play duets back and forth to each other and give the starving a momentary respite from the hunger and the awfulness of their lives. On the right hand side, I, this is a newspaper I found, uh, I think it was about 1886 from New York and it shows young Gilmore teaching the two children of Mr. Fallon, the pub owner, and he's now teaching them, which was a lovely little uh, memory. He's introduced to a man called Patrick Keating. Now, again, this exemplifies a part, if you don't mind me just pointing out that we haven't heard as such about the famine all that much. It's the injustice against the Catholic in Ireland at that time. Patrick Keating was a member of a, a very large military family. They had fought in the Napoleon uh, Wars and in what we now know as the Peninsular Wars in um, Portugal. Um, a fantastically gifted uh, man. He was so gifted as a bandmaster that the British uh, officers that came to um, the garrison in Athlone basically created a kitty and sent Patrick Keating to the Royal School of, of uh, um, Naples, I believe, and there for two years, he learned notation um, and various aspects of composition and, and so on there. And when he had learned all of the skills that were there to be found, he came back to Athlone. And of course, who does he start teaching? Only people like Gilmore and Glavy and so on and so forth. But Keating also exemplified the problem of a Catholic. He was very talented, we know that. He was very uh, um, innovative and so on and so forth. He wrote pieces of music for Napoleon of France. He, he uh, um, indeed um, received a letter of thanks and a medal from Napoleon. He received a, um, a, a letter from the Pope at the time, the King of Denmark at the time. And he was looking for what we all maybe look for some uh, identification for a, a wonderful talent and so on and so forth. But in this obituary, it mentions the incorrect uh, spelling of Mr. F. Gilmore. It mentions that he had taught Gilmore, the projector, arranger, and conductor of the musical uh, festival in Boston. And this would become his um, uh, calling card, I suppose, for the rest of his life, oh yes, if you even mention it today in that loan, they will know that he was taught, that he taught Gilmore. Um, Keating also did one other thing. He brought all of his young uh, students to Dublin because a, a wonderful musician was coming over from France. He was a little bit of a, a hothead and all the rest of it. Monsieur uh, Antoine Julien, um, uh, Julien. And Julian would play in the Rotunda in Dublin and so on and so forth. And he was wonderfully innovative. And he, he was brilliant about his music. He played all over England, et cetera, et cetera. He had only one problem. He never paid any bills. So the debtors were always following him. And eventually he would go to America as well to get a little bit of rest. But Julian was also a major influence on Gilmore. Here is a band that uh, Gilmore would have not formed this band, but previous to this, uh, the, the, the Atlow National Band. Uh, Dublin Castle realized from the O'Connell meetings and so on that music was a great glue to bring people together, to make them temporarily forget their bellies, uh, to forget their their awfulness, uh, their, the, the landlords, et cetera, et cetera, and to enjoy a momentary respite. And 
Uh, but so what Dublin Castle did was they banned basically the, the public performance music. And the only exception of that were temperance bands and bands that played in churches. And uh, what Gilmore did uh, was he, he basically uh, reformed the band and he brought it into St. John's Church, which is now the famous Dean Crow Hall. And for mass, there would be a 30 piece band in there playing uh, for the uh, choir, etc. By the way, that Dean Crow Hall is the place that the future tenor of all tenors um, uh, John McCormack would learn his music from a man called Michael Kilkelly, who in turn was a great friend of Patrick Keating. And we can't forget, again, to put this in context, Athlone and Ireland and rebellion. And we're now coming to 1848. And about this time, there's about, as I said, four regiments in the, in the town and so on. And uh, both and uh, Glavi were involved in subversion. In fact, later on, Glavi was arrested as one of the Fenians and imprisoned in Kilmainham. Um, sadly, Keating, uh, as I note here, Keating's talent wasn't enough to be even remembered uh, in records still sit to this day in Neller Hall in the UK, the, the home of British Army records. And sadly, um, uh, they don't exist at all anymore. 1848, about 25 miles away from Athlone, is a little town in Tipperary called Ballingarry. Ballingarry was where we had, uh, and let's call it fairly an uprising, a failure, but it was also a success. It was a failure as an uprising. It did not achieve its aims, which were where uh, people were getting a little bit fed up with poor Daniel O'Connell and his um, peaceful message. He didn't want to leave uh, the, the um, uh, crown. He didn't want to leave the empire. He just wanted the empire to give Ireland the right to uh, create its own laws, create, uh, collect its own taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, as I call them, the young lads of the young Irelanders including people like uh, Smith of, William Smith O'Brien and the very, very famous Thomas Francis Marr, the future civil uh, war hero. Um, these men all clubbed together and they basically attacked a home uh, in Ballingarry and were defeated, arrested, and found guilty of treason and so on and so forth. But this sent a message that we had the right to fight and we would fight and we, we, we would be right. And I can even see it with Gilmore's future life, how he would never ever lose the ambition he states at one stage that his ultimate ambition was to lead his band into the House of Parliament at College Green. Of course, the College Green, uh, Grattan uh, uh, Parliament uh, didn't exist again, but this was the type of thought that was put into these uh, lads' minds. Anyway, 1848 happens. It's time to get out of town. For those of you are interested in this story it's a now on p uh, it's the ps gilmore story on youtube so when you get a chance go in there and click uh, uh, on this and it's done in episodes obviously and it's uh, telling the story of the american dream and why this man was such a superstar and it's actually also an alternative history of america between 1849 and 1860 uh, Gilmore is now in Boston. He's gone to Boston. He's now staying in a place called Charlestown with his brother, who also had left uh, Ireland. And um, he has 
uh, acquired the wonderful um, virtuosity of uh, um, a highly trained cornet player. But not only that, but he has Keating's um, get up and go, get up and, uh, and, and lead ability. And he assumes the baton of the Charlestown, the Boston, the Salem brass bands. And suddenly this, and I'm not exaggerating when I, when I say this, between 1849 as an example and 1857, he gets so popular that he is sent an official invitation to lead the band at the presidential inauguration of John Buchanan in Washington. It's a wonderful um, uh, honor. Um, but remember, he is also, Turtle mentioned about this, uh, about the, the anti-Irish sentiment that was uh, fairly strong all across America. He had to run the gauntlet of the threats of the Know Nothing Party and the ire of a, of a group called the Boston Brahms. And they were very nervous. And in fairness to them, you can't blame them. There was about 30,000 Irish coming to Boston each year. They weren't all staying in Boston, but nonetheless, they weren't to know that. And so uh, they started... You know, it's fine if the Irish uh, keep their heads down and don't create a stir. But now we've got a, an Irish guy called Gilmore who's wanted for every party, every event, every political party, every meeting. Because before you have a meeting, before you have anything, any get together to attract a crowd, one must have the uh, the band. Um, and so... Basically, that's uh, very key in Gilmore's development. And at the very end there, I, I make note, like uh, you two did for Obama's um, um, inaugura not inauguration selection, I believe, Gilmore was asked in 1860 to bring his band down to North Carolina. And lo and behold, it's the Democratic National Convention. The first item on the agenda is to discuss the attitude of the Democratic Party to slavery. The Northern Democrats absolutely are adamant they want it off. The Southern uh, wanted to be left uh, where it is and they walk out. And what happens as a result? There's the first shouts of war. The Northern Democrats shout at Gilmore, war, war, war. And then they demand La Marseillaise. Gilmore didn't flinch. He played Yankee Doodle, Star Spangled Banner, and Hail Columbia over and over until the last delegate left. And that was, by the way, almost a year before Fort Sumter was hit with the first um, uh, shots. And so the American Civil War started. Turtle mentioned this earlier, and Gilmore uh, doesn't hesitate. He's going down, like, as uh, again, as Turtle said, 24 sorry, uh, 200,000 Irish um, enrolled, uh, of which about 20,000 enrolled in the Confederate side as well. That should always be noted, but they were all looking for their own um, input. And in Gilmore's case, he joined up with the 24th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, and he fought in Roanoke and New Bern and various other places before the administration decided we have to get rid of these bands because they're costing four million a year. Um, Gilmore could have left. He could have gone and had, had a, a very early retirement or a very, very good income and forget about the hassles of the war. But that would not be for Gilmore. He was asked by Governor Andrews, a staunch anti-slavery abolitionist, uh, to reorganize the bands of Massachusetts. And what that meant was in, in uh, um, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, they were attempting to uh, basically uh, create bands that would be fighting for the union of black uh, regiments very unpopular at the time. So that's why he used the code of 
uh, basically reorganized the bands of Massachusetts. You can see that film and just think of it, it an Irishman, a Galway man, and a Balagar man uh, trained that band and quite a few others. After he had trained uh, a number of those bands and, and sent them on their way into the Union uh, War, he was, he was uh, asked by the government, government of Louisiana, or the Department of the Gulf, as it was called then, uh, to reorganize their bands as well. So he, off he goes with two regiments, a regiment and their bands to uh, New Orleans. And there in New Orleans, the first thing he does is he composes when Johnny comes marching home again. And he all of us said that he didn't compose the music. Now, I believe uh, this music is actually for bales, for bales, because the, 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 the tempo, the, the um, attitude of the music, etc., fits in exactly with Johnny Comes Marching Home. Um, another song is mentioned that uh, and has, has been linked. Um, Johnny, I hardly knew you. Different song, different uh, sentiment, uh, different beat. Um, so I don't believe they're linked at all. But when Johnny Comes Marching Home is by far the most uh, popular and powerful song from the Civil War, and it lasts through every one of the wars to this day. And it's unusual because it does not mention, mention cause or result, uh, victor or vanquished. It just emphasizes the little fact that we all believe We'd love to see our boys and girls nowadays coming home from all wars. So later on in 1864, uh, they had just elected a new um, mayor in uh, Louisiana, a, a union mayor, and to basically use propaganda and the music of propaganda, Gilmore was asked to organize a celebration. The local or the, the national paper, the um, Harper's Weekly, called it a Gilmorean concert. In other words, a concert of bigger status and bigger quality and so on and so forth than anything ever seen before. In fact, this would be the biggest concert in the world at this stage. And he did it with 500 musicians, 1,000 choir, 50 cannons, and all the church bells of New Orleans and 35,000 attended. Imagine the message that would have sent to General Lee and his colleagues. After the concert was held, the gov new governor, General Michael Hahn, he sent a letter uh, to, you can see at the top, I've edited this, uh, to the president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. And he basically uh, tells how great a job uh, this Gilmore man did. Now, Lincoln knew Gilmore at this stage very, very well. But this was officially the thank you. And this, by the way, this letter comes from the Carter's Jenkins collection. Sorry. Apologies there. OK. And in 1864, for that concert, you see on the left hand side, the um, ferrotype medal on the left, which basically identifies um, Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore. Um, and, and of course, now we note that it's spelt with two L's, which was seems to be fairly standard around New Orleans. And I don't actually know why. Later, a, a, less than a year later, it would be copied by the Lincoln administration. And this medal, actually sold for 35,000, uh, uh, well, about two years ago, um, and it's uh, obviously well-worn. E pluribus unum, uh, out of many, one is on both medals. The next huge concert uh, was 1865, the end of the war. Basically, there, for two days, they were going to march up and down Pennsylvania Avenue with uh, um, poor, uh, President Lincoln had just died, so we had 
President Johnson now in the um, hot seat, as well as General Grant. And of course, the stars of the show were General Meade, General Sherman, and uh, of course, George Custer. Um, an estimated 1 million um, march down Penn Avenue and Gilmore was the leading band of the seven that entertained. Gilmore for the next few years was very much key in, for instance, when Johnson went around the country, our, our grant or whatever, uh, Gilmore knew all of these men uh, very, very well. And he would go with them because, as I said previously, you're holding a meeting, you're holding an event. What's the first thing you need to do to attract people? You need to have good music, as Daniel O'Connell had done many years before in Ireland. And so Gilmore is doing all of this, but he's thinking, how can he actually help this story? And he comes up with an idea that there will be an event in, the, in Boston called the National Peace Jubilee. And um, uh, he basically, it would, be the, it would be bigger than the last Gilmorean event. Um, people thought, is he insane? Is he mad? Has he lost the run of himself? Who will pay for it all? How big will it be? Where will the building go? Surely not on our Boston Common. The Boston Brams were having an upset tummy. So this is how it was greeted. And Gilmore, again, was center of attention. And this became the second Gilmorean event. And here on the right, we see the Boston Coliseum. It was 500 feet long, 300 feet wide, 120 feet high. I think if you do your, oh, uh, if you do your maths, you uh, find that, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, something is happening here for one second. All right, one second. Yeah, it's okay again. Um, there was going to be 1,000 of an orchestra, 10,000 of a choir, an audience of 50,000. But biggest of all, this was going to go on for five days. It brought an extra 470,000 to Boston. And it was going to celebrate, let us have peace. General Grant had just been recently elected the uh, new president of the United States, highly popular, but that was his motto for his uh, election. Here's tickets and program my collection. Uh, um, and uh, it, it was an absolute success. And just to give you all some idea of how people came from all over the continent of America, from Canada, from Montreal, from Toronto, from everywhere. Even from the south, the southern newspapers were, um, what's the lovely old phrase, waxing lyrically about how fantastic Gilmore was. Um, on the 29th, they held a grand testimonial for P.S. Gilmore. Again, he had worked for years and his income was basically when it was available. It wasn't consistent or anything else, but nothing was ever done for the sake of money. It was always done for his new home or for Ireland or for his own family. Again, uh, a reminder to everyone about the um, uh, P.S. Gilmore story. All right. So three years later, a big event has just finished in Europe. It's called the Franco-Prussian War. I gave a talk there the other day to West German television, and I brought this up uh, because this was the first world war that the world ever experienced. And we always remember our Irish people were emigrating uh, some people, uh, Professor Morn talks about 2 million people during the famine emigrating to America. There were huge numbers going from Germany and uh, huge numbers of musicians, et cetera, et cetera. And so Gilmore knew about this event. 
He knew it very well. He had contacts all over Europe because he was collecting music, etc. So when the Franco-Prussian War ended, he decided he would like to celebrate the end of the war in Europe. But the second reason it's down there as well was to measure where America was in terms of talent and performance versus the Europeans. And to do that, he would invite the English, uh, the Royal Grenadier Guards, the, the French, the Band uh, Republican de France, um, the uh, Prussian Guards of the um, Kaiser, uh, the uh, Band of the Guides of Belgium, and of course, the fantastic Johann Strauss, um, uh, the, uh, the Waltz King. And he'd, these bands would all play, if you like, against uh, the American bands, the best that America could, could offer. And now Gilmore could assess what needed to be improved. How could, therefore, Gilmore elevate America? And that's where we're heading now. Again, these are pictures of the actual event from inside. Uh, on the right, the cannons on the right, they were used to keep time to music. Uh, on the top right hand side, we have uh, the, uh, in, uh, the uh, 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 bands uh, rehearsing. And on the left, I would safely say that these workmen who were building the Colosseum at the time are Irish because 800 Irish worked on the building of the World Peace Jubilee. And I mentioned Johann Strauss. Strauss came and um, he composed a piece of music called the Jubilee Waltz, dedicated to P.S. Gilmore, and it was played for Gilmore uh, at the World Peace Jubilee. There's uh, Strauss himself, and uh, this is one of the concerts, which, by the way, was co-conducted by Gilmore and Strauss. Sorry. And I have to emphasize this. Again, Gilmore never forgot the Irish during his um, promotion of, of, of where we were in Ireland. We were still a mere province, if one exaggerates the priority that the English government gave to Ireland. We were a province only. But in Gilmore's mind, we were a country. And so, for instance, in the actual uh, World Peace Jubilee, we had our own Irish day. Gilmore, during his career, would always remember chiefly three com composers, which we sometimes forget. We had three wonderful composers, Thomas Moore, William Vincent Wallace, and, and um, um, Michael William Balfe. They were highly sought after and highly popular, for instance, in London and in Paris, and they were played throughout um, the uh, uh, Gilmore's career. After the World Peace Jubilee, he realized America is way behind what the Europeans can offer, and he decided to move from Boston and down to New York he went. And the, one of the first things he did was, and you can see it here on this building here. He started a, a, a huge um, center of entertainment, which was called Gilmore's Concert Garden. And this place would allow the people living in New York at the time when it's snowing outside or it's raining or whatever, to go in there with your wife and have a cup of coffee or a, a light meal or a wine and listen to the dulcet sounds of Gilmore's band or whoever else would play. Gilmore's Concert Garden, 1875. Sorry. And all whilst this is happening, Gilmore is a little bit like a, 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 a 19th century version of uh, Jürgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager. He is hiring and firing. He is re-equipping. He is yeah, getting a, a larger library of music together. He is developing a band of incredible um, talent and ability. And for instance, here's a very good example of it. One of this band was a man 
hired about this time. His name was Jakob Rupp. He was German, as most of his of, of Gilmore's band were. And Jakob, for the next 20 something years, would play with Gilmore. And here is his travel chest, which still exists. And on the side is his name, Rupp. And later in 1878, they would go on a tour of Europe 144 years ago. Sorry. I apologize, why is this jumping now? Sorry. Charlotte, possibly if you go down to the bottom right and just use the, to the left there, and then you can click on that one. What, to, what to do I do, Martin, sorry? Just bring your mouse down to the bottom right, um, just where you see the, this little icon there, and it just to the left of that, Charlotte, to the left, and that yeah. one there, click on that. Okay. And then the full okay. picture will pop up. That might make All right, that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So basically, uh, I just uh, go forward here to the, this. So um, Gilmore's Concert Garden became Madison Square Garden. You can see how similar this is to the previous. So they, they basically, Gilmore was delighted because he did not want to continue um, uh, managing um, a place in New York. And he went on his tour of Europe. And here we've got some ideas of, of how this Irishman, I call him America's first superstar. And I hope people don't think I've been big headed when I say this, but I'm now starting to show you reasons for this. When he came to Ireland, we had uh, the great, uh, for instance, advertisements for his concerts in Dublin. Six concerts, a, a, <clears throat> he appeared to over 25,000 people in Dublin in today's National Concert Hall. On the right-hand side, we see the wonderful St. George's Hall in across from Lime Street Station in, in Liverpool. That uh, hall was given freely by the Earl of Derby in, New, uh, in Liverpool. And he toured up and down um, Britain. And Apologies, this was- Apologies, Charlotte. Apologies. Sorry. Just that the slide is not showing up there. So if you just, oh. what, what we're seeing is, is that slide would let us have peace. And if you could just forward the slide okay. up. Sorry, what, Sorry what, about what should that. I do? Apologies. So, sorry, what should I do? Um, just to make it into, Bring your, your mouse down. Click on the picture that you're talking My mouse about. doesn't show anymore since I clicked that other thing. Uh, I apologize. No worries. You know what? That that happened to me as well, Charlotte. If you just stop sharing, now we're down to that. If you stop right, can sharing- Can you see that? Yes, it's Madison Square Garden. That's perfect. Okay, so we got, right. And we've got the chest, yes? Um, that- How have we got Lime Street? Have we got St. George's Hall? It's a slight delay there for me. St. George's Hall, yes, I can see that now. Okay. So Sorry Charlotte, about this, folks. I yeah, apologize. No Charlotte, if you just bring your mouse down and just to that icon to your right, the, the, there, that one there, click on that, and it should open up the whole slideshow. It's, it doesn't seem to be opening up, though. Okay, so we, I, I, I won't do that then. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thanks, okay. Charlotte. Sorry so, for interrupting. Sorry, can we see St. George's Hall there? Yes, there's a picture of 1878 Gilmer's Band European Tour at St. Lovely, George's that's Hall fine. on the right. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're now on a tour of Europe. So basically, Gilmore is bringing a, a band of 65 players. He's known across Europe at this stage as an Irishman. He's known in Ireland as an Irishman who left during the famine. So now suddenly people say to themselves, you know, here is the first of ours that left a number of years ago, returning home as a success. And this is very, this is amazing. 
down underneath the advertisement for the railway is the uh, uh, theater called the Trocadero in Paris, where he won the medal for the greatest band there. And on the right is a, um, a basically a, a, a correspondent from Berlin talked about Gilmore's band being the greatest band in Europe. Uh, Madison Square Gardens was developed and when he arrived back in America, um, when he arrived back in America, he uh, had, of course, to take care of some very important things, including 1878, the uh, opening of St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, in um, New York. Um, there was no furniture, there was no pews in St. Patrick's Cathedral, and there was a fair held. And Gilmore's band, fresh off the boat, uh, played to the right of the main altar up there to raise money for the, for the, for the cathedral. Now, um, 18, and it, it was unusual that one door would close and then another two wouldn't open, but this is a, a case in point. For those of you that know Coney Island today, Beside Coney Island is a place called Manhattan Beach. And in Manhattan Beach, hotels developed. And for two months at a time, for the next almost 14, 13 or 14 years, Gilmore's band would appear there for three concerts every day. For crowds, if the weather was very bad, as low as 4,000. And if the weather was very good, as high as 70 thousand people per day were at his concerts. Sorry, how is this? Right. And uh, here is some pictures from uh, Manhattan Beach itself um, and uh, the, the type of concert programs. And you see Gilmore is well publicized there. Um, in the fireworks, I was recently to Rome and to Pompeii, and it was it was amazing me how similar uh, the Pompeii um, event was to what must have appeared to Gilmore here. Um, on the right hand side is um, a, a coloured in photograph of um, a fireworks display that was held every night in Manhattan Beach, where fireworks were used to display basically Pompeii had been buried by Mount Vesuvius behind. And over on the right hand side, you see a light in the foreground and there amongst the light are the instruments and Gilmore would compose the uh, atmospheric music that one would hear if you remember um, silent movies, that type of music for the event. In 1886, Gilmore opened the Statue of Liberty and <laughs> Gilmore had had a, a, a love affair, if you like, with the statue to some degree, because at the, let's start at the bottom here. At the very bottom, we see the hand of the statue. And that was, first of all, shown in America in Philadelphia at the Centennial Celebrations, where Gilmore was the musical director. Then up here is the, the head of Lady Liberty that was shown in the Trocadero when Gilmore played inside and uh, they had just built this. And over here on the right was a documentary that I made with RT and uh, um, this is the curator. This gentleman is the curator, Barry Moreno, and he showed us this uh, picture that was done for um, uh, remembrance of the actual event. There was two Irishmen, incidentally, on that podium that day. Uh, uh, William Russell Grace from Cove, who was the mayor of uh, New York, and P.S. Gilmore. Sorry, why is this? Sorry. So, Gilmore, for the next number of years, he does nothing other than touring and developing bands and developing instrumentation. For instance, everyone here, uh, a number of years ago, you will have remembered that uh, Bill Clinton uh, prided himself on his wonderful um, performance of saxophone. Well, it was Gilmore 
who promoted not only saxophone in uh, performance in America, but across Europe on the 1878 tour. He was also the first to have 10 saxophones in his band. Um, there was everything about Gilmore was he, he was so innovative, but so, so proud to be Irish. He was a, he was a poster from the, from the time, Gilmore's the, uh, 100. This was when he expanded the band to the greatest band in the world. And in 1886, he held a series of concerts in uh, Madison Square Gardens uh, to raise money for the Parnell Parliamentary Party Fund. He knew Parnell, he knew Davitt, he knew all of the uh, Parnell party very, very well and consistently raised money. But more importantly, he wrote about them in his concert programs, thus giving a great endorsement for what we now know as the question of the day, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the great uh, move by Parnell to, uh, if you like, get uh, dem democracy back to Ireland. And in 1892, he died in New York. Um, this is a picture of his coffin actually arriving at St. Francis Xavier's Church, which I was lucky enough to find. And there was 8,000 ladies that day outside crying. 500,000 on the square, uh, sorry, on the sidewalk, I should say. And um, it's amazing that Gilmore almost disappeared from uh, memory for everyone. However, in Ireland, uh, thankfully, it's starting to uh, create a new awareness. The, the um, P.S. Gilmore story is one thing. But two years ago, I, um, I was lucky enough to make a submission to UnPost. And I, I was successful in basically getting uh, Gilmore included in a series of stamps called the Irish Abroad. And this basically, I've been told, Gilmore is, beside um, Richard Harris, Gilmore is the first Irishman from uh, the famine to be remembered on a stamp in Ireland, which not only is that sad, it's uh, remiss of us. It, we haven't really um, started taking ownership of the success uh, and the innovation and the imagination and the intelligence of these Irish who left Ireland. Finally, I, I, I always put it this way, I was not a great fan of Mr. Trump, but he used to talk about the brain drain that was going to China. And I look on the famine, not just as all those people we lost, but the brain drain that happened in the famine and, and affected Ireland for the next 150 years was the brain gain that became America's gift. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions or want to contact me, there's my email address. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I was about to call you Patrick there for a second, Charles, <laughs> because you, you've kind of like blended in the persona there so well. And what a magnificent, fantastic presentation. It just shows how your dedication has, has brought back Patrick Gilmer so well. I remember back the 150th anniversary of the, the end of the American Civil War and playing when Johnny comes marching home in a school not too far from Ballygar. And just mm -hmm. the kids were amazed that this was a local lad that did well. And you have brought that story so well. And I'm just looking at some of the, the comments there. Tom Crane, nice job. Denise, wonderful. How informative. What a man he was. I think that's about you as well as about Patrick Gilmer as well. Uh -huh. So thanks, Denise, <laughs> for that. That was so interesting, Tara, says Karen. Great presentation. Michelle, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. 
I'm just moving this and my mouse got a bit stuck. Um, just wonderful. I knew nothing about this superstar from Anne-Marie. Patty Costa, hand clap there and lots and lots of that. Um, person had to go, Sylvie, I have to go, but thank you for introducing me to Patrick Gilmore. And um, as a Liverpool fan, I was quite interested <laughs> in your reference to Jorgen Klopp there and how, <laughs> how, how he made, how Patrick Gilmore met all these German musicians, yeah. mentality monsters, as Jorgen would say. I mean, that was an incredible achievement to bring them all across for a European tour. But 50,000 people, or as you said there, 70,000 people on Coney Island as well. Amazing organization for the time. The slide that you have up now is very familiar to me because I taught in Xavier High School for two years on 16th Street. Yes. And that's, I did not realize that connection there. I was in that church so many times. Not, um, not only that, that but there, sorry for interrupting you, but there, I believe in Xavier Hall, uh, sorry, in Xavier School, um, there's a hall. And in 1889, there's another famous Irishman, which we should never forget, called William Burke Cochrane. And William Burke Cochrane is famous for a couple of things, I would say, mostly because he was from Killooney and Sligo. He, secondly, though, he became the father of the House of Congress. But he also taught Winston Churchill how to speak without a stammer. And William Burke Cochrane and Gilmore gave the uh, dedication when the school, uh, school hall was opened and wrote a song called Ireland to England. And it was dedicated to, um, it was dedicated from um, uh, the way it was written from um, a, a peasant, Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore to Charles Stuart Parnell and the Prime Minister of, of, of Britain Gladstone. was Gladstone. Thank you very much, William Gladstone. And it was it basically told the story of how the roses of England would would learn to love the shamrocks of Ireland. Ah, beautiful. I I was in that hall many many times, and that's a wonderful. And I don't know, I think a plaque needs to go up there and I'll have to get in touch with some <laughs> of my Xavier contacts. Charlotte, if you could just go down to the bottom and just click stop sharing screen there. So that would be uh, good. Okay. Uh, like, uh, On the right. bottom of where is Zoom, oh. just go in there. And there oh. are two people that have just, I want to join us. So I'm going to just add is that them. The, sorry, you're share, stop share. Yes. Okay. There you go. That's Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Charlotte, thank you. Look forward to seeing you down in Balagar one of the days. And for everybody, you. if you just look behind Charlotte there, you'll see some of the amazing stuff that he has. And <laughs> a, an amazing collection. And Charlotte, you had sent me on. Kieran Riley, who was our speaker last yes. year, has done an amazing um rise up of, of the contribution that you have made and hopefully that collection um if somebody like um what's his name down in, in limerick will give you about five million i think they'll be able to get um, a little bit of it or else michael flatley might do something but thank you so much charlotte and i look forward to the next time that you talk in Ballygar and we walk around Ballygar in the footsteps of patrick sure. Sarsfield gilmer thanks a million and just one shout out before I get John um, to, to come on. Um, Eamon um, had to, to leave, but Eamon gave a nice comment there on, and if you just look at it in the, the notes on the chat about um, the collection, and I've just lost it now. Oh yeah, the, just, yes. Um, Eamon's gonna be doing a blog post about some of the information um, that was the 1870s, 1847 death cen census. And if you just look that up in newspapers, um, some of the priests gave the names of people who had died in their parishes and so on. Thank you again, Charlotte. And I'm gonna just hand it over here to John. And John has got himself ready there and he's going to unmute himself and He's going to start his screen sharing in a few seconds. Love John back here again. Again, 
last time, John has written this wonderful book, Divergent Paths, and it's about the Irish in Staffordshire. And um, through that book, I was privileged to, to kind of like email back and forth. And last year, John gave a wonderful talk on the Irish that were there in Staffordshire. And through a collaboration then with Pam Neary, now Pam may join us towards the end, um, they have chatted through the year and thankfully have come up with great insights for different families that were the, in Staffordshire that did the Great Migration. And again, the Chesterfield in Derbyshire uh, families that also went to Monmouth, New Jersey. So they have, they have talked on that. John is a former a head of history in John Moores University in the wonderful city of Liverpool. I think we'll have to keep on saying Liverpool here. <laughs> and uh, is that okay, John, to keep oh, talking about Liverpool, especially after the heroics of this season? <laughs> and um, your heroics, John, in identifying names and re-establishing connections for our families here in East Galway and in Roscommon is to be lauded. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation there. So thanks a million again. And are you good to go there? Yeah, hopefully, yes. Um, well, you'll see, hopefully, or some of you on your screens, that, that Pam Neary has joined us. Um, awesome. Now we weren't sure Welcome, whether she was going to be able to be present today because she's in fact just had an operation. Um, so I'm afraid you're mainly going to get me, but obviously Pam might might um, <coughs> uh, make a, a contribution at some point. Now, as Martin's just said, um, our talk today really owes a lot to chance, I think. You know, Pam and I were successive speakers last year at the conference. and. We discovered that, in fact, our, we had in, mutual interests um, in Northeast Galway. Um, Pam, of course, from her uh, doing her own family history of the Neeries and other related families, and me from this study of Stafford, that, so an Irish families in Stafford that Martin has just mentioned. Um, now, um, what we want to do today is, in fact, to, to, to look at, at two families who came from Northeast Galway. Um, the Neary family, and uh, a family called Reddington. Um, now, um, the Reddingtons, as we increasingly discovered, were probably related in possibly various ways to the, the Neary's. Um, now, I think one of the things to say is that the, 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 what we're going to talk about today is, is very much a question of work in progress. Um, in a sense, both of us have sort of um, been looking at families by going backwards, as most of us do, I suppose. Um, and uh, we have, you know, I've studied various families who ended up in Stafford and have traced them who they were. But of course, the big problem you have is, is actually tracing them back to Ireland and where they came from in Ireland. Um, and similarly, Pam has studied her family and gone backwards back to Ireland, but there are still gaps. And I think that's the main one of the things I want to say is that really this is still very much work in progress and there's much that's still unknown and speculative. What we want to do though to start with is just look at the locality uh, that these families came from, the Reddingtons and the Neerys. Um, now uh, in the census of England in 1911, um, a man called Reddington, um, uh, here we are, uh, there's his entry in the 1911 census. And he was very specific, as you'll see, as to where he was born. Now that's actually pretty unusual in the British census. Um, you, you desperately want people to say that, but in fact, either they didn't say it, or in fact, most of the time, enumerators were told, oh, if they come from Ireland, just put Ireland. Um, so it's a real struggle, but in this case, Old Hugh Reddington, who by that time was 76, you know, actually was specific. He said Akalati, as it as it's spelt there. Um, now, what he clearly meant was Akalati, sorry, Akalive, um, which is in Kilmegna Parish in um, in northeast Galway. His spelling wasn't accurate, but that's where clearly where he meant. And this townland is is precisely where. Pam's family, the Neerys, came from. 
and the two families, as I've already said, are almost certainly related. So let's look at for a minute uh, at that townland. Um, now, the name in Irish, which I, well, you know, there, there are all sorts of different questions of how you pronounce it. I, I actually quite like um, uh, Martins. I presume Martins is the, the, the proper way of pronouncing it, Ocot Leaf. Um, uh, it, it, it means in Irish the field of the half side, and it basically means um, land halfway up a hill. And there you'll see um, today um, a, a rather long distance picture of a, a good deal of Ocotative, and you'll see how the land is sloping down to a river valley there. Um, now here's the, um, the aerial view, the satellite views today. And uh, I think what's fascinating is if you relate that to the uh, maps that were produced at the time of the, the Griffith evaluation, which we'll say a bit more about later, what you can see is that in fact today's landscape essentially still reflects pretty well everything that was there in terms of the subdivisions of land in the middle of the 19th century, around the Great Hunger period. So in a sense, we've, that's been carried on right through to the present day. Now, um, today, um, there are about 30 people living in that townland. There's a mere 11 houses. Before the Great Hunger in 1841, there were 253 um, living in 49 houses. And in fact, probably before the famine finally came, um, there, were, there could well have been about 280 people living there. Now, historically, this townland was in land owned by the Burke family of Glynn's Castle. But back in 1730, it was stolen. And ultimately, um, it ended up in 1814 in the hands of a man called the Reverend Solomon Richards. Um, now, the Richards family were, in fact, Protestants from Salisbury near Ennis Causey in County Wexford. So the fact is that from 1814, um, Ocalative's owner was an absentee landlord, like many. And he also owned land in in four other townlands in, in Kilbegnet Parish, as well as in Kilcroen and in Tune. Interestingly, he, he, he basically, he and his family sat there and watched the money roll in. They weren't very active landlords at all. Um, they just uh, seemed to have lived on the rents and that was it. Now, after 1815, um, the people, of Ocotleaf um, experienced most of the dire problems that uh, afflicted Western Ireland, and particularly Eastern Galway, uh, in that period. Um, and there was basically an army of, of, of mainly unemployed male labourers who, who were surviving, and their families, of course, on just occasional bits of work. Um, in 1831, the census shows that half the labourers in Ballymo Barony, which is where this town than this, um, were out of work. Now, increasingly, um, these, these more or less unemployed people were forced to um, earn money by going to places like Staffordshire in England to, uh, for seasonal work on the farms and the building sites there. And that geographical relationship, which built up before the Great Hunger, uh, was to have great importance later on. Now, the impact of the Great Hunger on Arcalati was, was drastic. Um, as I said earlier, I think the, I reckon the population in 1846, 1845, six had probably reached about 280 in this town. By 1851, it had dropped to uh, 129. So it had well more than half. Um, and of course, most of the people who probably suffered in this process were the poorest in the town now. Now, one of the problems, of course, we have with the famine, and it's been mentioned earlier today, is the awful question of, of how many actually directly died as a result of the famine. Um, you know, the discussion earlier on about starvation references and the terrible stories that were presented, you know, that was what was going on. Um, but of course, other people were being forced to emigrate. So what was the proportion? 
for what it's worth, and I've estimated that in this town, um, uh, perhaps about 85 people may have died prematurely in the famine, and possibly about 65 emigrated. But the balance could be um, you know, a bit one way or the other. Now, um, what I want to do now is to um, look a bit more at uh, the Nearian Reddington families in Ochotleave. Here's the data that we have, the historical source of the Tide of the Potman, which was done in this uh, town land in, uh, or in this parish, Kilbegna, in 1824. Now, um, one of the things that comes out of this is, of course, that there was a social hierarchy. Those at the bottom of that social hierarchy back in the 1820s, they don't appear in the tithe allotment at all. Basically, they were either partners in Rundown, Rundale Holdings. And you'll see, in fact, there's, there's two holdings here. One is a, a Reddington and Partners. And there's another one down the bottom here, El Cuniff and Partners. So some of these other people were hidden under those entries. But of course, a lot of people were probably um, subtenants of these people on the list who were actually acting as, as middlemen landlords. Um, others may well have been uh, conica holders just renting patches of land uh, yearly. Now, one of the things that comes out of the tithe plotment, and I mean, it's, it's interesting what an you know, interesting source it is, is um, the rate per acre um, column here. And you'll see that um, the various holdings were given a rate per acre. So the highest were here up at the top, um, uh, which were nine pence farthing per acre. You'll see further down, there's one here which is sevenpence and one which is as low as fourpence. And one of the things that comes out of this is that if actually if you compare this with tithe allotments elsewhere in Kilbegness and in northeast Galway, it does tend to show that, that uh, Ochalitiv was, was a pretty poor townland. Um, the highest rate per acre was nine pence farthing. Um, elsewhere in the parish, um, rates were over a shilling or as high as one in four. So it was probably a rather poor area. Having said that, um, what you can see is, and what this shows is that some uh, tenants of the Reverend Richard had actually you know, had uh, managed to amass uh, substantial holdings. Um, so the, the seven um, named people on this list here, um, they uh, were as tenants or as in partnerships, they had about half of the, the, at least half the land of the, the parish. Now, another thing that's important to remember about the tithe allotment is that these acreages um, are old Irish acres. And I think, as been mentioned earlier, they're about 1.6 English acres, which are the ones that are used later on in the um, uh, uh, this, um, uh, valuation. Okay, now what we see, from our point of view, is that there are four holdings of interest to her. One is here, Derby Neary, as it's spelled then, Derby Neary. Further down, there's William Neary. At the top here, there's M Reddington, probably Michael. And then there's D Reddington. So basically, um, these uh, people had amassed holdings of um, about then 57 English acres between them. Um, so what we can say is that the, the nearest and to a lesser extent the Reddingtons were sort of significant players in the local economy and society. They appear in the uh, tide of problems. Now, um, when we get to the 1850s, um, we have kind of, of course used data from the Griffith valuation to trace the overall land situation in Ock and Thieve and, uh, and other areas and the position of the Neeries and Reddingtons. Now, I suppose one of the things that's, um, well, I suppose particularly that Pam Neary has found out 
and, and, and exposed really is in many ways how problematic, how useful, but also how problematic um, Griffith valuation data is. Um, most people, of course, uh, when they're using the online version of Griffith that are widely available, um, take the published tables and plans as showing a sort of snapshot of the uh, land, of land ownership and tenancy at a fixed point in time in this area, primarily in the uh, early 1850s, after the Great Hunger. But the, the valuation evidence um, that uh, is more complicated than that. Um, Pam Neer has done a lot of work on the data which was contained in the continuing valuation books and this slide uh, shows examples of those continuing valuation books. Um, now we've got two examples here. Um, here's Ockert Leave and you see that here and these books were initiated in this area in the 1840s. In other words, probably most of them before the famine. And what you see here is, is the list of um, uh, occupants um, of the Reverend Richards. There's Richards's name there. Here you see some of the occupiers listed. Now you'll see that in fact, um, this entry here, that's Bridget Reddington. But you'll see that, in fact, written in very faint um, pencil there above it is the name John. And what it's showing is that, in fact, uh, Bridget Reddington had died, presumably, and the, the land was taken over by John. Now, um, the evidence, this evidence is the evidence that went into the published um, um, Griffith returns. Um, but of course, it could hide a lot of a lot of change. Now, this um, page here, these pages here, are from a uh, time land quite close by, Kilo's Beg. Now, the, the land in Kilo's Beg was um, was bought in 1853 by a Scottish entrepreneur called Alan Pollock, um, and he basically proceeded to evict. The vast majority of people from all his holdings. He was a very much a successor to the Gerrards that were mentioned earlier on this morning. Um, and here you see what the impact was on the um, valuation books. The names of the, the occupiers of the plots are listed here, and they were the occupiers before the famine, and you know, up until the time that the Pollock took over in 1853. But you'll see that basically the whole lot have been in one way or another scrubbed out. There you have eviction in, in action documented in these ongoing valuation books. Now, um, uh, sorry, um, right, uh, right. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that when we look at the uh, Griffiths valuation published tables like you know probably a lot of us looked at them you know it all looks all hunky-dory and clear you know but in fact there is a question of you know wh what when that data dates from and I think we can sort of conclude that in fact the, the Griffith data you know that's published it can be a sort of a, a mixed confection from various points in time and not necessarily simply in this case from 1853. Um, now, what the table shows, I won't ask you to read it, but it shows that in the 1840s, which is when this data comes from, there were 80, 30, sorry, there were 34 occupiers um, leasing land in Uckerleaf. Eleven of those occupiers were members of the Neary family. Um, and you can see them at various points on this list. And you've already seen the entry for Bridget Reddington, she held a patch of um, land as well. In fact, about 18 acres of land. Now, again, that's the static, apparently static picture. What Pam's done is in fact then to try and trace what happened to land holdings um, for the rest of the century, using again, the, the, the continuing 
present valuation books. Now, I'm not going to obviously look at the details of what's on here, but what it's and, and Pam's actually looked at these changes right through until the end of the 19th century. Um, but uh, what it's um, showing is that um, actually, in the end, there was not actually in, in, in this town a lot of change uh, in the period after the famine in terms of who the, land, the, the, the landholding families were. Um, what did happen, of course, was that um, individual occupiers um, died and then their land was probably passed to other relatives. Um, and that's what happened uh, very much so in here. Um, and what that increasingly meant was that um, even amongst families like the nearest and to a lesser extent the Reddingtons, those who held land increasingly um, in the old days it tended to be subdivided amongst the children that tended not to happen after the famine so in fact even amongst the, the, the more prosperous landowning families most of the children you know, actually ultimately had to leave had to emigrate to survive right now that this this slide sort of summarizes um, you know what the landholding situation was for the Nearys and the Reddingtons in Ocotleave. Now it's important to say, I think straight away, that um, it's proved impossible so far for us to construct a definitive genealogy of either of those two families um, in Ocotleave. The land valuation evidence only identifies those with an interest in land, of course, uh, and the parish records um, from the Catholic Church are incomplete. They basically only start in uh, 1836 and they're still they're patchy after that. And more than that, they're pretty difficult to read, they're semi legible. So, the long short of it is that although we can find a lot of references to these families in data, you know, some in the valuation returns, a lot more in the, um, the registers. Um, it's pretty difficult to actually fit it all together. You only end up getting snippets of information about a whole load of people, and you don't necessarily, in fact, often you know, it's impossible to tell what their relationship is to other members of, of, of the family. Now, concentrating on the nearest for a moment, um, um, it um, seems that the Neary family were long established in Loch uh, In the 1749 Elfin census, which some of you probably used, um, a William Neary is listed in this town now. Um, now, um, it's, uh, the, the unfortunate thing is that Pam hasn't managed to make a direct link um, to that William Neary and the later people that we'll talk, I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but um, you know, although we can't make that direct link, it does suggest that the Neeris were long-time residents. Now, we've seen that by the 1840s, um, the Neeris had actually in, in amassed interest in, in 13 plots. And um, this uh, diagram shows the, the, the main areas, well, the areas that they had. Basically, the Neeris were sole occupiers of all the brown bits here. Um, they were also part occupiers of the yellow bits um, here. Um, and the, we're then left with the Redding, Reddington, Bridget Reddington, who actually had those two patches there, which were in the midst of the, um, the, the Neary holdings. So long short it is that by the 1840s and 50s, the Nearys were um, dominant players in the local economy, it would appear. Um, uh, now, um, Pam's gone on to look at the development of um, the holdings in the rest of the century, as I've already said. Uh, and one of the things that becomes apparent is that one of the family, uh, Thomas Neary, um, became ultimately pretty prominent and wealthy, ended up building a very nice house for himself um, somewhere around here. Um, which still exists, um, 
And uh, of course, the implication of that is that Thomas Neary uh, acquired um, uh, interest in land which had previously been held by others of his family. Um, and that those people might, might well, for all we know, have been undermined and themselves ultimately forced to emigrate. I suppose you know, the fact is that you know, the Neerys were a, a mixed family. You know, some of them did reasonably well in this area, but a lot of them probably remained poor. Some died in the family, famine, and most of them ultimately probably had to emigrate. Right, now this, uh, um, we've got, we need to follow the story of Anne's family. Now, she's done a vast amount of work and there's no way we can look at that all today. Um, but, uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is to trace the, the, the direct line of, of um, Pam's uh, family running through to their emigration to America. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, we know about William Neary, he was in the town land in 1749. Um, there are, are records of possible Thomas Neary and, and another Neary later on, but the direct link, it's not proved possible so far to make the direct link. So the first person that, that Pam knows about um, who's a direct ancestor is Patrick Neary here. He was born um, around 1813 um, and he married a woman called Easter Burns. Um, and uh, um, he, they, had a, a, they had two sons, in fact, one of whom was Patrick Neary, who was born in 1840. Now, around the time that Patrick Neary was born, in fact, his father, the older Patrick, died. And his mother, Easter Burns, as had been Easter Neary, um, she, in fact, very quickly married um, a, a Peter Keegan, who came from Ross Doltown land, close by in Ballonakilde Parish. And they proceeded then to have four um, Keegan children, um, two girls and two boys. The two girls seem to have died in the famine or immediately after. Um, but the two boys um, survived. Um, and um, uh, now, when uh, Easter Burns, stroke Neary, married um, Peter Keegan, um, she moved uh, to um, the, uh, the parish, uh, the, the, you know, the parish that he lived in. Um, uh, and um, uh, that land um, was owned um, by a different landlord. It wasn't uh, Solomon Richards. Um, and uh, the um, landlord there proceeded in 1849 to evict um, the Keegans, Easter and Peter Keegan, and 13 other families from the townland, Rosdor. Um, they were forced out. Uh, and that meant that um, Peter Keegan, his wife, and their four remaining children um, had to leave. Now, initially what happened, and here we have, in a sense, see the process of staged emigration. Um, initially, um, Easter and Peter Keegan themselves alone went to America. And, uh, sorry, I need to move, move on. There we go. Um, they, they went to America and they uh, landed in New York and immediately moved to Monmouth County in New Jersey, which has been mentioned earlier today, where lots of people from this area um, started off in America. So uh, Easter and Peter uh, settled there for a time um, and they worked as uh, farm, on farms, farm labourers. Uh, and initially, of course, they were trying to get money together to um, get their children to uh, follow them. Um, the four children, the four boys, followed them finally in 1851. 
uh, and the family, the Keegans, um, remained in New Jersey for a number of years, in fact, before in, in 1856, heading west. And they initially went to Rush County, Indiana, um, where their savings allowed them to rent their own um, farm and several relations joined them there. They remained in, uh, um, Indi in uh, Indiana uh, during the Civil War. Um, but after that, they then moved again and they moved to Whiteside County, um, Illinois. There was a large contingent of their Irish neighbors from East Corwin. And in fact, I think this area was mentioned earlier on today. Um, and there, um, the Keegans um, bought uh, a farm of their own. Um, Easter's husband, uh, um, Peter Keegan, worked hard and saved and in fact became quite a, a pillar of the local community. Now, Peter Keegan and Easter's son's stepson or son, Patrick, he stayed near them for a time in Illinois. But ultimately, there were some rifts in the Irish community there. So, in fact, um, Patrick ultimately then moved to Iowa, which again has been mentioned today, important area. Um, and um, he, he moved there um, because there were a lot of Irish people there, but specifically because his uh, half brother, um, John Keegan, was already settled there on the farm. So um, Patrick Neary bought a farm um, in Iowa and um, uh, became again, or well, it did very quite successfully. So here we see um, Patrick Neary, as he was um, at his golden wedding in 1910. There's his wife, Nancy, and their children. Um, so the Neary family, basically, I suppose, did well and prospered in their final destination in Iowa. Patrick died in 1915 and his wife, Nancy, in 1934. Now, um, going back a bit, you will remember that um, I said that um, people um, before the famine in Occlesheve um, had um, often gone to Staffordshire in England um, for work, um, seasonal work. So it was an area that was well known to people from Occlesheve, um, relatively easy to get, get to, get across Ireland, to probably to Dublin or some of the other ports, over to Liverpool, and it was a couple of days walk down to Staffordshire here. So, um, uh, that's, that link was clearly developed, uh, definitely, I think, by the Reddingtons and almost certainly by the Nearys. And some of the Nearys, in fact, went to Staffordshire and settled there. Um, at the time of the famine, um, a James and Anne Neary escaped to the potteries area, the industrial potteries area in North Staffordshire here. And in 1851, they were living in a place called Will Stanton in, 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 in the pottery. And living with them was James's nephew, another James, and also Andrew Neary, another relative described as a lodger. Now, the interesting thing is that these um, settlers um, in the potteries, these Neary settlers, they seem to have gone back and forward between the potteries and you know, Galway, um, for a number of years. And, and one of the features of, of this family was that a number of them were tailors. And it's already been mentioned today about the, the so-called farmer-tailor combo. And these people were examples of it. Now, in the end, the, the, these Neary's did in fact settle in, in the pottery and the family remained there for the rest of the century. Now, one of the things is that the, it seems clear that the Neerys who were settled in, in, in the Potteries remained in contact with the Reddingtons. 
And, um, uh, and I want to turn to the, the Reddington family. Now, um, as I sort of said earlier, I mean, my interest in the Reddington family was, was that they popped up really as, as one of the Irish immigrant families who settled in Stafford in the uh, mid 19th century. And um, before, in fact, I, the last year's paper, uh, and having before I'd met Pam, I'd really not taken a lot of interest in this family. Um, so I'd just done a, a bit of basic reconstruction of, of what the family was in the Stafford area. However, um, of course, it's you know, become apparent that they were a rather more interesting family to me than, than I initially thought. Now, one of the things about the Reddingtons is that, um, frankly, we haven't a clue uh, where they came from in, in Galway, in Ocotee. Um They don't seem to appear in the 1749 Elkin census. Yeah, that, it, it remains to be pursued a bit further. Uh, there's a possible garbled name that could be but um, probably not. All we can say, I think, is that the Reddingtons did, um, you know, do seem to have been in uh, um by the late 18th century. I mean, one interesting thing, of course, is, is, is the name, which is, of course, a, a, an Anglo sort of name. Um, it's more common, certainly in more recent times, in County Mayo, um, not, not so common in, in this area. Their origins are not clear. Um, now, as we've seen, the, the, the Reddingtons uh, held much less land than the Learys. Um, at some point in the 1830s, probably, Michael Reddington's tenancy, the one that was on the um, Tower of the Plotman, that passed to um, John and Bridget Reddington. Um, now, uh, these, these people now appear on this, as I've said, very tentative summary of the Reddington genealogy. Um, Michael, is Redding, Michael Reddington from the uh, Tide Plotment, and there is his probable son, uh, John Reddington. And we know that he was born about 1788. We presume he was born in the townland. Um, uh, and he certainly died there in 1838. Now, um, but the, um, now Michael, um, at, at the time, I'm sorry, at the time of the um, Griffith valuation, um, a Michael Reddington was, which is not, not this one, I think it's probably, probably a son that we don't know. A Michael Reddington occupied uh, a, a land with members of the Neary family. Um, very close to where um, the Reddington, the, the initial Reddingtons also held land. And I think that's significant. I think we, we, we're we really speculating that in fact, Bridget Reddington, John's wife, um, John, John here, Bridget Reddington probably was a near. The problem is we haven't found any record of a marriage yet. But the fact that the there was one and another male Neary living next door and that her land was surrounded by other Neary land. Um, these suggest that there was a con direct connection between the Craig family. Now, Bridget Reddington um, uh, occupied about 18 acres in, in uh, Akhmatitiv. Um, she also, in fact, had some land jointly occupied in um, uh, Ballinahona, town land uh, fairly close by. Um, so she's, although she couldn't compete with the nearest, she was you know, a, a sort of middling uh, farmer. Now, um, the Reddingtons, uh, we, we haven't managed to um, construct the full extent of the Reddington family in Ocker's Leave. Um, uh, what's apparent is that when we look at the um, registered data from before and particularly after the famine, uh, quite a number of Reddingtons uh, continued in the area, even in the um, post uh, Great Hunger period. 
But nevertheless, it's pretty obvious that over time, most of them were forced to emigrate. And by 1901, there was only one person, a Reddington, left in the townland. That was Bridget Reddington, who was a, a 75 year old spinster. So in a sense, the Reddingtons rather show the impact, the long term impact of the, of, of, of the great hunger over the long term, the drain of people to face. Now, the vast majority of the Reddingtons almost certainly went to America. Um, we know there were Reddingtons in New Jersey. Um, and uh, um, there's, we really need to trace this line forward. Um, uh, it's, it, that's work to be done. So the majority probably did go to America, but especially during the, the Great Hunger, um, you know, some of them did emigrate to England. Um, and I want to, in a sense, start to finish off by looking at how members of the Reddington family um, appeared in Stafford, in Staffordshire, in England. Now, the first record that we have that Reddington's had arrived in Stafford was um, on the 11th of July, 1848, when um, John, the son of Martin Brady and Bridget Reddington, was baptised at St. Uh, Austin's Church in Stafford. Now, uh, that is the only record we have of that couple. Um, they don't appear in the 1851 census. They presumably, anywhere, I might say, not just in Stafford, but anywhere in England. So they must have passed through, had their child baptized, um, and then emigrated. The second record we have um, is a year later, well, less than a year later, in fact, on the 10th of February, 1849. Um, Mary, the daughter of John Reddington and Mary Kennedy, was also baptized at, um, uh, at St. Austin's Church. Now, their arrival in uh, Stafford or the Stafford area seems to have been well, quite interesting. Um, this this um, slide shows the census return for 1851. You'll see at the top, um, this entry here is John Reddington. He's down as a lodger. Um, he's listed as a labourer, came from Ireland. Um, that's the John Reddington that I've already mentioned. Where, where was his wife? Where was um, his little daughter, um, Mary? Well, here they are. Now, <laughs> this is the sort of thing you have to deal with, isn't it, with these records? Somebody obviously poured a load of water on this or something. Um, it's an appalling record, but in fact, just lurking down at the bottom here is Mary Reddington, again, a lodger from Ireland, from County Galway, and her three, then three children, Anne, Maria, and Jane. Where were they living? They were living in a cellar in Backsmith Street off Deansgate in Manchester. Um, why were they living there? Well, <laughs> difficult to say, um, but they were clearly living with other hallway people. Um, so they, there were obviously connections here. And um, it would appear that um, you know, although uh, Mary had been in Stafford back in 1849, you know, when children started to arrive, that, you know, she, she needed more support than John could initially offer her. So she ended up in Manchester, that's all we can say. Um, but what it shows is, is, in a sense, the process of, of, of settlement was, a, you know, for this family, as for many others, was, was pretty disordered and strange. Now, um, in fact, um, uh, we know that the, the, the Mary and her children came back to Stafford um, and they stopped for a time um, because unfortunately we know that um, their baby Jane, who was born in Manchester down the bottom here, she died in Stafford in 1852. Um, 
and that's the last we hear of John and Mary Reddington and their children. Um, so again, we have to assume that they uh, ended up emigrating. Um, now, um, there were other Reddingtons who arrived in this part of England in the same period. Now, as, I've, as I have to stress, the, the, this, this um, genealogy here is, 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 a, is, a, is a shot which is plausible, but is not by and large proven. But nevertheless, for, you know, for the purposes of this, there were clearly relationship interconnections between all these people. Now, um, in uh, 1851, this man, Thomas Reddington, was to be found um, as a, uh, initially as, a, as a, an errand boy, uh, working for a man near Cannock, which is a town near Stafford. Um, in 1852, um, Thomas Reddington he appeared at St Austin's Church in Stafford and married this woman, Catherine Higgins, who came, the evidence seems to show, from Kilkerrin, which, as most of you will know, uh, is, is, a, is a parish not that far from Kilbegwood. So they got married in, um, in, in Stafford in 1852, and they proceeded to settle in, in a village called Penkridge, which is about five miles south of Stafford. And, and Thomas worked as an agricultural labourer, um, and uh, the family became well established in that locality for the rest of the century, although Thomas himself died in 1867. Now, the interesting thing is that six months later, um, Ellen Reddington appears at St Austin's Church and marries uh, a man called Edmund Gilligan. Um, subsequently, in 1853, they had a child, John, baptised in St Austin's Church. But um, Ellen herself had not, or, and indeed Edmund Gilligan, neither of them had been in the 1851 census. So one can only assume that they had left, uh, or she had left um, uh, Galway sometime around 1851. You know, ended up marrying this man in Stafford in 1853. Had a child, again, lost, disappear, presumably emigrated. Um, so we've got a number of people who, who basically seem to have passed through Stafford. And I suppose that emphasizes the fact that you know, Stafford clearly was a sort of bolt hole and had been for probably a number of decades. But for most of these people now in the post Great Hunger situation, they were, you know, it was just a place to pass through, to get going, and ultimately to emigrate abroad. That brings us to the final couple on this um, uh, genealogy here, Hugh, Hugh Reddington and Bridget. Now, um, they um, were the final permanent settlers of the Reddingtons in Stafford. We don't know anything about Hugh Reddington until in Stafford until he got married to Bridget, the record says Gavagan, but we suspect it might actually be Garrigan. Um, they got married in 1859. So Hugh Reddington was, was in the town by then. He may well have been working in the town before that. Now, the, the, the great thing about Hugh Reddington uh, was that he, uh, the, the, his marriage record specifically says who his parents were, John and Bridget Reddington. So we know that in fact they were, you know, Hugh was, was John's child. Now, um, uh, one of the interesting things about um, the marriage that took place is that one of the witnesses of their marriage was a Patrick Neary. Um, I found no record of such a Patrick Neary in England, certainly not at this time and certainly not in Stafford. Um, 
But there is a Patrick Neely who is listed on plot 27 of the um, um, valuation return, the Griffith return um, around 1853. It could be him. What it does suggest is that clearly the links between the Reddingtons and the Neerys were remaining, were remaining close. Now, um, as I said, the Hugh and Bridget Reddington went on to be permanent settlers in Stafford. Um, they had quiet lives, I think, but successful lives. Hugh uh, always worked as a, as a, as a bricklayer's labourer. Um, Bridget was a, was a shoe binder, which is a, was a sort of rather low status female job in Stafford's main industry, which was boot and shoemaking. Um, despite their humble circumstances, they uh, became a respectable and, and clearly well regarded working class family. Now this slide um, shows the circumstances that they lived in in their time you know, for the rest of the 19th century. Um, after they got married, they lived here in this place called the Broad Eye. Now, th this is the best picture I've got of the Broad Eye. You can see with a line of pretty crummy, basically slum dwellings. Where they lived was even worse because, in fact, it was in some court behind these, these houses. Um, so they obviously had a, a, a very difficult start. But as time went on, they... Um, um, their circumstances improved. Uh, Hugh, in particular, seems to have had steady work in the building trade. Um, and by 1901, they were living here in Queen Street. Now you can see that they're still fairly modest houses, but they're, you know, good, good quality little houses. Um, okay, they're rather close to the gas works, but nevertheless, it was a respectable address. However, um, you know, by then, um, Hugh was getting on, he was probably retiring, and they ended up, in fact, in the 1900s in this place called Pilgrim Street. Um, not as bad as Broad Eye, except for the fact that it's rather close to the river and could suffer from, from um, flooding. So in a sense, it's showing the sort of economic circumstances that people went in the 19th century. Now, um, the Reddingtons in Stafford had um, um, six surviving children. They had nine altogether, but three died. Um, four of those children have proved to be totally loose. So one can only assume again that they used their contacts, emigrated, and probably ended up in some of the areas that we've been talking about today, particularly in America. However, two of the um, children stayed in England. Um, their son, Peter Reddington, uh, he got the job on the railways um, as a locomotive fitter and storekeeper, um, steady and reasonably priced job. And ultimately they moved to Northampton. He married there <laughs> and he died in 1825. So uh, we know there are descendants from that family today. The final child was, was Thomas. And he, um, he became a postman, mailman. He married as Laura Sheldon in 1903, and they had at least three children. And in 1911, as we've seen, they were living in New Toxeter, which is another town in the north of Stafford. Um, and as we've seen, um, old Hugh was living at that point with um, his son, um, his son there, Thomas. Um, now, that was, I think, just a, a temporary thing. It may have been after his wife had died, and he may have been recovering from, from that tragedy. Uh, she died in 1910. Um, because, in fact, he did come back to Stafford, <clears throat> and he died and was buried in Stafford in 1921. In other words, he was made of strong stuff. Um, and by the time he died in Stafford in 1921, he was um, one of the few surviving Irish inhabitants of Stafford who actually had um, a direct <clears throat> memory experience of the Great Hunger. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, nobody has emerged from the Reddington family to let us know whether you know, there are legends to be um, gathered about 
the family background, um, which is a pity. Um, there must be people around who are clearly descended from the family. Um, but I suppose it's interesting that uh, the fact that uh, Hugh said where he was born in Upper Cleave in 1911, it does suggest a, a strongly lingering attachment to the place where he came from and its community. Hugh and Bridget Reddington made the best of their lives, I think, in Stafford. But it, as we've seen, I think in the end, the town was, um, for most of them, even the Reddingtons, um, a, a rather a staging post on the way to places elsewhere. So I guess that uh, brings me broadly to the end. Um, as I've emphasized, there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, actually trying to reconstruct the lives and genealogies of these families, particularly in Ireland. But I suppose what it's emphasized, as everything else has today, um, it emphasizes how interwoven the social relationships between Ireland, England, Australia, and America uh, were in the 19th century. Okay. Thank you. John, thank you so much. What a fascinating and very detailed and comprehensive reflection on those two families. And it, it's amazing that there is so much information that is there. But as you said there, there is a good bit to research as well. So thank you very much. And thank you, Pam. I put Pam in there. Pam, you can unmute yourself there if you wish. And to say thank you, because this collaboration happened over the past year. And well done to both of you for going back and forth and, and just zoning in on, on that connection between Staffordshire, Monmouth, and then ultimately to Iowa. So Pam, wishing you the very best in your recovery. And if you and John want to have a quick hello there and to say that as well, please do. Okay. Good, good job, good job, John. I just had, well, I have one quick update to this that I thought you, um, this group might find interesting because I, we have also done a lot of DNA digging into um, the families. And I do have DNA from three of the, of the Neary family lines, which show a common ancestor, which has to be before, 1780. So it's I, it's pretty clear that that William Neary is is a co is probably our common ancestor because we know those two families back to um, 1800 and in one case to 1865. So um, YDNA has has taught us a lot about what we know about our families too, and it's well worth pers pursuing. Fantastic. And just wanted to read out some of the comments here, John and Pam from Natalie. Thank you, Pam and John. Trying to do the same on picking people in Clay Cross, so I completely appreciate your efforts. Uh, Patty, many great ways to research family. I always get stuck when going back and forth to Ireland, England, the USA. So thank you, John. Um, Tara has just checked because of the Gavigan slash Garrigan connection. My grandmother has DNA matches with Reddington families from Cummer and Kilmoyland, oh. which is a little further west, as you know, in the county. One of the trees includes a John Reddington and Celia Burke. Mm -hmm. And I also got in touch with Joe Metz. Joe has Reddingtons uh, from the Dunmore area that immigrated with his family, the um, Donlands, over to Cincinnati, Ohio. Denise, very informative and useful in my research. Thanks. Karen, great information. And Marie, I'm amazed how much you know about these families. So fantastic, both of you there. And um, Maureen had to drop off, but found today's presentation is excellent and inspiring. So thanks for setting that up. So, wow, you guys have done amazing work in the past year. And well, we have, but each time we do a bit more, we realize we know a bit less. <laughs> Very Aristotle. Is it Aristotle that said that? The more I know, the less I know. Yes. So, yeah. and, and it's amazing because it's kind of like you're going into their house and just trying to eavesdrop a small bit into the family conversations about mm. who moved where. And yeah. you're just getting small hints of that. Yes. I mean, I, I didn't have time to deal with it today, but in fact, you know, Pam had done you know, extra work, of course, on the house returns, um, you know, and, and in a sense, you're finding literally where they were living. Um, yeah. 
And those those are the, the house returns and the valuation books yeah. of the yeah. 1840s. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. a great resource if they make mention. And thankfully, they did. Whoever was around that area in Kilbegnus, they did really, really good work. Yeah. And that I think I wrote down um, just the interconnections you, you said there, John, um, you know, between the Staffordshire going back, in fact, to help out at home and then keeping in touch with Iowa, keeping in touch with England in, in some mm -hmm. ways. And sadly, I know a lot of people, especially in Ireland, letters and pictures, they got lost in the 1940s, 50s and 60s when the grandparents died and, and people cleaned out the room. And mm -hmm. a lot of them, unfortunately, that we're now trying to piece together. So yeah. really appreciate your time here today to, to share with us those stories. And I, I look forward to even more delights in 2023 <laughs> when you'll have part three of the great Kilbegnet <laughs> mystery. <laughs> okay. And um, just, just to finish off, if anyone has any other thoughts or questions, just to stick it in chat. And I'm going to be doing a, a short presentation now. And Anne-Marie as well is going to be talking after mine about her great work in Baltimore. So that's something that has just started up. So keep, keep in tune and keep tuned in for that. So John and Pam, thank you so much again. And thank you for all the great speakers that we have had so far to Charlotte, to um, Turtle, to Natalie and to Robin earlier. And uh, I hope I don't let you down with my last talk here. So I'm gonna try and share the screen here and to get the mapping of Black 47 in East Galway. So I hope everyone can see that screen and I'm gonna just put it on display and that should come up in a second. Okay, so I'm gonna just check there to get a thumbs up from Anne-Marie or John or anyone that that's good and I'm ready to go. So thank you very much. Um, we've had a long day in, in so many ways. Our Australian friends have gone to bed. They, they have a new government being formed, as I saw from the results. And um, some folks have just joined us in the last hour or two. This is being recorded so everyone can see it at their leisure in the next while. But it's great to be live as well, so that way we can chat back and forth. I guess um, in, in doing this presentation, I just kind of am filling in what, what everybody else has been doing earlier and just filling it in from a, a map point of view to see where everything is. And hopefully I might be able to give you some uh, pointers about some of the maps that are available. Some of these I've shared already. I think most of these are shared already on the Facebook page, but some may be new. So I'm gonna just look at how we can see that background, John just shared there and Pam shared that wonderful Griffiths valuation map from just after the Great Hunger. So I'm gonna just go back a little bit more and just to see what, what's leading up and how we can look at maps. It's leading up to the 1820s, 30s and 40s. How could you use maps and statistics to do that? So the very first thing is just the title, using maps and statistics to help give a perspective of the communities before and after on Gertham Moor. And just to say like that, where families live cheek by jowl, and then they immigrated as today Robin and Natalie showed in Iowa, those families, the, the Mangans and the Kilmartins close together in, in plots. So who lived close to whom back in Ireland may be replicated somewhere else and it'll be good to see those. So just a breakdown, uh, one of the great sites that's available, as many of you know, is townlands.ie, and it breaks down Galway, as, as Galway is broken down into 16 baronies, 115 civil parishes, 235 electoral divisions, 4,474 townlands, and then sub-townlands that sometimes are there in records, but when you try to find them on the map, they might be slightly missing. So I'm going to try and see if we can pinpoint some of those as well. So townlands.ie is a great go-to at the very first. And the baronies are basically the old Gaelic uh, kingdoms. My own barony 
is of Tai Quen, which would have been the O'Kellys. And in fact, the O'Kellys had a castle there before the Burks took it over, sometime probably in the 14th century. The civil parishes are going to be the medieval parishes. And later on, after Catholic emancipation, some of them remain the same as the Catholic parishes, but some change because the population has shifted in the 200 years of those dark ages, the penal laws from the mid 1600s up until the early 1800s, when there was so much war and dislocation of people. The electoral divisions are coming about from 1839, and that was to do with the uh, Board of Guardians of the new poor law districts. So this is the district electoral divisions or DED if you're looking it up on a census. And the townlands, some of them are quite ancient. Um, they go back to local people um, staying together because of family ties. Um, usually you have uh, a chieftain that's kind of like not the owner, because in Gaelic law, you're not going to be on the land, but you're going to get tribute from it. And then the sub townlands, sometimes when they're going around in the 1820s and 30s, mapping Ireland in the Ordnance Survey, sometimes what happens is that the person just puts in west or east or north or south and small little tiny villages um, are excluded from the title of townland. So those sub townlands are there as well. So one of the great places to go to is S. Wilson, Shane Wilson's wonderful uh, website, swilson.info. And he has collected uh, historic digitized maps and they're quite easy and wonderful to find where you can actually find, for instance, in the background there is the Taylor and Skinner maps of the 1770s. And he's identified with modern maps where those maps can be located. So if we just look at that and where you can get the full edition available, it's going to be on askaboutireland.ie in the reading room, where there's a wonderful collection of books digitized. And those are available to be downloaded as a PDF and included is that the Taylor and Skinner maps. So just before the great hunger, uh, people are trying to, to see where the economy is best suited and the roads and, and joining the roads between the great towns and also joining the roads between the great houses. Um, this is a time of stability in Ireland in some ways, but then it's leading up to 1798. And this is what one of those maps looks like. Um, in this case here, the Newtown Bellew, which is now my law road, and it's leading into Dunmore. So it's coming down, this is the Clada Road, and Clada normally we associate now with Galway, but this is the Clada in Clanburn. And then you've got Mount Bellew and the flour mill, which sadly about 30 years ago was dismantled and Mount Bellew Bridge, um, the title, for the, the townland, which is just emerging, where I live now, is just emerging there. And you see there was a bridge across the river. And that bridge was built just before this map was done. And the bridge was, has a milestone on it because in order to sell to Dublin, um, you got different grants from the Dublin Parliament in order to bring flour there. And of course, the flour mill was going to be bringing that and, and making profits for the values. So these maps are extensive. They don't show us too many of the, the villages that our families lived in, but they show some of the principal areas and especially the big houses. And you see that Fidan house here where Kelly Esquire, New Forest with the Darcy Esquire, Clun Line with Kelly Esquire, and Ballyburn with Kelly Esquire, so near Ballymore Bridge. So again, S. Wilson and Ask About Ireland has that. Now this website, unfortunately, uh, was the victim of a cyber attack last October and it hasn't really got back up. It's the land of the States. Um, it, it got back up about a month ago, but there was a threat of cyber attack. And the reason for this is just to see where the landlords were. Uh, because as, as we're seeing there, um, the landlords, what their choices were affected their tenants. And the, the effect, as Charles was talking of Dennis Kelly on his tenants, the effect of the Burks uh, being, in a way, um, liquidated um, in the 1850s and new, um, new uh, landlords coming in 
that's going to have a big effect on families around the place. So it's important to kind of know where the big houses were and to find out a small bit about them. Hopefully this will be back up and running in the next few weeks. So it's the Land of the States uh, website through Inui Galway. And these landlords, many of them would be Gaelic Irish in our area. Uh, many of them would be what would be termed Old English. And some of them then would be newcomers. Um, the Gaelic Irish would be the O'Kellys. Um, the New English would be the Bellews. And the Blakeneys up the road would have come during the 1650s, the Cromwellian areas. So it's interesting to see the mix in, in East Galway. This website is from the Down Survey of 1670, and it shows who had the property at that time. And some of the families remained in the area, but um, less, less land with, with the family. But what is important is the maps that are there just to see what Ireland was like just 200 years before the Great Hunger. Um, there was quite a number of the settlements that we heard about today would have been present at that time. So in terms of generations of people, a lot of times you would have people present in the same area, but then again, you have people moving in constantly as well through work. And of course, the population increase that Turtle was uh, talking about earlier with up to maybe 9 million, uh, possibly maybe even more in 1845, 46 at that stage. But at 1641, huge decimation between 1641 and 51 of people through the um, various wars of that decade. And Ireland's population was down to about just over a million and a half at that stage. So again, some of the, the places, um, my own townland where I grew up is mentioned there. It's a small, tiny place. And yet it somehow had importance in that time. And Derry Glossom just over the road where some of my, my family was. My Loch Moor, which was an O'Kelly castle, Clun Oren. See, the castles were quite important. And both of those by the 19th century were gone because they were seen as the centers of power for the Gaelic Irish. What's going to happen is some of these landlords, um, because of the great hunger, and, and sometimes even before, because the um, East Galway landlords were kind of known for hunting and um, for gambling, many of them. And so at times um, they ran up huge amounts of debts. Some of the, the local landlords like the Blakes in Ballyglunan uh, profited off this because they gave out mortgages. And when they weren't able to pay back, the families, the Blake families were able then to get their estates. Um, in the case of the Burks, they just ran out of money. And Andrew Pollock, a, a Scottish um, entrepreneur comes along and tries, like he did in South Galway, tries to quote unquote improve the area and finding that there was a huge amount of tenants there. And Find My Past has wonderful maps of just around the Great Hunger and sometimes even before where the, the, the maps of these estates that are up for sale are going to be outlined. And what they do as well is they tell us um, the, the leases that were there before the Great Hunger. Um, one of the biggest things was in fact, the wars with France and especially the Napoleonic Wars of the late 1790s, early 1800s. It was a great boon for Ireland because uh, we were well away from that, but our agricultural supplies was much needed by England because their regular agricultural supplies were cut off by the Napoleonic Wars. And what happened in Ireland, we had a bit of a boom, which then after Waterloo in 1815 was followed by a bust and it gradually went downhill after that. And what had been good leases in this case here, we have a lease of um, several years to, to people and sometimes several lives to people that um, those leases then became an annual lease. And you see Patrick Gormley here in Barnajarig South um, he's going to be just having a, a lease determinable each year, whereas other leases were going to be for the term of 50 years. So that is going to affect our families, and especially during the Great Hunger, because many of them are going to be thrown off the land, and we'll see that a little bit later. 
just to backtrack to some earlier maps, the Bog Commission maps between 1809 and 1814, available on the Board Namona site, is a good insight into the emergence just around that time of that economic boom of what was there in Ireland at the time and what was in our area. Again, I'm just going back to my own area here of Gilka, which is just here. It's not on the particular map, but you have the, the townlands, sorry, there's the townland of Winfield, which is down near um, Newbridge, and you have Clunkeen and Kappa. And Kappa is the, the origin of the Cusack family, the Cusacks of Chicago, of the actors. And you have detailed map here of who was kind of going to be living around the place and the amount of houses in each of the places. This is Mount Bellew. So it's, it's just a time when, just before the Great Hunger, that there's going to be an emergence of new houses and new builds in the area. So the bog maps can be quite insightful in terms of what was going on in your area between that and the emergence of the first edition Ordnance Survey maps. So these were done by a guy called Richard Griffiths um, of the Griffiths Valuation. And he did an extensive work. And, and the main idea here was to see which bogs could be drained properly because you wanted more food from Ireland to feed the British Empire. It was after the Act of Union. And so the British government was interested in Ireland becoming now the feeding part for are they, where the crops were grown to feed this growing empire. So it's an important source of data. And there's quite a number of them available for Galway and for Roscommon and surrounding areas. So those are on the Board Namona website. In 1819, the Grand Jury of Galway asked William Larkin to draw a map. And this again is, is invaluable in just seeing what roads were there. Um, this one just outside of Tume is interesting because if you look there in the center of the map, um, you will find a race course just outside of Tum, a place near Garons. And that race course is going to be the site of the 1843 Daniel O'Connell uh, monster meeting. So there are some things that, that changed in the first edition map, but we can go back and refer to it in William Larkin's map. And then there's several county maps, and these were produced for the, um, I'm going to just move my zoom button a small bit here, by Lewis when he was going around doing his topographical map of Ireland. And those are invaluable. These are available, and I just knocked this off, unfortunately. I'm going to just have to get back here. There we go. These are available on S. Wilson's site. And as you can see on the left-hand side there, they're the historic maps and from 1837 and quite detailed. One of the interesting things that keeps coming up is how did people get around, um, especially with marriages and families going together. And we can see the road networks of that time, very similar to the road networks of today. But it's interesting if we go to the Taylor Skinner map, of 1770s, we'll see that there's quite an investment of roads from that time and in the 60 years up to the, the Lewis topographical. And again, this is available on the, um, the, the website. Um, so you can find it there on, I'm gonna just move again, my mouse is kind of playing tricks with me here, unfortunately, on the Library Ireland website, which has quite a number of these as well as an Ask About Ireland. And this doesn't seem to be moving, unfortunately. So I'm going to just maybe have to move it down. Apologies about this. I have to just stop sharing for a second and just go back to sharing the screen again. My screen is kind of like doing a little bit of jumping back and forth for me. So apologies about that. So I was doing there the Lewis's topographical and great information available there. Uh, for instance, 
about the crops in Galway and what was going on and how they were manured and how actually they were sown so and where the markets were. So this is just prior to the great hunger. So it's, it's a wonderful insight. And he also goes through each town and each post office and says with, with each parish, um, you know, where the schools are, how many children are present at the schools and so on. So it's a great insight into just before the great hunger and what's leading to it. And sometimes there's a little bit of, of, of notice of what's gonna happen, but for the most part, there's nothing about the impending doom that's going to strike Ireland at that time. So in this one, it just talks about agriculture in a backward state, except in a few places, Banlaslo, Chum, Hollymount and Gort, where the rotation and green crop systems have been introduced. So this is just, what, 70 years or so from the great agricultural revolution that happened in England and has been brought to Ireland, especially by people like Robert French in Monavay and the Bellews here in Mount Bellew. But other landlords are kind of more interested in getting most of their, the, um, their rent from tenants and they're not really interested in land production, more in the production of money from their tenants. So this is a good reflection by Samuel Lewis on what's going on and what's, what's happening, hay is really cut till the month of September, and even then very injuriously managed. So therefore, the, the, the whole thing about um, cattle that was Mrs. Gerard's occupation was not something that was found in Galway just before the Great Hunger, because there was a lot of tillage at that time. So it's, it's a good insight into what is happening there. Another map that was done by the Society for Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. And this was set up, it was kind of like um, to try and, and make sure that people, obviously you didn't have that many schools and to get people to learn and to find out about things, but they produced also maps of Ireland. And this one in 1838 by the Society. And this little blurb on this and, and what happened to it. Jaster.org is a wonderful uh, resource in terms of all uh, publications with regards to sometimes very um, obscure and rare kind of like research. So I found this uh, by me, T. Kane, looking at this Society for Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. So it might be of interest to people. But the big one is the first edition Ordnance Survey. So I live here in Mount Bellew. This is the regular map that you can go and buy. The Ordnance Survey Map, the Ordnance is the Department of the Army with regard to logistics, trying to get an army to move from A to B and how to do that best. And in Ireland, after 1798, after the 1801-1803 rebellions, they're trying to make sure that they can pacify the country. We also have the, the outbreak of agrarian um, revolution almost in 1819-20 with the ribbon men. Then you have the tight wars of the early 1830s. So it was important to know where each place was. And, and this was an amazing feat, an amazing accomplishment. And Richard Griffiths was one of the driving forces behind it in terms of mapping the whole place. When you compare a modern map, modern satellite map to the, these maps, it, it's unbelievable the way that they can tie in. And these are guys just going around with chains and with wood, as opposed to photographing the area. So that is the, the present day, and then going to the 1838 map. And pretty much you can identify each part of the Pleasure Lake here in Mount Bellew with the present day map from what this has done. So the house that was there, the, the Bellew's house, um, Unfortunately, now long gone, the wonderful wall garden, which we're in the process of restoring, all of these come to light with these wonderful maps. And again, the second edition then takes us up to the end of the 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, and we can see lots of changes in between. So geohive.ie is a wonderful resource. 
And I mentioned there before about um, the, the sub-townlands. And in this place, I found a record for a family member living in Cool Derry, and I could not find that in any map. And the map that I had was of Anakmore East. And there in the Ordnance Survey was Cool Derry. It was a sub-townland. And now it's, it's pretty much desolate, but my, my cousins still own a little a uh, piece of ta a piece of land here in a house which was the same as the house back in the 1830s so it's amazing what still survives obviously the lake is long gone as you can see from this map the lake is now more of a, a boggy marshy ground so most of the resources um, that are online um, can give you a good um, analysis of of the um, the era just before the great hunger. And two of them in particular that I like to go back to from time to time is Healy Dutton's A Statistical and Agricultural Survey of the County of Galway that's available on the Ask About Ireland reading room. So when you go into Ask About Ireland, click on the reading room, go to eBooks, then go to eBooks by county, and then you click on your county. In this case, there are four of them. So Healy Dutton statistical from the late 1820s. And Healy Dutton was the man who designed that pleasure lake there in Mount Bayou. And of course, Hardiman's, the history and town, the history of the town and county of the town of Galway. So again, some wonderful insights there, again, going back to the early 1800s. So all of these are available to download and a great library if you want virtually, but also some of these are republished in the last number of years. So it's nice to have them again in your hands. Another great resource is the, um, the DIPM, is the Documenting Ireland Parliament People and Migration of the University of Southampton. And the EPI part of that, the Enhanced British Parliamentary Papers on Ireland. And it's, it's a wonderful website and on it there, you can just put in Galway and it goes from 1801 to the emergence of the free state in 1922. You can highlight certain years and just to see what is there on, on that. And one of the things that you can find is the 1835 report on the condition of the poorer classes. And this is an interesting uh, report because what it does is goes around to ask people, not the gentry, but anybody. Um, Martin Kinney here is a laborer, John Lally is a nailer, and these are people who are in Kilcreast, and they're asked questions about what is the, the kind of like condition of people in the area in terms of like, you know, the poverty rate and all of that, and very specific questions as well about begging and who, who comes to the area begging, because up to a third of the population at that time are going to be so poor that begging is going to be a normal practice during the summertime in between the harvests. So it's interesting to see who's being asked about the different things that are going on in the parish. So the one on vagrancy there, again, the parish of Kilcrease and the person is asked about vagrancy and he goes, I cannot say what the exact number of vagrants are. They're chiefly strangers. I do not know the faces of more than three or four. Five or six families call every day in summer for relief, not more than two or three families call in winter, Captain Rogers. So obviously they're, they're someplace else in the winter time. And he goes, Mr. Darcy goes, my servant counted 120 beggars who called at my house in one day. So this is just 1835, just when the, the British government is looking into the state of poverty. They're eventually going to set up the poor law unions to address this, but what, what should have been done to address it was the distribution of land, which they had been also had a report for. So this one, the first report inquiring into the state of poverty in Ireland, it's a very good, and again, it covers quite a lot of the different parishes and asks people there to um, ask them the, the various questions of what's going on around the place. Now, unfortunately, 
again, that has done that. So this is, um, you see John Corbett here is a builder, um, John Darcy of Clifton Castles, this out in Clifton, which had just been built a uh, number of years before, 18 years before, so from 1817 on, the, the Protestant rector of Ome and the collector of um, sets, which is the, the rates for the, um, the county. Now, Hansard is the website for the British Parliament. And again, wonderful resource if you're looking at what's going on in Galway, um, dimensions of Galway and, and different things that have happened in Galway. I just did a, a quick search there and put in the dates from 1841 to 1847. And you can see the different times that Galway gets mentioned. And what it does, it tells you then what it's mentioned for. And this is, you know, that commission that in 1835 went and Lord Devon then commissioned in 1844, talking about what's gone wrong and what, what is the remedy. And this case here, the Marcus of Westmead says that the mode of occupation of the soil in Ireland must be altered by law. And the latter occasion is said that some great alteration were not made. The most disastrous consequences would fall on Ireland. And those words, sadly, within a short time, were going to be very, very true. So, this one here is from the returns of agricultural produce in Ireland in 1850. So just right after, um, you know, the worst years of 1847, but it gives an insight into what was being sown. Um, there was a huge uh, emphasis on diverging the crops and especially the Quakers were coming in and, and building in Colemanstown, a model farm and trying to get people to grow more uh, corn, beans and peas and other crops aside from potatoes. So it's an interesting insight there into what was per parish, what was going to be um, planted in those years. You can see wheat and barley is going to be planted very sparingly in some parts. So all of these then, um, unfortunately, Maynooth University have a wonderful website, which is not accessible at the moment but it breaks down into those DEDs, district electoral divisions, um, per a lot of, of um, data that's on that census from 1841 and 1851. And you'll see the population changes there. Now, hopefully the website will be up and running soon. But uh, when I was looking at it there, uh, during the week, unfortunately the data wasn't being mapped. So I've been on to them. So aero.minuteuniversity.ie is the, the website there. What is probably the most important book in terms of statistics about the great hunger that's emerged in, in the last number of years is, is this book, The Atlas of the Great Famine, edited by John Crowley of, of University College Cork, among others, and available through University of Cork. And you can see more on it on the greatirishfamine.ie website. The cover is interesting. It's an Irish artist, Daniel MacDonald, who has, who has done the cover and it has the detachment of soldiers coming. And if you look and you see the processions are being thrown outside. So again, that scene that um, Robin and Ashley evoked so well earlier, this is the scene that confronted those in Ballon Lass of Gloria's grandfather in March of 1846 and so many more families in the area. Now, this map is part of that. I just got this from the Irish Famine, greatirishfamine.ie uh, website, and it just tells us a little bit of what's inside the book. And I just took some pictures just to see, you know, what is available in that book. And this data is, is coming from the 1841, 1851 census. And that hopefully Maynooth University um, will be able to access which you can see that the decrease here of uh, fourth class houses, and the fourth class houses was basically just the hovels. This is where the poorest people were, the landless laborers, the ones who are gonna suffer the most during the great hunger, the, the Michael Gormley's who are walking from Cylon 
trying to provide for his family of his wife and eight children. And sadly, they're going to disappear the most. And it's interesting here where the, the greatest decreases are, you see along the, the Western seafront and then internally as well in different pockets. And these you know, are going to be part of the, the story of our ancestors. One of the interesting things is why some did not decrease as much as others. Was it just good luck, good fortune, benevolence of the local landlords or, or different things? So those stories remain to be told. Again, this is distribution of families um, dependent on their own labor. And again, the decreases, that's going to be aligned again with those fourth class dwellings. So this is a wonderful book. And if you don't have it, um, if your library doesn't have it, make sure your library gets a copy of it. And if you can afford it for Christmas for next year, please do, because it's an invaluable insight. The census of Ireland um, that I referred to, again, that's available online and that will break down the baronies. And again, this is through the, the Dipham site. And we can see there, as Pam and John had talked about their own area, sorry, Pam's own area um, in Kilbegnus, the, the population in 1841, males and females, 67 here in Kilconla, and the population in 1851 down to 32. But it's the amount of houses that I always look at because these are the families that disappear. So from 30 to 15, 47 to 42, 39 to 30, stable in one townland. But in many townlands, it's going to be drastically diminishing. So I just got Athen Rye there as well, because you would think that a place like Athen Rye wouldn't be as seriously affected because it's, it's close to Galway. Um, it would have, you know, landlords going there and it would be a central market town, but like many other places, it is going to be affected around there. So these um, are going to give you the population densities in this University of Lancaster. So again, another great resource there, um, similar to what Maynooth has done. So you can see the population density and you know, in, in certain areas, quite dense before the, um, the Great Hunger, and especially on, on the West Coast, it's going to have that. So I'll just move through these quickly, because I'm conscious of time. But again, it's a wonderful resource to have that. And then the population growth. And again, the, the idea in the West of Ireland, illiteracy in English, it's an Irish-speaking area. Um, the national school system has been set up by the British government to try and to get rid of the Irish language, try and get rid of the Irish culture to make English out of Irish people. And in the great hunger, unfortunately, it's going to have a huge effect. And unfortunately, today, um, I'm two generations away from a native Irish speaker, and many of us are just three generations away, and English has come to dominate and that has been one of the big uh, factors that has emerged from the Great Hunger. Fourth class housing, again, um, this graph says it all really that huge areas that had fourth class housing have disappeared because what's going to happen is that either they have died or immigrated or they, they have been subsumed in, into the local population and like um, Dan in Glens with Alan Pollock, um, he has cleared the land, made them into laborers, tried to do a little bit more for them in building houses, and but gradually they're going to be some of the diaspora. They're going to go to the coal mines, or they're going to go to the um, <clears throat> the farmlands of Iowa, are going to Australia. So these are statistics that can help us understand what is going on in Ireland just at the period of the Great Hunger and just afterwards. And I got these from that website, the University of Lancaster. And coming close then to the, the final part, the, the map that kind of stands out in a way, um, the map of the poor law unions, the ones that were built in 1839 and the ones that were built in 1850. And the one that I live in here in Mount Bellew, 
emerged because Bangladesh slow um, got so overcrowded, and especially in the outbreak of cholera in the late 1840s, that it was cut off. And Mabeya became, in a way, a model workhouse in, in the sense that the local landlords seemed to have taken a, a good care of their tenants that had to go in there. And they, they made sure that they were assisted. Some of them, when you look at the, the Board of Guardian meeting notes, assisted immigration um, to get them to go to their family in America, or in the case of, in 1852, 30 young girls to go to Australia, in 1853, 50 young girls to go to Canada to try and get a better life for them. One way of seeing it, another way of seeing it is the fact that this shouldn't really have existed, the landlord system, which was going to eventually die out uh, within two generations of this. But at this time, these poor law unions are going to be serving a lot of people during the Great Hunger. And those poor law unions become civil registration districts later on. So when you're looking for family information, um, it's going to be within these smaller districts that were created in the 1830s or early 1850s. John Grinham has a great website, as many of you know, for just mapping your own family by surnames, by putting it in, you will get the, the number and location of households during the, the Griffiths valuation. And then you will also get various maps, including ones of the heads of households in the census of 1901 and 1911, as well as those who were born between 1864 and 1913. So well worth having a look at that and seeing as well what the variants are. R the Reddington name was mentioned before, there's quite a number of variants. My great grandmother was a Donlan, even more variants there. And to just see where the maps can bring us to find that out. Barry Griffin also has got a similar mapping system. And in, in one way, it'll be good to map, as you saw there, Pam has some great maps of the, the different land portions within the townland and who owned what piece of ground. So mapping is, is always good to have. This final one here on the, on the John Grinham side is the 18, or sorry, the, the, um, the, the map of the, the births in from 1864 to the present day. So just to see where most of your surname would be at that time. The final things here is just what parish did your family belong to? And these are the Catholic parishes. Uh, as opposed to the civil parishes. And these are available on registers.nli.ie. And they also give you the exact parish records, what's available. Some of them, unfortunately, don't begin before the Great Hunger. So if you have family that left at that time, sadly, for many Catholic parishes, their records are not going to be until the 1860s. Some are going to be sparse from the 1840s on. And that is going to be our biggest problem because the 1841 and 1851 census being destroyed in June of 1922 at the start of the Civil War. But there is a lot available out there. And in some parish groups, they've done a tremendous amount of work. This is um, looking at Clontuskert in, in South Galway. And the Clontuskert area has been mapped quite extensively. And in fact, each of the townlands um, the, the local heritage group have gone through the townlands and said who had what plot of ground and then followed and traced the families up through 1911 census and 1901 census. And again, the civil parishes, um, as I mentioned before, these are coming on from the medieval parishes. So the, the changes were subtle in some ways in terms of names even, and that the boundaries stay the same, but in others they were quite different from the modern Catholic parishes. FalcherRoad.com has a listing of the people who lived in each of the, sorry, the heads of households from the Griffiths valuation in each of the civil parishes. And it's just FalcherRoad.com forward slash. And if your family's from a different county, you put in the county and then .php. And that gives us, as we saw before, the Griffiths valuation and the people that were there in the different townlands. 
And I'm going to just move over quickly on this because John has done this tremendously well in terms of the Griffiths valuation maps and the plots of ground. In my own case here, plot number nine is Patrick Curley. I'm oh, sorry, plot number eight is Patrick Curley. And this would be where our family still live. So it's interesting after 167 years, we're still there. And just some other maps that are there in terms of just looking what the DEDs are and to just kind of like share that um, as a part of today in, in looking at mapping 1847, that each of the places mentioned has a specific kind of resonance to us, has a specific meaning. And it's sometimes a little bit obscured. Um, John had pointed out there, Hugh Reddington in 1911, he wanted to make sure exactly where in Ireland um, that he was from. And it's interesting that that very specific townland name was there. So hopefully wherever you are looking for your townland, you'll be able to find it in some of those maps that I've listed. And I thank you very much for that. So I think that's getting us close to the end of our day. I hope that Anne-Marie has taken so many notes, Anne-Marie, thank you. I'm hoping that. Um, Tom, is there a good way to correlate civil parish boundaries to Roman Catholic parish boundaries? Uh, Tom, just the, the big thing is, if you look at John Grinham's map, um, John Grinham dot and the place names, you, you just have to balance them out. For instance, where I grew up was the parish of Menla, but it used to be the civil parish of my law. And our section was taken in 1840 and joined to another half parish, Killescobe, to become a new parish. So historically, you go back to the newspapers and you might find some. Um, there's, a, there's a place near me called Abbott. And when you talk about the parish of Abbott now, it doesn't exist. But the parish of Monave does because the parish of Abbott became obsolete in the 1700s when a new family came in, the Blakeneys, and they built their house there. And that became a part of their front lawn in a way. So whoever had lived there were displaced but the old church was there. And that's kind of a key way of finding, you know, where parishes were back in the 13, 14, 1500s, uh, wherever you find a graveyard and that size of that. But hopefully that answers your question there, Tom. And I'm just looking down. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, John. And that, and maps are always good. Who was that down? That's Joe, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Joe, for that nice comment. Great day of interesting speakers and content. I have to say, it's been an absolutely marvelous day. Ellen Walters, Walter, sorry, Ellen, Ellen Walters, thanks, maps and sites, much appreciated. Denise, thanks for that info. Um, and Jarlett, never be afraid to trace your family to American newspaper sites. Yes, Jarlett, I didn't mention that one before, newspapers.com, it's a paid for site. And sometimes you get some great deals on it. And it's an amazing site. And Jarlis has pointed out here, it's, it's allowed him to check an awful lot of the Gilmore families and the Clarks and Brownies from Ballygar across. And Jarlis has put an awful lot of that up. I know on the, I think the Ballygar banter page is a Jarlis. Give me a thumbs up on that, the Ballygar banter page. Fascinating stuff. And I enjoy reading all about that. And, um, so this is Pat, um, thanks Pat for that. Um, they may be disconnected soon. Denise um, has asked a question. I'm going backwards on the things that John said. In regards to maps, one can never ignore John O'Donovan, O'Curry and Petrie and indeed the letters. Yes, those, um, the, the, the letters that are there on the Galway Library website, places.galwaylibrary.ie, fantastic. And the research- From each of the counties. Sorry, in the Castle Guard. And those, some of those information in Manchester, there's some wonderful work in the university in Manchester as well. Uh, yeah. Will the chat be saved, Charles? Yes, thanks, Charles. The chat be saved to access later. Um, the, the talk will, I'm gonna try my best. Last time 
I think I messed up on the chat itself, but I'm going to try and um, and do that. So I'm going to just go over now. We're we're coming to the end of another absolutely wonderful day, and I really want to thank everyone for taking part and for wonderful speakers. I'm going to invite Anne Marie, um, Anne Marie, to just take her time. Um, I said three to five minutes, but Anne-Marie, you can go on for a few more. Anne-Marie has started a wonderful project. Um, she asked me, could she do something? And I said, well, you're in Baltimore. And to do maybe with the Baltimore uh, families, the Galway families in Baltimore, and to find out a little bit about them. So she has done an incredible work. So Anne-Marie, if you unmute yourself, and I am going to make you, I have to make you a co-host, which I have just done, Henry. So now you can share that. And Jarlath, I'm going to ask you just to mute yourself because I can't see how to. That's great. And Henry, I'm going to mute myself and I'll hand over to you. So Henry, just a quick introduction. Are you good for sharing the screen as well, Henry? I am. Let's well, see. Here we go. Okay. All right, can you see? This is the first slide. I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And if anyone from Australia is still awake, I promise I'll only talk for three minutes. I timed myself. Um, so when Martin um, offered to, to um, or suggested rather that I start this project, it saved my husband's slippers because I've been known that if I don't have something to chew on, I will chew on them. Um, initially, we thought that I would just be putting um, the uh, names and death notices of people who were born in Galway and died in Baltimore in a spreadsheet, but it turned out that there were so many of them that Martin suggested that I start a Facebook page as well, which I have done. Um, so this is a brief overview of the page. It, the purpose is simple, to transcribe all the published death notices and obituaries of those who were born in Galway and died in or around Baltimore, Maryland. Um, there are some, uh, uh, Baltimore published um, death notices and obituaries uh, of folks who died in other places, but if they were born in Galway and it was published in Baltimore, it, it made the cut. Most of the death notices look like this. They're very, very brief. Um, this one was from um, December of 1898 um, for Patrick J. Barrett. Um, this is typical of um, the somewhat later um, death notices. Uh, the Baltimore Sun newspaper was uh, founded in 1837. So there are some death notices for Galway emigrants that go back to, I think, 1842. Um, and most of those were even more brief than this. But typically around this period of time, they include the date of death, the first and last names of the deceased, rarely the maiden name of the woman. Uh, most at this period of time also include the address in Baltimore from which the funeral is taking place, which is typically the residence of the deceased. Um, and in later decades, it became more uh, common to note the name of the church um, from which the requiem mass was being held. Um, sometimes, but rarely, they list the name of a spouse. Um, almost never, in fact, I can't remember any uh, death notices mentioning the names of children and very, very rarely the names of parents. Um, occasionally, there's a mention of a parish in Galway, um, and even more rarely, the name of a townland. So usually it's just, um, you know, uh, native of Galway, County Galway, Ireland. Occasionally, I hit the jackpot, however, like I did with um, Mary O'Hara, whose maiden name was Cunane. I don't know how to pronounce that in Irish, but that's how Americans would say it. Um, she was born in about 1823 and died in 1898. Uh, this obituary paints a very um, colorful portrait of her life, um, including the fact that she attended mass daily at 6 a.m., even when it was snowing. Um, she hung out an Irish flag every St. Patrick's Day, and one year was harassed for it um, because Irish were not uh, kindly 
regarded here for a while. Um, and and uh, the fact that all the neighborhood people came together to support her almost caused a riot. Um, this um, obituary mentions that the neighborhood children called her grandma. It even recounted the fact that she was fond of making patch quilts. And at the time of her death, she had amassed about 28 of them. Uh, apparently she was well beloved um, because at least half of those who attended the funeral mass had to stand outside the church. Oh, and I can tell you from um, um, a death notice, in addition to this obituary, there was a death notice published about her and she was from Kilcrone Parish, Kilcrone, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, the house here, um, was the home where Mary O'Hara and her husband, Michael, raised their children. Um, this was a Google image from 2018. This house has uh, since been torn down. Um, but death notices that mention an address can be especially valuable, um, uh, particularly if the person, if the family owned the property, because then you can do a search of the um, property records and perhaps find references to other family members. And this is the church where um, Mary O'Hara was buried from. And I assume the church that she attended mass at um, at 6 a.m. every day. It was, it's uh, obviously called um, St. Mary's Star of the Sea. <clears throat> um, getting the name of the parish where they attended is also a wonderful genealogical opportunity because you can search for baptisms and marriages. And I have actually built a number of uh, family trees uh, for the folks in this cohort, just from the death notices. So that's it. Um, this is the name of the Facebook page, Galway Emigrants in Baltimore. Come and give us a like, follow us, and ta-da. Anne-Marie, superb, superb. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you, just to take that down, and again, it's, there's quite a few posts in, in the group, so superb work that you have done. Really, really appreciate it. Kilcrone, I think, is just outside of Ballymo, so I'll have to just chase that up. I've talked to somebody there recently as well. So, Henry, if we could just stop sharing the screen, that would be good. And we got everyone else back up then. Thanks a million. So we just need to stop sharing there. Brilliant. Yeah. I I have to get the uh, page. It's not letting me. No worries. It'll Got it. Good. There we go. There we go. That is fascinating. And um, I don't see any slippers around. So you're okay. <laughs> and and I really, really appreciate and that. And next year, by the way, that's a, a, a three minute advertisement for Emery's talk for next year's conference. So I am looking, looking forward to that because it is just amazing. And also, I just want to shout out to, um, to Damien. Damien is there in, in Greece. And Damien has done amazing work in doing the, um, the folks from Kilur Parish who have been around the world. And it is just something else. And I know that just recently as well, Evelyn Donnell has put up Korea and finding places like and rehouse of the, not just like, you know, this was unknown a year ago. This was unknown three months ago of all of these Galway people in Baltimore. So I think there's a book to be published there. In fact, I've got a book, Anne-Marie, that's pretty similar. Maybe the same title you could use, Let the Stone Speak. This is about Boston graveyards. You have certainly let the stone speak there. And it, it's really, truly amazing. We're going to be finishing shortly. Um, if um, people, Mary, thank you very much, have really enjoyed your project. Anne Marie St. Mary Star of the Sea was also the first Catholic church in Cleveland, Ohio. And Tom Crane should be an award for the folks staying up to 1.30 a.m., which was in reference to our Australians. I think, I don't know if Karen is still there. Where is Karen? If Karen is there, if you unmute yourself, maybe one Australian is still here, or maybe they're gone to bed altogether. Natalie has, has gone to bed, I know. And um, there's, there's a lot of people still up. So listen, folks, um, there is Karen. 
if I could ask to unmute Karen if she's still there. And Tara, you have done that and we have done that. So are you there, Karen? I'm here, Martin. <laughs> there you go. It's one, is it 1.30 a.m. with you still? It, it certainly is. <laughs> oh, thank you, cuz. Thanks for staying up. And that's all right. No, it's been fantastic. It was well worth it. Thanks. Thanks, Anne Marie. That was really great to hear. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? And right throughout the day there, it, it's been we've we've gone three continents you know, for how many countries, five countries and more. And just to get this together, I really want to thank each and every one of the speakers, each and everyone that's given support over the last year. And to just kind of say that, like, you know, what, what I tried to do and when I talked to Marty about it back in May of 2020 was just to help people reconnect. I did not think that something like this would be possible as well. So it, it's down to so many people being so very helpful. So from Mount Bellew in County Galway, I'm going to be turning off in a few moments. I am still trying to figure out how to download the chat. I know that it's there somewhere. Hopefully when I hit the stop recording, it'll ask me to do the same thing, which I might just do now. And I'm gonna just hit stop recording now.